Okay, so now that we have users able to actually log into our application, right, by using this sign in with email and password function that Firebase Auth provides to us, the next thing that we need to do is have our application actually update when that event occurs, right? So in other words, when the user successfully enters in their email and their correct password, we want to have our app actually you know, know that that happened and redirect the user automatically to the home page. Now, the way that this is going to work is inside our app component, we're actually going to have a state variable, and we're going to call this state variable uh, user and set user. You'll see why that is in just a minute. And here, let's just import use state up at the top while we're at it. Use state from React. And then we'll say use state, and the initial value of this is going to be null. Okay, so essentially the way that this is going to work is Firebase provides us with a function called on auth state changed that basically allows us to set up a subscription that will listen for changes to Firebase's authentication state, right? In other words, when a user logs in or logs out, uh, the callback that we pass to this function will be called with the user that just logged in, right? A Firebase user object. You'll see what that looks like shortly. So the way that we use this, first of all, we're going to import that from the Firebase package up here at the top. We're gonna to say import get auth and on auth state changed. That's the function that I just told you about that allows us to set up that subscription. And we're gonna import those from Firebase slash auth. Now, the other thing that we're gonna to need to do in order to set up a subscription in pretty much any React component, we wanna do that inside a use effect hook. So let's import use effect from React up at the top. And we're going to use that now to actually set up this subscription that will allow us to keep track of this user thing. So we're gonna say use effect. And for the use effect callback, we're gonna create our subscription. So we'll say const auth equals get auth, right? We're getting that uh, reference to Firebase's auth object. And then what we're gonna do is say on auth state changed. We're passing auth as the first argument. And as the second argument, we pass a callback. And this callback will actually get the user, the currently logged in Firebase user object uh, as an argument. And then what we need to do is inside this callback, we need to set our user state appropriately. So basically what's happening is that when the user first opens up our application, right? And we have user and set user equal to null. That just means that our user is initially unauthenticated, uh, before they actually log in. So what we're going to do is when this changes, we're just going to say set user to user, and that's about it for now. So the other thing that we need to do now is since we no longer have an is auth variable, right? We just had that as a hard-coded variable before, we're actually gonna use this user, right? The user state to tell whether or not the user's logged in. And that's actually pretty straightforward to do because again, all we have to do is check if this user exists. If the user doesn't exist, that means the user's not logged in. If the user does exist, it means the user is logged in. Simple as that. So what we're gonna do is for is auth for both our auth and unauth routes, we're gonna pass through double exclamation point user. Now what this double exclamation point does, if you haven't seen this before, is basically it just takes any value in JavaScript and converts it to a Boolean. It's basically asking, does this thing exist? And if user is null, this will be false. And if user is, you know, an actual object, this will translate into true. So uh, just wanted to point that out there in case you weren't familiar with that syntax. And that's pretty much all we have to do. So if we go back to our application now, we'll see that since we've already logged in, we're on the home page. So what you might want to do here is uh, you know, if you want to test this, since we currently have no way to log out, you can always just open up an incognito window and go to localhost 3000. Uh, and that will basically allow you to see the page without any of the stored credentials. So uh, what you can do is just test out the login here by saying sean at gmail.com, entering in your password, clicking login. You'll see successfully logged in, click OK, and that should send you now to the home route. 
Now, one thing to notice is that it's sending you to the home route automatically, not because we are saying history.push or anything, right? We don't even have history inside our login page. It's happening automatically because of the logic that we have inside our authed and unauthed routes. Okay, essentially those are detecting this change to uh, is authed, right? There is auth prop and automatically taking care of all the redirection logic. So we don't have to do that kind of logic inside our home and login pages with the current setup that we have. All right, now one last thing that we are gonna want to do is make sure that while our application is actually loading, uh, it doesn't display the login page, right? You might've noticed that if you refresh, it'll automatically show the login page because again, our user is initially null while our application is taking care of actually logging the user in uh, behind the scenes. So what we need to do is basically we need to have another state variable here, which we'll call is loading and set is loading. And what this is gonna do is basically while our app is checking whether the user is logged in, right? It's checking with Firebase, uh, this is going to be true. And once we see that either the user is or is not logged in, right? Once we find out for sure from Firebase, which is the case, we're going to set is loading to false. So what this is gonna look like, the initial value for is loading is actually going to be, we're gonna need this uh, auth thing down here. We're gonna need to say const auth equals get auth. And the initial value here is gonna be basically whether or not the current user exists on auth. Now, what I just did here, this auth.currentUser thing, this is just a property that contains the current user object that's logged in. Now, note that since uh, this can change over time, we don't actually want to use this uh, for ongoing things, right? We won't want to say is auth equals auth.currentUser because this thing could change over time and that would not trigger a subsequent re-render in React. But in our case here, it's perfectly fine to use it as the initial value for a state variable. Uh, all we're doing here is if there's already a current user, we're just going to set is loading to false. If there's not, we're going to set is loading to true because that means we don't really know whether the user is uh, already logged in or not. And we're gonna do something similar for the user down here in use state. We're gonna say equals use state, and the initial value for that is going to be auth.currentUser. So essentially, if the user is already logged in and we already have auth.currentUser, we're not gonna see that loading state. Otherwise, we're gonna see a loading message, which we actually have to display down here. Uh, the way we'll do that is just by saying return is loading. If it is loading, we'll just say loading dot dot dot. Oops. Otherwise, will display the regular, uh, the regular JSX. So the other thing that we have to do is after we've set the user, we need to say set is loading to false so that in case it was true to begin with, and it will be a lot of the time, it will turn to false once the user uh, is actually logged in. Now this will work as is right now, right? If we click refresh, we'll see loading and then home, loading home, loading home, etc. One more thing that we have to do just for cleanliness sake and to prevent memory leaks is we have to make sure to cancel this subscription when our app component re-renders. So essentially what we're gonna have to do is uh, this on auth state changed function actually returns a function that will cancel the subscription for you. So what we'll do is say const cancel subscription equals on auth state changed, blah, blah, blah. And then we're just going to return the cancel subscription function from this use effect hook, which basically means that this cancel subscription thing will be called when our component unmounts. And the last thing we need to do here is since we only want to set up that subscription once, we're just going to pass an empty array as a second argument to use effect. Okay, so this should all work now, and if we open up the inspector window here in console, we shouldn't see any kind of, uh, ah, here. So this one warning just says that we need to pass auth as a dependency, just in case that changes over time. It shouldn't, but just to make React happy and to get rid of that warning, why not? 
Okay, and everything seems to be working now. The last thing that we're gonna do here, and this is a very, very simple thing to implement, we're gonna add a logout button so that we can actually log out of our application. So what this is gonna look like is inside our home page, we're gonna open that up. What we're gonna do is just add a basic logout button to the bottom of the page that will allow the user to click on it and actually log themselves out. Okay, now in order to make this happen, we just need to import get auth and a function called sign out from the Firebase auth package. Okay, and we're going to basically create a function here called log out. It's gonna be an async function that will basically call this sign out function for us. So what we're gonna do inside of here, we're gonna say const auth equals get auth. We're gonna say await sign out and pass auth as an argument. And then we're just gonna display an alert that says something like successfully logged out. Okay, and then we just need to wrap these in a React fragment to make uh, React happy with our syntax. And we'll have the button call this logout function by saying on click equals log out. And that should be our logout button. So as you can see, the logic here is incredibly simple for logging out a user. And essentially all that does is just deletes some tokens behind the scenes that Firebase is using to uh, create the user session. So let's go over here to our homepage now. We can click log out. We should see successfully logged out, and we'll see that that has automatically now redirected us back to the login page. So just to go through the flow one more time, we'll say sean at gmail.com, abc123, login, successfully logged in, and we're at our homepage. So everything seems to be working just fine now, and we've successfully added Firebase Auth to a React application. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Now that we've seen the basics of how to include Firebase Auth in an application and how to use it to allow our users to log in, the next thing that we're gonna look at, well, it's two things really, is A, how to allow our users to create accounts in our application in the first place, right, without us having to do it manually like we've seen, and B, how do we handle errors that occur while a user is doing things like logging in or creating accounts? That's what we're gonna be taking a look at here today. And without further ado, let's jump right in. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna take a look at here is we're gonna add some info to our homepage. Now, remember that the user object, which we got inside our app component, right? This user object that we have as a state and that we're then getting from Firebase once the user actually logs in, this user object contains a lot of information about uh, the user from Firebase. So in other words, it will contain things like the user's email address, it will contain whether or not they verified their email, it'll contain their Firebase user ID, lots of useful stuff. So let's actually display that on our homepage just so that we can get an idea of what kind of information it contains and what it can be good for. So the way that this is gonna work is basically we're gonna make our homepage take that user as a prop. Okay, so we'll say homepage user, and we're just gonna display that down here uh, underneath our home heading and above our logout button for now. But first, let's actually log this thing out to the console just to see what our user looks like. And, you know, this will basically allow us to see all of the properties and talk about those a little bit. So we've added that prop, we're logging it out. We just need to pass that through from our app component now. We're just gonna say home page, and user is going to be user for that. And now let's just run our application by saying npm run start. And sure enough, we see that our user is logged out uh, to the console here. So let's open this and take a look at it a little bit. Let me just zoom in here a bit. There we go. Oops, that's not what I wanted. There we go, okay. All right, 
So first of all, we see this access token thing. This is something you don't want to share with people, right? This is a secret thing that you don't want anyone besides the user to get a hold of. Now, normally this is not a huge problem. Firebase generally takes care of keeping all that stuff secret and secure, but just make sure that you don't, uh, you know, just make sure that in your React code, you're not displaying this anywhere where, you know, someone could look over the user's shoulder or I don't know. I don't know what kind of situations you could run into with that, but be careful with it is the point here. <laughs> so anyway, okay, so next up, you know, we have auth, we have display name, which is null in this case. We have email. This is the user's email address, right? That's the email address that the account was created with. We have email verified, which tells us whether or not that email address has been verified by Firebase. Firebase Auth actually has its own email verification flow that we can use, uh, you know, if we, if we find that we want to add that to our application. Let's see, it's got other information besides that, such as phone number, photo URL, a lot of those things come in when you start using OAuth or that kind of thing. Besides that, really the only other thing that we care about right now is going to be this UID thing. This is the Firebase user ID that Firebase automatically generates when we create that user profile either in the Firebase console or if we create a new user uh, in our React app, which we'll see how to do shortly. So that's pretty much all of the data that Firebase provides us with. And there are some other things we didn't cover here that aren't really important for our purposes right now. But why don't we just take a look at how to actually display that data, all right? We're just gonna display some of the key pieces of that data on the homepage, such as the user's email, the user's ID, et cetera. So what this is gonna look like is in our homepage, when we get our user, we're basically going to add a heading underneath H1 that says H3. We'll say you are logged in as user.email. Okay, so that'll tell the user what email address they're logged in with. Underneath that, what we're gonna do is say paragraph. And one of the pieces of data that we actually have access to, which I don't think I showed you. Uh, here, let me just go back and open this up again. We see that we have our email up here too, by the way, which is good. One of the things that I didn't show you if we open this up is that if we go into metadata, this actually has some pretty useful information, right? These are things that uh, sometimes under certain circumstances you might actually want to display to the user, right? Such as the last time that they logged in. I've noticed this a lot on uh, bank websites, right? It'll tell you when you last logged in. So in case someone got a hold of your account and has, uh, you know, done something on it, you can, you know, that can serve as an alert to you, right? That you logged in at a time when you don't remember logging in. So anyway, this last sign in time, I mean, in this case, right, this is the last time I actually clicked log in with the uh, email and password for this account. But just for demonstration purposes, let's actually display this last sign in time up here in our application. So what we're going to do is go back here. We'll say you logged in at user dot metadata dot last sign in time. Okay, that's the nicely formatted one that we saw back here. Okay, you can also do last login at which is an actual timestamp, but you know. Oh, and besides this, by the way, this also has when the account was actually created, which is kind of an interesting thing. Now, these are very close in my case, because uh, I just created the account and then logged in with it. But uh, in general, I'd imagine those will be pretty far apart. So uh, besides the login time, besides the user email, the last thing we're going to display is the user's ID. Now, this is not something that users will normally care about, but because of some of the things that we're going to be taking a look at later, right, we're going to see how to actually incorporate Firebase Auth in a server and a database, we're going to want to use this ID. So just to make it easier for ourselves, let's say something like your user ID is user.uid. Okay, so if we go back and take a look at our application now, we'll see that it's displaying all of the required data, right? It says you are logged in as sean at gmail.com. You're logged in, uh, you logged in at Tuesday, blah, blah, blah. Your user ID is blah, 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 blah. That big long user ID thing, okay? And of course, if we log out, 
it'll say successfully logged out and take us to the login page. So just to see that that information all works with different users, let's actually go into the Firebase Auth console again and create a few more users. I'm gonna create a new user here, which I'll call Sean2 at gmail.com. Password for that one's gonna be the same as before, right? Generally when I'm testing, I like to create all of my users with the same easy to type password since that just makes it, you know, it makes it a lot easier to remember. There are a few things that are more humiliating than forgetting a test password for a test account, uh, especially when it's something simple like that. So let's click on add user now. That'll create Sean2. We'll click add user. We'll add Sean3 as well at gmail.com. Same password. And click add user. Okay, so now that we've created these other accounts, let's actually log in with those and see that they uh, display some different information. So what we're gonna do, let's log in as Sean2 here at, uh, what did I say, gmail.com? Yeah, gmail.com, gmail.com, and abc123, log in. Sure enough, we'll see successfully logged in, click OK, and that'll display some slightly different information, right? It'll say Sean2 at gmail.com. The user ID here is gonna be completely different, okay? And let's do the same thing with Sean3. Just for demonstration purposes, Sean3 at gmail.com, abc123, click login. And sure enough, we see all of the pieces of information for that. Cool, so hopefully that's given you a little bit of insight into some of the user information that Firebase Auth provides for us. Now, obviously, there are gonna be different circumstances and different information available depending on how the user logs in. I believe I mentioned earlier that if the user has logged in with OAuth, right, if they've logged in with their Google account, let's say, chances are that you're gonna have a lot more information, right? You might even have something like a profile picture that, uh, that Gmail has provided for you. So, but that's all stuff that we'll see later on. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so, so far we've been creating all of our new users for our application directly inside the Firebase console for our project. But obviously, at some point, we're gonna want to allow users to create accounts by themselves. That way, our app can grow organically, you know, users can start using our application without us having to actually come in here, click add user, give them a password, etc. Now, in order to do this, we're gonna add a create account page, and this will involve some special Firebase uh, logic that you'll see that will basically allow us to create a new account automatically for a user uh, by just taking the password and email that they've entered. So let's take a look at how to do that. Now, first of all, what we're gonna want to do is add a new page, which will be the create account page. So inside this folder, let's say new file, we're gonna say create account page.js and inside here is where we're going to create our page so uh, first of all we're going to want to import the use state hook since this will be how we actually keep track of the user's email password and confirm password that they've entered okay so we'll say import use state from react and we're also going to want to import two firebase functions uh, from Firebase Auth. The first one is going to be get auth. We've seen this one before. It allows us to get a reference to the auth object in Firebase. And the other one is something that we haven't seen before. This one is called create user with email and password. I think you can probably guess what it means by the name. Uh, basically, this allows us to create a new user in Firebase Auth automatically, right? Just by passing the email and the password that they've entered. So uh, these are gonna be imported from Firebase Auth, just like the rest of our functions. And after that, we're also gonna import a, a link component from React Router DOM. Basically, what we're gonna be using this link component for is to allow the user to go from the login page to the create account page and vice versa. So we're gonna have to go back and make this uh, same change to our login page as well. All right, and those are the main imports that we're gonna be using for now. So let's export our create account page component. That's gonna look like this. We'll say export const create account page, 
equals, and this component isn't gonna take any props, it's going to have three state variables up at the top, one for email, one for password, one for confirm password. So we'll say const email set email equals use state, empty string, const password set password equals, oops, there we go, equals use state, empty string, and const confirm password set confirm password and that's going to be equal to use state empty string all right and that's all the state variables that we're going to need the next thing that we're going to do is actually define our jsx so let's say return all of our jsx is going to be inside a react fragment so we'll have an h1 heading here that says create account under that, we're going to have our inputs. So the first input's gonna be the email input. Gonna be pretty straightforward. We'll say input. Uh, placeholder will be enter your email. Oh, and one thing that we might actually wanna to add to this too is type equals email, right? And that helps usually on, let's say, when the user is accessing the site from their mobile phone, from their smartphone, uh, that gives them a special keyboard that includes the at sign, the dot com, all those things that are kind of difficult to find when you're typing with your thumbs, if you're old like me. So anyway, uh, let's just add type email to that input. After that, we're gonna have our value, which is going to be email. And uh, we're gonna add the on change prop to this input, which is gonna basically set the email to that new value. So set email e.target.value. Again, I'm sure that you're very familiar with this by now, so uh, it's just, uh, you know the drill. Okay, so after we have that email input, we're going to define our password and confirm password inputs. Those are going to look like this. We say input type equals password. Uh, the placeholder for this one will be something like enter a new password. The value here will obviously be password. And on change, again, you know the drill, set password e.target.value. Okay, and last but not least, we're gonna have our confirm password input. And for that, we can really just copy and paste this input element. Uh, type is gonna be password. We'll say uh, for the placeholder, re-enter your password. And the value for this will be confirm password. And on change will be set confirm password. Okay, and besides that, we just need to have a button at the bottom here. So this button will say, uh, here we'll have, well, we'll add the on click later, but the button itself is gonna say create account. And underneath that, we're gonna have a link, which will take the user to the login page. And this will be the link um, that I'm sure many of you have seen that says something like already have an account, login, something like that. So we'll say link to equals slash login. And we'll do just what I said, uh, already have an account, log in. And the user will click that to basically go to the login page. All right, now in order to actually create the account, here's where uh, these two functions that we imported up at the top here come in. Basically, what we're going to do is create a new function, uh, which we will call. Uh, we'll call it create account. So we'll say const create account equals. It's going to be an asynchronous function. And essentially, what it's going to do is uh, call this create user with email and password function with the email and password that the user has entered. Now the first thing in this case is going to be getting a reference to the auth object. So we'll say const auth equals get auth. And then we'll say await create user with email and password. First argument for this is gonna be auth. Second argument is gonna be the email that the user is signing up with. Third argument is going to be the password that they're entering. Okay, and what we're gonna use the confirm password for is basically to check whether the password and confirm password are the same, right? to make sure that the user has entered in the same thing for both of those inputs. We'll see how to do that and how to display an error here a little later, but uh, that's gonna be the idea there. So that's why we're not using it yet. 
Okay, so once we've created a user with email and password, that user will automatically be logged in by Firebase. So essentially all we're gonna do is just display an alert here that says successfully created an account. Okay, and we're gonna want to call this create account function now uh, when this create account button is clicked. So we'll say button on click equals create account. And that should be pretty much all we need to do. So let's give this thing a try. First of all, we're gonna need to actually display this create account page at the correct route. So let's open up our app.js component. Uh, we're going to, first of all, import our new page. So down here underneath login page, we'll say import create account page from pages slash create account page. And then we're going to basically put our create account page in the same unauthed route component as our login page. So we're gonna say, um, we'll say unauthed route is auth equals user. And the path for this one's gonna just be create dash account. And inside here, of course, we're gonna put our create account page. Cool, so let's go take a look at this page and use it to actually create a new account. All right, so we're gonna make sure our app is running. Looks like we don't have any errors. Let's head over to here. We're gonna log out of whatever account we were logged into before. And we're going to, well, first of all, we're gonna to have to type in our create account page up at the top here, since we don't have a link uh, for that yet. Um, and first of all, we see already have an account login. If we click on that, that takes us to the login page. We're gonna enter our email here. I'm gonna do sean4 at gmail.com. For the password, I'm gonna enter the same one that I've been using for the others and click on create account. And sure enough, we should see successfully created an account. If we click okay now, that will take us to the home page, and we'll see that we now have an account with the new email. Uh, we'll see that it was just created a moment ago and we'll see this new user ID that Firebase has created for us. And furthermore, if we go back to the Firebase auth console over here, and you may have to refresh it, we're gonna see that sean4 at gmail.com is now in that list. So essentially we're allowing users to create new accounts uh, automatically, right? We don't have to actually come here, click this button and enter in their information. Now, a few more things that we're gonna do before we move on, we're gonna basically update the login page uh, to make it more like our create account page. So let's open that up. First thing we're gonna do, we're gonna add a link component to it. So we'll say import link from React Router DOM. We're gonna come down here and here. Let's actually add type equals email to our email login here, just like we did in the create account page. Then underneath this button, we're gonna add a link component. We're gonna say link to slash create account. And inside here, the text is going to be something like don't have an account, create one. Okay, so that'll allow us to navigate between our login page and our create account page. Uh, so if we go back to here now and log out, we'll see that we can actually navigate between the two as often as we like. Now it's still ugly because we haven't added any styling, but you know, it does its job. So that's our create account page. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so we have our create account page and our login pages created, but one thing that we still have left to do is add error handling to these pages. So what happens, for example, if we enter in, here, let's go to our login page. What happens if we enter in an email that doesn't exist, right, or even something that's not an email, and a password that's just sort of random characters, right? In other words, what happens if we enter in faulty credentials and click on login? Well, what we'll see is that, whoops, it ends up throwing an error. Now, error handling is very important in this sort of page, obviously because, you know, we want to let the user know when they enter in the wrong password, since that's probably 
just as common, if not more common, than entering in the right password. So the way that we're going to do this in both of our pages is essentially we're just going to have a state variable that will contain any errors that occurred while logging in or creating an account. And we're going to end up displaying that error down inside the JSX. Chances are you've done something like this before, but maybe you haven't seen it done in this context. So first of all, what we're going to do for our, eh, we'll start off with our login page, I suppose. We're going to add another state variable here, which we'll call error. Oops, there we go. Error and set error. And the initial value of this error is just going to be an empty string. If you really want to, you can set that to something like null or undefined. Uh, it'll have the same effect the way that we're using it. So the next thing that we're going to do is now that we have this error state, basically when the user actually tries to log in, what'll happen is if they enter in something that isn't an email, or if they enter in the wrong password, or if the account doesn't exist with that email, etc., this thing here is going to throw an error. Okay, so essentially what that means is we're going to have to uh, wrap this in a try catch block. And basically in the catch block is where we'll deal with the error and take care of setting the state. Right, so everything inside this try block is something that we uh, well, not everything, mainly this thing here, this is something that we expect may well fail. So we're going to say catch. And inside here, once we've got the error, we're just going to say set error to e dot message. Okay, this will contain a user readable message that you can basically display uh, telling the user that something went wrong. Okay, so that's really all we need to do. The other thing is that now that we have that error message, let's display that to the user inside this form here. Uh, so what we're going to do is down here, we're just going to basically check if the error exists. If it does, we're going to display a paragraph tag with the error inside of it. So we'll say, um, we'll just put in the error. And that's all we really need to do. One more thing that we might want to do is actually hide the error when the user clicks login, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's usually considered a good practice to hide the errors when the user resubmits the form so that they know that those errors are from the previous time and, you know, that those, it's everything's being recalculated essentially. So the way that we can do that is just by saying set error, empty string, and then we'll try it again. And if they've, you know, if there's another error, then it will set the error to something else. Okay, so let's give this a try now. Hopefully it won't, uh, it won't cause our application to crash when the user enters in the wrong password. So let's try entering in something, first of all, that's not even an email, right? We're just gonna click log in. And sure enough, we see Firebase error auth invalid email. Now, this is fairly readable, but you may well not want to uh, tell the user that you're using Firebase, right? It's just, um, I don't know, there's not really any point behind giving Firebase free advertising inside our application uh, by displaying Firebase inside our error messages. So what you might want to do is just copy this. And there, there might be an easier way to do this, but uh, you know, this is just what I'm going to do for now. And what you can do is actually create a map between Firebase's native error messages and the ones that you end up displaying to the user. So uh, I'll just say something like error messages equals. And for the key here, I'm just going to paste that, uh, just going to paste that message that we got. And we can change that to something like um, invalid email address, which will be the thing that we actually end up uh, displaying to the user. Okay, so what we could do is just say um, set error to error messages e dot message, and then we'll provide a backup just in case we uh, just in case we end up getting an error that we haven't accounted for, and that backup will be something like, uh oh, something went wrong. Okay, not a tremendously useful error message, but that's the best we can do in this case. So um, let's go back now and give that a try. We're going to basically refresh this. Let's try entering in an invalid email again. Click login. 
And sure enough, we'll see invalid email address. If we do end up getting a, an error that we haven't accounted for, like if I just enter in something like that and click login, we'll just see this backup, uh-oh, something went wrong message. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the other errors. So what I'm going to do is actually remove uh, this for now and just do what we were doing before. I'll say set error to e dot message. That'll allow us to see some of the other messages that you can get. Let's, let's try entering in the wrong password or just entering in no password at all. Okay, so what we're going to see, that just says internal error. I'm assuming that means that the password was wrong. Maybe let's just try entering in a random password there. Ah, so apparently those are two different things. Apparently internal error is uh, something, you know, when you didn't enter your password, something like that. So let's try that again. We're going to say sean at gmail.com. We're going to click login and... We'll just take this one here. Uh, actually, this is a fairly generic error, so maybe we'll just leave it the way it is. We do want the wrong password one, though, so we'll copy this one. We're going to add an entry for it in our error messages by pasting it. We'll say something like, that's the wrong password. Okay, and we'll see now if we uncomment this other thing we had down here that if we try and enter the wrong password, we'll see that's the wrong password. So I'm not going to go through all of the different error messages, but those two are probably the most common. One other one that you might get here. Let's just uh, uncomment that again. One other one you might get is if there's no account for the corresponding user, right? You'll get this user not found thing. And I'm just going to copy that, paste that in here. And we'll say something like, there is no account with that email address. Okay, and now what we'll see if we just uncomment that like that is we'll see there's no account with that email address. Cool, so feel free to do that for all of the errors. There's obviously uh, several more that we haven't talked about here, but those are the most common ones. Um, generally, in other cases, it's fine to just display, uh-oh, something went wrong. Uh, because generally, I mean, generally that just means something went wrong communicating with Firebase or uh, some kind of internal error occurred in Firebase, something like that. So anyway, that's kind of the basic strategy for that. What we're going to do next is add similar logic to the create account page. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do here is add an error state variable. We'll say const error set error equals use state. That'll start off as an empty string. And we're going to do the same thing inside create account that we did inside our login page. Essentially, we're going to wrap the sensitive logic inside a try catch block. And in the catch block here, we're going to basically set the error state variable to the error message, right? And you can you can go through and do the same thing that we did here for our login page, but I'm not going to do that for the create account page since it's pretty straightforward to do. So uh, we're just going to say set error here, e dot message, and then we'll obviously want to actually display the error down here above our inputs by saying uh, if error exists. Then let's display it by saying paragraph error. Okay, so now if we go back to our create account page, right, let's uh, just refresh this, go to create account. Let's say that we enter in an email that isn't an email. And I don't know, let's say the passwords don't match or anything. We'll see auth invalid email. If we enter in a valid email like sean5 at gmail.com and don't enter in any passwords at all. Click create account, we'll see internal error, which again, I guess means that we didn't send along the right uh, the right arguments, right? With a password and everything. Uh, if we try and create an account that already has an account associated with it, right? With an email that already has an account associated with it, you'll see that we end up getting a different error, email already in use. So there's a lot of different errors that you might wanna handle here. Feel free to go through and catalog those uh, and change the message that we end up displaying if you want to, but I'm just gonna leave that for now. So one more thing that we are gonna to want to add to our create account page though 
is we're gonna want to check and make sure that the password and confirm password match. Now this is a pretty simple thing to do. What we're gonna do is just say if password does not equal confirm password, then what we're gonna do is say set error message or set error to something like password and confirm password must match. And then we'll just say return, which will prevent the rest of the logic in this function from executing. So uh, this way we can make sure that the user has actually entered in the correct password uh, in both of these entries. So let's say something like Sean5 at gmail.com, ABC123. And let's just enter in some gibberish here and click create account. Sure enough, we'll see password and confirm password must match. So let's try adding uh, the same password now and click create account. And we should see successfully created an account. If we click OK now, we'll go to the home page with that new account. OK, so that's how to add basic error handling to both our create account page and our login page. And obviously error handling is going to be a very important thing in applications like this because you know, if there's one thing that you can rely on happening very, very frequently in your application, it's users entering in the wrong password or uh, typing in the wrong email, etc. So again, it's important that we handle those and that's what we've done here. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so the next thing that we're gonna take a look at is how to incorporate user authentication into a navigation bar, right? We've seen how to incorporate user authentication into our routing components, right? If we open up auth route and unauth route, basically both of these routes just took into account whether or not the user was logged in and behaved differently accordingly. So what we're gonna take a look at now is we're gonna see how to basically add a nav bar to our application that basically will react differently depending on whether the user is logged in or not. So what this is gonna look like more or less is we're gonna have you know, our basic nav bar component. It'll have some kind of uh, logo thing over on the side, right? Some kind of site header. And over here, it's gonna have different buttons depending on whether or not the user's logged in, right? So if the user is currently logged out, we're gonna to want to display two buttons here, one which will allow the user to log in and one which will allow the user to sign up, okay, or create an account, right? Now, on the other hand, if the user is already logged in, what we're gonna to want to do is we're just gonna to wanna to display a logout button if you can read that. And we're probably also gonna to want to display uh, the email address that the user is currently logged in with here. So we'll say something like logged in as blah, blah, blah. Basically what we're doing on the home page already, except you know it'll be in a much more visible place so that they can know who they're logged in as all the time. Okay, so that's gonna be our basic plan of attack with our nav bar, but the first thing that we're gonna do is we're actually going to pull our logout button out into its own uh, separate component. So let's just close these things here. And inside our components, we're gonna create a new file called logout button.js. And essentially this is just going to encapsulate the logic for logging a user out. So we've already done this inside our home page. So after we've created this, we're just gonna go back in and replace that button and that logic with this logout button. But what this is gonna look like essentially is we're gonna say import get auth and sign out. We've seen both those functions before from Firebase slash auth. And then our logout button component is gonna look like this. We'll say export const logout button equals. And inside here, we're basically going to define the same logout function that we, uh, that we had earlier. We'll say const logout equals, it's gonna be an async function. And we're gonna say const auth equals get auth. We're going to say await sign out auth. 
And then we're gonna say alert successfully logged out. Okay, and then all we really need to do is return a button that will call that function. So we'll say return button on click equals log out. And the button itself is going to say log out. And that's really all we need to do. So let's go back into our home page now. We're gonna open up homepage.js. We're gonna remove this log out logic and the console log as well, which I forgot about. And we're also gonna remove this log out button here and the imports. And instead we're just going to import the logout button from our components slash logout button and put that down here instead. So we'll just say logout button like that. And this basically allows us to uh, insert this logout button anywhere we want to. You know, we're gonna be able to just insert it into the nav bar just by importing this component and displaying it like that without having to worry about having any kind of Firebase auth logic inside our nav bar. Now that we've done that, one more thing that I'm gonna do is actually just delete this you are logged in as user email since we're gonna now be displaying that up in our nav bar. So I'm just gonna delete that here. And in our components now, let's create a new file for our nav bar. Uh, this is gonna be pretty straightforward. We're just gonna say import logout button from logout button. We're gonna export our nav bar component like this. And our nav bar, just like our home page, is actually going to have to take a user prop uh, since essentially this will allow our nav bar to know whether the user's logged in or not. And it will also allow us to get uh, the user's current email, which we wanna display. So uh, we're just gonna say user for the prop. And inside here, we'll say return. We're gonna add just a nav element in there with some links. So we're gonna need to add, uh, we're gonna need to import the link component from React Router DOM as well. Okay, the first thing we're gonna do is display the app heading. This is just gonna be a link here. Uh, that says to, it's gonna be to the home route, and we'll just use auth example as, uh, as our app title. And under that, what we're gonna do is basically we're going to check whether or not this user exists and display the corresponding buttons accordingly. So uh, we're gonna have curly braces here. We're gonna say user, and we're gonna use a ternary operator to basically display different JSX here depending on whether or not the user exists. So if the user exists, remember we want to just display the user's email and the logout button. So what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say paragraph and we'll display the user's email. We'll say logged in as uh, here user.email. And under that, we're gonna display the logout button. So we'll say logout button and we need to wrap this inside a React fragment, like that. Okay, so that's if the user is logged in. If the user is not logged in, remember we want to display links to both the create account and login pages. These are going to be, these are going to look like buttons, but essentially they're just gonna be links. So what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say fragments, oops. And inside here, we're gonna have a link to the login page. So we'll say slash login. Inside this link, we're gonna have a button, which will say log in. And under that, we're gonna have a link to the create account page. And this button will say create account. All right, and that's our nav bar. So let's display this thing inside our app component here. We're going to basically import nav bar from its file. So from dot slash components slash nav bar. Let's actually put this up here with the rest of the components. And then in order to get this to display, we just need to put it outside of the switch down here in our JSX. So we'll just say uh, navbar like that. We're gonna pass the user through as a prop. And now if we go back and take a look at our application, we should see auth example, which takes us to the home route logged in as sean5 at gmail.com, and we have the log out button. And yes, this is our, this is our nav bar. It's not very good looking. Uh, we'll have to come back and add some styles to it. 
but it does work if we click log out, as you'll see, we'll see successfully logged out and this will change to log in and create an account, which will take us to those corresponding pages. Okay. And also auth example doesn't work uh, right now because it, we're trying to go to the home page essentially, but it's redirecting us right back to the login page. All right, so that's our nav bar. Um, let's use this opportunity to actually add a few styles to our application since it's really, really ugly right now. Uh, so here's what this is gonna look like. I'm just gonna open up the index.css file of our project, and I'm gonna add a few key styles. So first of all, we're gonna style our inputs and buttons, and I'm just gonna copy and paste some, uh, some typical styling for those so that uh, it'll look the same as the rest of our application, right? Same font, same font size, etc. cetera. Uh, we're gonna do something similar for our anchor tags. This will be the link components that we're displaying. For this one, we're just gonna set it to display block so that each one will be on its own line. Uh, for margin bottom, we're gonna set eight picks so that there will be spacing between that and the next thing uh, when it's displayed, let's say in the create account or login pages. We're just gonna give it a little bit of padding to make it look more like the buttons. We're gonna give it a uh, text align center and we're gonna give it width 100%, just like we had up here on the input and buttons. Now, normally you probably won't wanna do this. You'll probably wanna add new classes and stuff like that for with 100% for your buttons and links. But since most of our application is just those things at this point, it's not really that big of a deal. So that's the styling for our input and buttons. Uh, one last thing is for our button. Right, for all the buttons in our application, we're gonna to wanna to say cursor pointer. Um, what else? Let's add a few more styles now for our nav bar. Basically what this is gonna look like, and I'm just gonna add them right in index.css too. You could do it with CSS modules or styled components if you wanted to. Uh, what we're gonna do, I'm just gonna say nav, uh, and I'm gonna say display flex, and I'll also give it uh, just a nice little border bottom there. We'll say two picks solid, and we'll do a light gray color. We'll do like CCC, something like that. And that will basically make all of the items inside the nav bar be displayed on the same line, evenly spaced. So the next thing is we're gonna say nav A. This will basically be all of the anchor tags, all of the links inside the nav bar. We're gonna say color inherit and text decoration none. This will basically get rid of the blue or purple, you know, 1990s, internet styling that is still on our application right now. Uh, that'll get rid of that when it's on our nav bar. Next thing we're gonna say, uh, we're gonna add a class here for our app heading, right? That's the title in our nav bar. Uh, that's just gonna be flex and we can do seven or eight or something like that. That'll really just make sure that that takes up the majority of the spacing in the nav bar. And other than that, we're just gonna make sure that the uh, H1 tag inside the app heading. So we'll say app heading H1. We'll say text align left. And we're gonna add a nav button class here, which will be our login, log out, et cetera buttons. That's just going to be flex one there, okay? So that's pretty much all the classes that we need right now. Let's just go back and add those to their corresponding elements inside our nav bar and the corresponding uh, pages. The nav bar is really the main one that we need. So for app heading, for example, we're just gonna want to add that up here. All right, so inside link, we're just gonna say class name equals app dash heading. Down here then for our logout button, we're gonna wrap that in a div with the class name of nav button. Okay, and we're gonna do the same thing now for our login and create account buttons here. Uh, we're just going to add that same class to these links. We'll say class name equals nav button and class name equals nav button. All right, so let's go back and take a look at our app so far. Uh, it's looking a little better, although this actually looks terrible. For some reason, this auth example is teeny tiny. Oh, and that's because we never actually wrapped this in an H1 tag. Okay, so we're just gonna wrap that there. 
H1. That should make it look a lot better. And sure enough, now it's in its proper place. Um, we see that our buttons are now the right size, right? We can click on login, create account. If we're already logged in here, let's just enter in something like this, sean5 at gmail.com, abc123, log in. And that doesn't look the greatest, but we'll just leave it for now. Feel free to add some, uh, to add a margin to that if you like. And everything looks like it's working well. Okay, so the only other thing that we have to change here, right, I wanna actually put the login and create account pages inside their own container so that they're not the entire width of the page because that quite frankly looks pretty bad. So all we need to do for that now is just go into uh, our app component and we're going to basically wrap our switch component in a div with the class name of centered container. Okay, so we'll Close that off down here now, indent our switch. And then we just need to add a centered container class here. So we'll say centered container. For this one, we're just gonna give it a max width of something like, I don't know, let's do 600 picks. And we'll say margin auto, and that should center it very nicely for us. So sure enough, that looks more like your average login or uh, create account pages. And if we actually do log in now, if we say sean at gmail.com, abc123, log in, we'll see that the home page has that same styling as well. Cool, so now we have a nice styled application. Feel free to go through and actually add some more exciting styles here. As you may know by now, I'm not big on uh, getting fancy with styling well. Uh, doing courses. I just, I'm happy with the minimal amount of styling here. So again, feel free to go through and add all of your own, you know, add your own brand colors, etc. But anyway, we now have a nice nav bar for our application that responds according to, you know, whether the user is logged in or not. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Working with Firebase the naive way in React applications, which is what we've been doing so far, is great up until your React applications start to get more complex, at which point it can become, well, a mess if you're not careful. So what we're gonna take a look at here today are some techniques for basically encapsulating the complex logic that Firebase can sometimes contain into what's called a custom React hook. You're gonna see what that looks like in just a minute if you're not familiar with those things. So let's jump right in and get started. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna take a look at here is how to create a custom hook in order to take care of all of this auth logic for us. Okay, now when I say custom hook, what I mean is just like how in our app.js component, we were able to use use state, use state uh, in order for our is loading and user. And you know we've done something similar for all of the forms in our application so far as well. Just like we're able to use the built-in hooks like use state and use effect and use history, you know, all of those ones that we've seen before, we're also able to create our own which basically allow us to encapsulate the interactions of one or more hooks, uh, you know, in just a simple hook that we can use inside any of our components. So in order to understand what we're gonna be doing here a little better, let's take a look at the JSX again of our app component. And we're gonna see that there's an awful lot of places in here where we're passing in this user prop, uh, you know, or some form of it, to the components that our app component is displaying, right? We've got one in our nav bar, auth route, unauth route, unauth route, home page. You could imagine that, you know, in other pages that we'd have, we would also have to pass this thing in as well. Basically, anywhere that we're gonna need any kind of auth logic, we're gonna need to pass this user thing down as a prop. And that's not ideal, right? Because it leads to a lot of props drilling. If we have our app component up here, 
and our app components displaying some page components and each of those page components is displaying its own components and each of those components is displaying its own components. If one of these components down here needs the user, right? Then we really have one of two choices. We can either duplicate all of the logic that we saw up here in these components, which isn't ideal because that involves copying, pasting, code duplication, etc. And the other option is to just pass that user down from our app component, you know, in kind of a waterfall-y kind of way. And that's not ideal either because that leads to a lot of props drilling. Now, there are other ways that we could do this. We could use context if we wanted to. We could probably do something with Redux if we wanted to. But really the most straightforward way to do this is to use a custom hook. Now, to see what a custom hook is gonna look like, what we're gonna do is just create one here. Uh, you know, that's probably the simplest way to get started. So let's create a new folder inside our source folder, which we'll call hooks, right? So just like we have components pages, we're also gonna have a hooks folder, which will contain the custom hooks for our application. So inside here, let's create a new file and we're gonna call this custom hook use user. Yes, it's kind of a silly name, um, but it really describes quite well actually what this custom hook is going to do. Now, before we actually go about creating this use user hook, let's talk about more or less how we're gonna be able to use it from inside other components. Okay, so let's just, uh, you know, let's use our homepage component as an example. If we open that up, we see that right now it's getting user as a prop and you know, it's just kind of displaying some basic data from that. So what this is gonna look like with our use user hook, once we've created it, is instead of getting this user through, uh, you know, through a prop in our home page, we're gonna say something like const user equals use user. And that will basically take all of the logic that is now in our app component, if we open that up, right? All of this logic with loading a user, subscribing to auth changes, uh, setting this is loading variable correctly, that's gonna take all of that and encapsulate it inside a hook where we'll literally just be able to say this, right? To have this uh, line in any component that needs it. Now that eliminates the need for props, right? We won't need to have a user prop in our home page, And it also, on the other side, eliminates the need to actually pass those props down to those components as we're seeing so many times inside our app component here. So that's going to be how our use user hook works. It's literally just going to allow us to drop user authentication logic into our components using a single line of code, which is pretty cool. So what does this look like? Well, what we're gonna do essentially is, like I said, we're gonna recreate a lot of the logic that was in our app component. And basically we're going to return that from this hook so that any component that uses it will be able to, um, you know, we'll be able to access that user, we'll be able to see whether the user's loading, and later on we'll actually even see that this will allow us to, uh, you know, we'll be able to return functions from this custom hook that will make it so that our components such as, let's take a look here, components such as our logout button won't have to have this logout functionality inside of there. They'll just be able to say something like const logout equals use user, okay? So we'll see how to do that uh, shortly. The first thing we're gonna do is export this custom hook. We're gonna say export const use user equals and it's not gonna take any arguments. Now, if you haven't worked with custom hooks before, you've gotta realize that custom hooks are just JavaScript functions that have to start with this use uh, prefix, and generally they also use other hooks inside of them, such as use state hooks. Okay, so what this is gonna look like, we're gonna start off by importing the use state and use effect hooks from React. And underneath that, we're going to import the get auth and on auth state changed hooks. Well, those aren't hooks, actually. Those are just uh, functions from Firebase slash auth. All right, so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna basically recreate, as I said, all of the logic that we had inside our app component, and we're gonna put it inside our use user hook. 
So what that'll look like, we'll start off by saying const auth equals get auth. We're going to define an is loading and user state variables. So we'll say const is loading set is loading equals use state. That's going to start off as not auth dot current user, right? So that's essentially exactly what we were doing in app.js, where if the current user doesn't exist, then loading or is loading will be true initially. And we're also going to say const user set user equals use state auth dot current user. All right, so now that we have those state variables, the next thing we're gonna do is create a subscription using the use effect hook. Okay, and inside here, we're gonna use on auth state changed. So we'll say on auth state changed. We're gonna pass the auth as the first argument. And for the second argument, we're gonna say user. We're gonna set the user state to user. And we're gonna set is loading to false. All right, and then we're going to uh, basically cancel this subscription when, uh, when the component that's using this hook unmounts. So to do that, all we have to do, um, well, in our app component, what we did is we said const cancel subscription equals on auth state changed, and then we returned cancel subscription. All we really have to do if we want to uh, do that is just say return on auth state changed, and that will automatically take care of canceling the subscription when the component that's using this hook unmounts. Okay, so the other thing we're gonna do is add auth as a dependency to this use effect hook. And last but not least, here's the part that's a little bit different from what we saw in our app.js. We're going to return both the is loading and user state variables from this hook, which will make those accessible to the component that's using this hook. So all that's gonna look like, we're gonna return these two state variables as properties of an object. So we're gonna say return is loading and user. And that's really all we need to do. So this is our use user custom hook. So let's see now how we can actually use this. Uh, first of all, I guess we'll just try this out on our app component and then we'll see how to actually uh, incorporate it into each of our other components that we're using down here. All right, so first of all, in our app component, we're just gonna delete all of this stuff completely. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna import our custom hook. We won't, uh, we won't need these things, by the way. We can delete get off on off state change, so we can delete the use state use effect import. Okay, and then uh, we're going to import our custom hook by saying import use user from hooks slash use user. And last but not least, we're gonna use this thing by saying const is loading use user, or not use user, just user, equals use user. Okay, and that will basically make is loading and user, right, the exact same ones that we had inside our app component as state variables earlier, that'll make those accessible to the rest of our JSX inside of here and everything should work just as before. So let's just run our application here to make sure I didn't make any typos, make sure there's no errors. And sure enough, everything looks like it's working well, right? We had the is loading message at the beginning. If we log out now and try and log back in, we'll say sean at gmail.com and we'll do abc123, try logging in. Sure enough, we should see successfully logged in and okay, and we should basically be back at our homepage. So it looks like everything is working just as before, except now we're doing that with a custom use user hook. So one thing that I wanna point out here, because people tend to get hung up on custom hooks, no pun intended, and uh, you know they, they tend to look at them as something more complicated than they really are. Note that really all we did inside this custom hook was we took the exact logic from our app component. This is almost you know, verbatim what we had inside our app component. And instead of having it inside app.js, we just basically wrapped it inside this use user function, okay? And then, you know, in order to define what our app component can access inside this, uh, inside this box here, all we have to do is define the return statement, and that really defines 
what our app component or any other component for that matter can access inside of here. So if you want to think of custom hooks that way as literally just copying and pasting, again, almost verbatim, all of the logic from inside one component, right? Uh, if the logic's getting too complex or if you want to share it between multiple components, just copying and pasting all of that and just adding a return statement that uh, contains all of the data in whatever format you want, right? You can do an object, you can do an array, you can just return a single value if you like. Basically, by doing that, you're defining what components have access to inside, uh, you know, inside this custom hook. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so we have our custom use user hook now, and our app component is using it. But the next question is, how can we convert over our existing components to use this custom hook, right? In other words, how can we use, uh, how can we convert over components like auth route, logout button, unauth route, uh, and some of our pages to use this custom hook that we created so that we can reduce the amount of Firebase code that's scattered throughout our components. Well, the way that we do that, it's actually quite simple. All we have to do really is look at our app component and find all of the components in here that are using this user thing. Okay, so user, 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 user. And basically we're just going to convert them to use this use user hook. That was a funny sentence. We have to convert them to use this use user hook in order to uh, you know, get the user instead of a prop. So what we're gonna do, let's, I suppose, just start off with our nav bar here. Let's open up our navbar.js component. And what we're gonna do is get rid of this user prop. And instead we're going to import our use user hook by saying import use user from dot dot slash hooks slash use user. And then down here, all we need to do is get the user, okay? So to do that, we're going to say const, and then in curly braces, because we are, remember, returning an object from our custom hook here that contains both is loading and user. Uh, and then we're just gonna say equals use user. And that should really be all we need to do. So if we go back and take a look at our application now, we're just going to refresh it, and we should see that that's automatically uh, being displayed up at the top. Now, looking at this, I do see that there's one little problem that we might want to uh, that we might want to work around, and that is when we refresh, you can see that the entire application is displayed as loading. Now, this is fine and it works. It makes sure that none of our components tries to access user uh, before everything is actually loaded. But there's a lot of pieces in our application that really don't need don't need the user, right? In our navbar, for example, this part doesn't need the user. And in fact, the entire container of the navbar could still be displayed while our application is loading, right? It is a little bit funny to just have nothing displayed of our application until we're, you know, until we're sure whether the user's logged in or not. So what we're gonna do to remedy this, and this is going to influence, by the way, how we end up using the use user hook in our navbar component, um, what we're going to do is back in our app.js component, we're going to move this is loading thing down inside our div here. So essentially only the contents of our page, right? Whatever page we're on will be replaced with the loading message and not the entire application, right? The nav bar, for example, will still be displayed while our application is loading. So what that's going to look like is Essentially, we're just going to add curly braces inside of here. We're going to steal this is loading thing like that and paste it inside of there. And then we're just going to take the switch and everything inside of it and put it inside here as uh, basically the JSX to display if our application, right, if our user is not loading. Okay, otherwise we're going to display the loading message right there. Okay, so in other words, now everything outside of that will be displayed, right? The centered container will still be displayed. The nav bar will still be displayed. The router will still be displayed, etc. And you know that should just make it a little bit more, a uh, little bit 
less strange to look at when we refresh our application. Now, one thing that is going to happen if we refresh the page, and you might see it up here, is that for a brief moment, the login and create account buttons flash in our nav bar before it actually picks up that there's a user and displays the logout button and the user's email. Now, in this situation, what we'll probably want to do is display a loading message there while it's loading so that you don't get that kind of funny interface going on. So the way that we can do that is inside our nav bar, we're going to also get the is loading uh, property from our use user hook. And we're just going to say if is loading return. Oops, actually, we want to have that down here. Yeah, instead of all this stuff here, we'll say is loading question mark. We're going to display the loading message here if that's the case. Otherwise, we're going to check if user exists and display uh, one of these two things. Now, this is kind of, you know, nested ternary operators can be a little bit hard to read. So if you need to change the indentation here to make it a bit more readable, uh, I'm just going to do that here to help you out. You're welcome. So let's indent this stuff here. And that should really be all we need to do. Yeah, that looks pretty good to me. So let's take a look at this now. We're going to go back here and click refresh. And sure enough, we'll see that the loading message flashes there before anything gets displayed. Now, you might want to change that and make it something a little more, um, you know, something that looks a little better, like uh, you could do a loading spinner there. You could do some kind of cool animation if you wanted to. But for now, right, just that basic loading dot 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 is perfectly fine for our needs. Cool, so that's our nav bar. Let's continue on converting our components over. The next thing here is going to be our auth route and our unauth route. So let's open those files up. We're gonna open up unauth route and auth route. And instead of taking this is auth prop here, we're going to just take props as the single argument. Okay, and we're going to use our use user custom hook here in its place. So. We'll say import use user from hooks slash use user. And then down here, we'll say const user equals, oops, there we go, user equals use user. And then for is auth, right, we can either create a separate variable for this by saying is auth equals user, right? And that maybe makes it a little more readable, but you can also just say, uh, exclamation point, exclamation point, user in the ternary operator like that. And most people will understand what that means, I believe. All right, now that's our auth route. Let's do the same thing for our unauthed route. It's gonna look almost identical. So we'll just say import use user from hook slash use user. We're gonna say const user equals use user. Oops, there we go. And then we'll just say instead of is auth exclamation point, exclamation point, user. All right, oh, and let's also remove this is auth prop and we'll remove those props, well here. We can just change this now to a single argument. And then in our app.js component, let's remove those things from where they are. Oh, we never removed this from our nav bar. We don't need it there anymore. So we'll remove that. For auth route, we can remove is auth. We can remove unauth route here. We can remove is auth in our auth route here as well. All right, so what we're gonna see now is if we refresh the page, everything's gonna be pretty much the same as it was before, except now our route components are using that custom hook that we created uh, instead of just getting a prop passed down to them. Now, one other thing that you might want to consider doing with the auth route and unauth route, you may have noticed that we didn't use the is loading property uh, inside these things when we were using this custom hook. Now, the reason we didn't have to do that is inside our app component, remember, we're not actually displaying any of these routes unless everything is done loading. So we have sort of a built-in protection for all of our route components because we know that by the time these things are actually displayed and by the time their logic is executed, right, by the time they execute this hook here, we know that it's not going to be loading anymore. However, if you were going to reuse these uh, auth route and unauth route components in another application where you have a different setup, right, in your routing logic, 
you would probably want to add that is loading here just to make sure that you don't end up displaying a redirect just because something's loading, right? Because at first, right, if these things weren't inside of this is loading thing, if we didn't have this protection, and we can just comment that out if you want to see what'll happen, what we'll see is that we'll get that weird little redirect and we'll end up taking a look at the login page before, uh, you know, before the user actually gets to the home page. Now, obviously that's not, um, you know, that's not an ideal situation. It looks kind of funky and it doesn't really give me a whole lot of, uh, doesn't really give me a whole lot of trust in the website. Just gives me kind of the heebie-jeebies somehow. So that's why I recommend that, you know, you add that is loading property to the auth route and unauthed route, even if you think that uh, those are going to always be protected from loading logic. So um, what I'm going to do is just go into here. Oops, I made some mistakes there syntax wise. What I'm going to do is just go into these two routes and add is loading. And inside both of those, we can just say if is loading return loading right, or whatever your loading component is. And I'm gonna just do that here as well. I'll copy this, paste it inside on auth route, and that should be all we need to do. Okay, so one last thing, just to make sure that's working correctly, it looks like we're all good. All right, and the last component we need to convert now is going to be our home page. So for our home page, instead of taking the user as a prop again, we're going to just get it from the custom hook. So we'll say import use user from hooks slash use user. And then we'll say const and we'll say user equals use user. And that should work. So if we go back here and just refresh, we'll see that everything works as before. Now this one does have the same potential for difficulties with user as before. Namely, if user doesn't exist, if this homepage does somehow get displayed when user is null, that'll end up throwing an error, right? Because uh, basically we'll be trying to access a property on uh, a null value. So if you wanna protect yourself from that, what I would recommend is just adding in user and user metadata, blah, 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 and then user and user ID, right? You could also put those uh, guards at the beginning of this line. For example, you could say something instead like, hang on just a minute here. There we go. You could say something like user and paragraph, blah, 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 blah. We need to add this curly brace back. And you could do the same thing down here as well. So that would just make it so that those elements weren't displayed at all if the user didn't exist. Okay. Oops, so we need to add a closing curly brace there. So now, right, if user was null, if we were to just say const user equals null, which could in theory happen if we were using this home page in some kind of different situation, or if we change the setup of our app component, uh, we can see that those things just wouldn't be displayed. Whereas before, right, if we were to just go back to what we had earlier, hang on, I'm just gonna undo that. If we were to go back to what we had earlier and say const user equals null, this would actually give us an error, okay? So just to protect ourselves from that happening, let's change these back. And oops, I undid too far, so I have to redo this again. There we go, there we go. And that's all we need to do. So everything's working now. And that's all of our components. The last thing we need to do is just remove this last user prop from our homepage uh, in our app component, and we are now done. So we can actually remove this user thing altogether, right? Or just that user, uh, that user variable from our app component because we're not actually using it or accessing it. We're just waiting to see if this thing is done loading and letting the rest of the components take care of the actual user authentication logic. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've converted over our components to use this custom use user hook that we created, the next thing that we're gonna do is see how to basically convert this use user hook or extend it rather, so that it takes care of not just 
the initial loading of our user, but it will also take care of things like login functionality, logout functionality, creating accounts, etc. So to just to elaborate a little bit on what we're going to do here, wouldn't it be nice if instead of here, let's just open up our login page here. Wouldn't it be nice if this page really just had to worry about displaying the JSX, okay? In other words, wouldn't it be nice if all of this logic here, including, well, everything except for the form state, we'll wanna keep that inside our login page, but wouldn't it be nice if everything here, including this error state, was automatically handled for our login page and our create account page and all of our other pages so that we didn't have to you know, have this pretty sizable amount of logic in each of our components. So essentially what we're gonna do, what I'm picturing anyway, is we're going to extend our use user hook so that it will essentially include those functions inside of it. So instead of having to basically define this login function inside our login page, we could just say something like const login equals use user. Okay, now one thing is that since our use user hook isn't really required inside any of these pages, we're actually going to create a separate hook, which we'll call, I don't know, we'll call it something like use auth. And that will be what we actually end up uh, exporting these functions from or returning these functions from rather. So it'll look more like this instead, right? It's generally a good idea to keep your, uh, keep your custom hooks as modular as possible. Okay, so let's create another hook now inside our hooks folder. We're gonna say new file, and for this one we'll say use auth.js. And essentially what we're gonna do inside of here is just move all of the logic, right, all of the Firebase related logic that we had inside um, our login page, inside our create account page, etc into this custom hook and return those functions so that our components can access them. All right, so what this is gonna look like, we're gonna start off with our login page and we're gonna say export const use auth. Oops, let's try that again, there we go. And we're gonna have a few state variables in here. First of all, what we're gonna do is we're going to have an error state. So we'll say const error and set error equals use state. And it'll just be an empty string at first. And what this is going to allow us to do is basically get any errors that occur during the login, during the create account process, etc., and return them from this hook so that the component doesn't even have to worry about those. Okay, you'll see what I mean in just a second if that doesn't make sense yet. And we do need to import the use state hook up at the top here from React. Okay, and the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to define that login function again. So we'll say const login, oops, with a capital I, equals async. And what we're gonna do inside of here is login just like we saw before. The difference though is that this function is actually going to have to take the email and password from the component because we don't have access to the component's state inside this function. So we're gonna to need to say email, password, and then we're gonna say const auth equals get auth, right? That's from Firebase that we're importing that. Oops, I think it was wrong there. We'll just try that again, import get auth, and we're gonna also want sign in with email and password from Firebase auth. Okay, so we're getting auth, and we're also gonna say await, sign in with email and password. We're gonna pass the email and password that we got as arguments uh, in this function. So email, password, and before I forget, we also need to add auth as the first argument to this function. All right, and last but not least, well, I was gonna display an alert actually, but I don't think I'll do that here because I was getting kind of sick of seeing those alerts. So we know that it's working now, so we'll just go without an alert. We'll know that the user was successfully logged in by the fact that they go to the home page when they log in. All right, so we do need to handle errors here just like before. So we're gonna say try and catch. And inside here, we're basically just gonna say set error to, 
And then what we're gonna do is basically copy and paste this error messages map that we had up here. Uh, we're gonna copy and paste that into this file. So we'll just say paste. And then what we're gonna do is say set error. We'll see if an error message uh, exists for that given E right here. So E.message. Otherwise, we'll just display E.message instead. So I'm kind of changing the default here just because I figure it would be best to just show whatever error is happening instead of just displaying a generic error. I've changed my mind since I wrote this line. So anyway, that's why I'm doing that. All right, and that is our login function. So essentially what we're gonna do now is we're gonna return both this login function and the error state from our custom use auth hook. So that'll look like this. We're gonna say return login and error. And essentially all we need to do now is go into our login page, remove all of this other logic here, except for email and password. We're gonna leave those. And we're gonna say const log in and error equals use auth. And we're gonna import that from its file. All right, and we don't need this Firebase auth import anymore because that's all encapsulated inside our use auth custom hook. So really the only other thing that we have to do that I just saw is inside this login function in use auth, we just need to reset the error uh, just like we did before. So anyway, that should be all we need to do. Let's test out this login page again. So we're gonna go back here. We're gonna click log out. We're gonna see successfully logged out. And we should see that if we enter in an email and a password here and click log in, uh-oh, we see that we got something here. And that's because uh, basically we forgot to pass the email and password through uh, to this login function as arguments. So all we need to do for this is just say login, email and password like that. And that should get rid of that error. Let's click login now. And sure enough, we should see that everything ended up working. So that's how we added that login function to uh, our custom use auth hook. Oops, we just, you might see an error like this that happens because of the uh, timeout. Uh, that, shouldn't, uh, that shouldn't be a problem going forward. That was just from when we tried to log in earlier. So, so anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've encapsulated the login functionality inside this custom use auth hook, let's do the same thing with some of the other pieces of logic that we find inside our components. So the first one that we're gonna do is gonna be for our create account page. So let's actually open that up and I'm just gonna close some of these here to declutter a bit and open up use auth again. And we'll also open up create account page. All right, so. The way that this is gonna work is we're basically just going to take this logic from create account page, put it inside, use auth, and everything is gonna be pretty much the same uh, as before. The main difference is that just like with our login function here, we're gonna need to pass the email password and we're also gonna need to pass confirm password as arguments to this function. So let's say const, and we're gonna call this create account. This is gonna be an asynchronous function here that will take the email, password, and confirm password. It's gonna take those as arguments here. And once we've done that, we're going to uh, start off by setting the error to an empty string. We're going to check to see if the password and confirm password are the same. So we'll say if password does not equal confirm password, we're gonna set the error. And note that we're using this same error state inside use auth uh, as we are with our login function. So the error will essentially be shared between these two things, which as we'll see, could actually lead to some, uh, a few difficulties, but we'll get there in a minute. Okay, we're gonna say uh, set error to, what did we use before? We said passwords must match. 
Otherwise, we're gonna try and log the user in, or create an account rather. And to do that, we're gonna need the create user with email and password function from Firebase off. I'm just going to adjust the indentation here like that. Oops, there we go. And then what we're gonna do is inside a try catch block, because we want to handle these errors, obviously, uh, we're gonna say const auth equals get auth. We're gonna say await create user with email and password. We're gonna pass in auth email and password. And then we could display an alert, but I'm just going to leave the alert out of this one as well. So for the catch block, on the other hand, it's gonna look pretty similar to what we had inside our create account page. We're just gonna say set error to e dot message. Or better yet, we could just use this error messages thing up here since that's now in the same file. So I'll just have the same line that we had inside login and we'll say set error to error messages, blah, blah, blah. Unless that doesn't exist, then it will be e dot message. So there might be some that are shared between here. Obviously we're not gonna see wrong password or user not found inside our, uh, you know, in the create account function, but we may well see this invalid email error occur. So. So anyway, the last thing that we're gonna have to do here is return this create account function from our custom hook. To do that, we can just say create account. And here, let's just organize these a little more. I'm gonna put the error first by saying error. And then we have login, create account. That should be all we need. So let's go back to our create account page now. And instead of having all of this logic inside here, we're just gonna delete that and we're going to use our custom hook, right? We can also get rid of the imports from Firebase there. We're gonna import our custom hook by saying import use auth from hooks use auth. And then we'll just say const error and uh, what was it? Create account equals use auth. And we are gonna need to uh, modify where we call this function a little bit so that we can actually pass in the, uh, the arguments that it needs. So down here inside our button, we're just gonna say on click, create account. That will be um, email and password and confirm password also. And that should really be all we need. So let's give this one a try now. We're gonna see, let's see here. Am I on Sean four, Sean five? Yeah, so I'm gonna create Sean six on the create account page. So let's log out. We're gonna go to the create account page. We're gonna enter Sean6 at gmail.com, password abc123, same thing for confirm password. Oh, one thing I do wanna show you actually before we go through doing this the correct way, let's enter in a password that doesn't match here and click create account. And that actually sent us through, which makes me think that I missed something inside here. Ah, yes, okay. so. When we set the error to passwords must match, we have to return in order to prevent this function from executing any further. Okay, so what was happening, we were getting this error, but it was still creating a user with that email and password. So let me try that again. All right, we're gonna try and create Sean seven now. And let's go back to the create account page here. We're gonna say Sean seven now at gmail.com. Let's enter in ABC one, two, three exclamation point, ABC123. Uh, actually, let's enter something different here now and click create account. We'll see passwords must match. If we make them match now, we'll say ABC123 exclamation point. And if we click on create account, we should be sent through and we'll see that we're now logged in as Sean7. So that seems to be working well. Um, and that's how we add the create account function into our custom use auth hook. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so we've moved the login function and the create account functions into our use auth hook here. So the last thing that we're gonna need to do is move the log out function into this hook so that uh, we can get that logic out of our logout button. Now, first of all, our logout button has some pretty specific functionality, so we may well just wanna leave this in here, but just, to, just for consistency, I'm going to move this logout function into our custom use auth hook here. 
that'll just give us a little more practice with uh, with how it works. So what we're going to do is create a new logout function. For that, we'll say const logout equals async. Okay, and we don't need any arguments for this one. It's just going to be an empty function, which should make it easier to switch over. And up here at the top, we're going to say sign out. Okay, that's the function we want. And inside here now, we're going to say const auth equals auth, or get auth rather, get auth. Okay, and under that, we're going to say await sign out and pass auth as an argument. And that should basically allow the user to be successfully logged out. All right, so really all we have to do is return this logout function as part of this object that we're returning from use auth. And inside our logout button component now, we're going to remove this logout function. Okay, yep, everything looks good there. We're gonna remove the import, and the one import that we are gonna have is our use auth hook. And for that, I'm going to just say const log out equals use auth. And that's really all there is to it. So let's go check out this logout button now that we've uh, converted it over. We're going to try logging in. We'll say Sean. We'll just log in as Sean7, I suppose. And one, two, three, log in. And sure enough, we see that we're logged in. So let's try logging out now. We'll click log out. And it looks like everything's working. Now, the beauty of having these things encapsulated inside our use auth hook now, let's say that we wanted to log out, let's say, when the user clicked on something other than the logout button. Well, basically, all we would have to do in that case is, if we open up our home page here, all we would have to do is basically say const log out equals use auth. Okay, and then we could just make anything, right? It could just be even a button here that says on click equals log out. And if we made that say log out, that's basically what our log out button is. So it could be argued that we don't even need this log out button component anymore. So I'm just going to delete that. And if we go back and take a look, let's log in here again. Say Sean7 at gmail.com. Password ABC123. We should see that this button will work exactly the same as the logout button component. So essentially before what we were doing is we were using this separate logout button component to encapsulate all of the logic uh, for logging out, but we don't really need that anymore. So I'm gonna just get rid of this button and wherever we needed to log out, let's say uh, in our navbar component, we'll need to do that. What I'm gonna do is remove the logout button and I think I did that here, yeah. We we'll need to remove that from our homepage too, the import. And we're gonna just import the logout function from our use auth uh, custom hook. So we'll say equals use auth. And then down here where we had our logout button, we're just gonna replace that with a regular old button that says button on click equals logout. And we'll make that say logout. Okay, so we can see now that that's got the exact same, well, here we have to log in yet again to uh, to check this, but click log in. Sure enough, we see that both those buttons look and behave exactly the same as before. Okay, so, and the same goes, by the way, for the other functions that we have here. If, let's say, we wanted to create an account from some other kind of situation, right? Like maybe a user uh, comes in through an email campaign that we do, and we have a separate landing page for that that allows them to create an account. Well, all we would have to do in that situation is just say create account. We'd have to load it from this custom hook, and we could just use it, uh, you know, without having to copy and paste all of this logic. So hopefully that makes sense. That's the real power of creating custom hooks like this, and hopefully this has also improved your, uh, your experience with Firebase Auth. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. 
So far, the examples that we've seen involving Firebase Auth have been strictly for the front end of an application. But the fact is that most of the time when we use some kind of Auth provider, such as Firebase Auth, we're going to want to add it to a full stack setup. So what we're going to be taking a look at here today is how do we add Firebase Auth to a full stack and what are some of the implications of adding Firebase Auth to an app on our full stack setup. We're going to be taking a look at some things such as how to create a basic backend, how to make requests to that backend from our front end, and how Firebase Auth fits into all of that. So without further ado, let's get going. Okay, so the first step in seeing how to incorporate Firebase into a backend is going to be to actually set up a backend. So we're going to do this using Express, and essentially what we're going to do is move all of this front end code into its own folder. Okay, so we'll create a new folder here called front end, and basically just copy and paste everything that was just directly inside the root directory here into this front end folder and that'll just make it a little bit easier for us to keep things organized and to work on everything simultaneously. So to create a backend now, what we're going to do, and this is just going to be a basic express server setup process, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new folder called backend, right? You can call it server if you want or whatever else you want to call it, that's fine. And we're going to basically change directories into this new folder inside our uh, inside our terminal here by saying cd backend and we're just going to basically initialize this as an npm package and install some other libraries into it that we'll be using so the first thing that we need to do as with most npm projects that we're creating from scratch is we're going to say npm init dash y that will generate a package.json file for us as you can see and once we have that, we're going to install some of the packages that we'll be using. So first of all, we're going to install the two main things that we'll be using, right? The two main libraries that we need to actually build out a backend. And those are going to be Express and MongoDB. And we'll hit enter and let those install. And once those have installed, we're going to install some dev dependencies, right? This is basically just Babel and Node Daemon, which we'll be using to allow ourselves to, you know, write the most modern JavaScript code possible in a Node environment. And this is something that I've covered elsewhere, so if you're not familiar with these packages, don't worry too much about it. Okay, so let's say npm install save dev, and we're going to install three Babel packages. One is going to be Babel slash core, one is gonna be Babel slash node, and one is going to be babel slash preset dash env. And we're also going to install the node daemon package, which will take care of automatically restarting our express server whenever we make changes to it. So let's hit enter, and that will install all of those packages for us as well. And that should be all we need to do for now as far as packages. So uh, the next thing that we're going to do, if you want to commit this to GitHub, right, this backend code, you're going to want to add a git ignore file to this, uh, to this directory so that it won't actually commit all of the node modules. That's quite a sizable thing to commit, and it's not even your code, so there's not really any point to commit that to GitHub. So what I'm going to do in here is just add node modules, save that, and you should see that node modules is now grayed out. And we will be using this git ignore thing for other files, right, credential files that we'll be using in order to allow our server to use Firebase Auth a little later on. Okay, so next up, we're going to create a new folder in here called source. And inside there, we're going to create a new file called server.js. And this is where we're going to end up writing most of the code for our express server. Okay, so just to get all of our endpoints set up here, what we're going to do is basically just use a fake in-memory database, which we'll use just to make sure we have all of our logic right, and then we'll see how to convert this over to MongoDB. It should be, pretty, should be a pretty run-of-the-mill process here. So what we're going to do, first of all, is we're going to import the Express library like this, import Express from Express. And we're going to create our fake database here, which is just going to contain two users. So we'll say const users 
And this is going to be an object that will basically have the user ID, right, the Firebase ID as the key and the actual user information as uh, the value for that key. Before we do this, though, I want to talk a little bit about how we're going to end up, you know, connecting the users in Firebase Auth with the users in our database. So Firebase Auth, as we've seen, all the users that we create have this big, long ID property, right? Something like this. I don't know, right? And that's what Firebase uses to uniquely identify the users in our application. Now, what we're going to have to do is basically use this ID to connect the Firebase auth user with the user info in our, in our MongoDB database, right? So essentially what this means is that while MongoDB provides us automatically with an underscore ID property, which is just a, you know, it's its own randomly generated string, we're actually going to have another property on our users in the database, which will be something like, um, you know, maybe we'll just use ID without the underscore. You can also name it something like FB auth ID if you want to be more explicit about it. But the point is we have to have some property in the database for each of our user documents that will tell us what user in Firebase Auth it belongs to, okay? Now, to basically simulate this in our fake database here, all we're gonna do is just, as I said, have the Firebase ID as the key and the user information as the value for that key. Okay, so first of all, let's open up our Firebase console for this project and go to authentication. And what we're gonna do, right, I have quite a few user objects in here. I'm just gonna use sean at gmail.com and sean2 at gmail.com. Okay, so all we need to do here is copy the UUID for each of these users, right, just these two. And basically we're just going to put those inside of here. Gonna paste that long string. And as far as the information that we're gonna be storing for our users, Let's just store things like their name, right? We currently don't have the user's actual name. We've only been displaying their email address. So I'll say something like Sean Wassell. And we'll also store, uh, I don't know, like a user bio, okay? So I'll say, I like to program. Okay, so that's sean1 at gmail.com, and we will know that already, right? We don't need to store this email in MongoDB again because we'll already know on the front end what email address uh, the currently logged in user has. So let's do the same thing now with sean2. I'm going to paste this uh, key in here. And notice that I'm putting these in quotations because these unique IDs could possibly start with a number, which wouldn't be a valid... Uh, you know, which wouldn't be a valid key for JavaScript objects. So for this one, we'll say name. I'm gonna create another Sean Wassell here, my alter ego, I suppose. And for bio, we'll say I'm Sean's evil twin. Okay, awesome. So we have our sort of fake in-memory database here. Let's use this now to create all of the endpoints for our express server. This is just an approach that I like to take when I'm building out initial server functionality. So first of all, we're gonna need to create our express server by saying const app equals express. And under that, since we'll be making some post request and put requests, right, requests that have a request body, what we're gonna have to do is say app.use express.json, and that will basically uh, take care of parsing the request bodies of incoming requests for us. Don't worry about that too much if you haven't seen it, just know that we have to do it. Okay, so next thing we're gonna do is create our endpoints, and this server is going to basically have four different endpoints, right? One for uh, creating new users, one for reading users, one for editing users, or updating, and one for deleting users. The basic CRUD operations, essentially. Okay, so for our read endpoint, which is the one we're gonna create first, basically this is going to be a get endpoint that will allow us to load the information for a single user. So we'll say uh, that the path for this will be slash users slash user ID. Oops, there we go, user ID. Pretty straightforward. 
And for the create endpoint, we're gonna make that a post request to slash users. Okay, and this request is gonna have to include the auth ID of the user as well as the information that they, uh, that they wanna create their account with. Okay, so that'll look something like, I'm just gonna draw it up here. That'll just have the user's ID, which will be that Firebase ID, and it'll also have, uh, you know, like a user info property which contains their name, their bio, etc. Okay, so that's what the body of this post request is going to look like. We're also going to have an update endpoint, which will be a put endpoint, and the path for that will be slash users slash user ID. This will be the ID of the user that we want to update, and that also is going to contain a similar body just without the ID. Okay, so it'll contain, I don't know, maybe it'll contain like an updates property, which contains uh, updates that we want to make to the user's name and bio. And last but not least, we're going to have a delete endpoint, which will allow us to delete a user's info from our database. So that's going to be delete slash users slash user ID. And of course, this user ID is the ID of the user we want to delete. Okay, so that's our basic game plan with our... Uh, with our endpoints for our server, let's get started creating those. So let's do our get endpoint first. For this one, we're gonna say app.get. The path, as I said, is gonna be slash users slash user ID. The callback here is gonna be request response. And right now, since we have this fake database, all we need to do is basically say const user ID and get that from the request parameters. And we're going to get the user from our fake database by saying const user equals users user ID. Okay, this will be what we end up replacing with a MongoDB query later on. Okay, so now that we have the user, we're just going to check and say if user then response.json and send that user back to the client side. Otherwise, if the user doesn't exist, we're going to want to send back a 404 status code. Uh, so we'll say response.send status 404. All right, and that is going to be our get endpoint. Let's move on next to our create endpoint. So for that one, we're going to say app.post. The path here is going to be slash users. And we're going to say request response. And inside of here, what we're going to do is get both the user ID and the user's info from the request body. So we can say const ID user info equals request.body. And then what we're gonna do is basically just create a new property on this user's uh, object here with the ID that they included. So for that, we just need to say users ID equals user info. Okay, and this again will be where we end up putting in a MongoDB call later on. And once we've done those things, we're just going to say response.send status. And that's pretty much it, right? We could send back the created user uh, to the client side if we wanted to, but there's not really any point to doing that right now. So we'll just leave it the way it is. All right, so next up, we're moving right along here. Let's do our update endpoint by saying app.put. That's going to be slash users slash user ID. Just like before, we're gonna say const user ID equals request dot, uh, request dot params, that is. And we're also going to get the updates from the request body by saying const updates equals request dot body. And after that, we're going to find the user with the corresponding user ID by saying const user equals users user ID. And just like we did up in our get endpoint, we're going to basically check if that user exists before we do any more logic. So we'll say if user const updated user, and we're basically going to apply these updates to the user uh, that we got up here. So we'll say dot, dot, dot user and dot, 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 updates. Okay, and then we just need to basically set users user ID to this updated user by saying users user ID equals updated user. And we'll send back that updated user to the client side by saying response.json updated user. 
All right, and then just like before, in fact, we can even just copy and paste this if you like, we're going to uh, return a 404 status code if that user doesn't exist. Okay, oops, and I just need to correct those curly braces there. And that should be all we need to do for our update endpoint. Last but not least, let's do our delete endpoint. This one's gonna be pretty straightforward. We're just gonna say app.delete slash users slash user ID and request response in the callback. And just like above, we're gonna say const user ID equals request.params, const user equals users, oops, users user ID. We're gonna to check to see if that user exists by saying if user, and if they do exist, we're gonna say delete users user ID and basically we're going to send them back to the client side by saying response.json, uh, that should be user, okay? So we're sending back the deleted user to the client side. Uh, we don't have to do that, but uh, it's something that I see done quite a bit on delete endpoints. Now, otherwise, just like before, we're gonna say response.send status 404 to show that that user that we're trying to delete doesn't exist. Okay, so those are our four endpoints. These are gonna form uh, really the foundation for learning how to incorporate Firebase off into our application. The last thing we need to do now is we're going to make our app listen by saying app.listen. We're gonna make it listen on port 8080. And for the callback, we're just gonna log out to the console saying that our server is running. So we'll say server is listening on port 8080. Okay, and that's all the code that we need to write in our server.js file for now. Let's also set up some scripts so that we can run our server without having to uh, you know, type in a big long command. All we're gonna do here is just add a dev script which will use the node daemon package to basically start and restart our server. So the command here is just gonna be node daemon dash dash exec babel dash node dot slash source slash server.js. That will take care of running our server and automatically restarting it. Okay, so let's just test that out now, I suppose. What we're gonna do is uh, make sure you're in your backend directory and we're gonna say npm run dev and hit enter. And oops, it looks like we made a mistake here. Ah, we forgot one thing here. We installed Babel, but we forgot to actually create a Babel RC file. So inside backend, let's say dot Babel RC. Inside here, we're just gonna say presets, and uh, we're gonna add at babel slash preset dash env. And if we save it now and restart our server, it should now run correctly. Okay, so we should see now server is listening on port 8080, which means that our server is correctly listening. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've set up a backend that will allow us to use Firebase Auth on a server, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna basically set up our front end to prepare ourselves to interact with the server. So essentially, right, inside our server.js file, we're storing information for our users, but we don't really have anywhere to display it yet, and we also don't have anywhere that would allow a user to actually edit this information. Okay, so what we're gonna do is prepare our front end to do those things, right, to interact with all of these uh, endpoints by adding a few components, and I believe there's a page in there as well. So let's close these back end files for the time being. And we're gonna open up our front end here. And the first thing we're gonna do is open up our create account page, right? So currently our create account page accepts the user's email as well as their password and confirm password doesn't really allow them to enter any more information into the form. So what we're gonna do here is add two more inputs corresponding to the pieces of information that we're storing in our server, right? So the name and bio. So what we're gonna do here is create two more inputs, as I said. Uh, the type of these is just going to be text. 
The placeholder here uh, for the name is going to be full name. And for the value, we're gonna need to create a state variable. We'll come back to that in a minute. And for on change, we're going to need to create another state variable here as well. So we'll come back to that as well. And uh, for the other input, this is going to be where the user enters their bio. For this, we'll just say something like, enter a short bio, okay? Uh, and I guess I'll put dot, dot, dot after the full name too, just for a little consistency there. And let's go create these state variables now. That should only take a minute. We're just gonna say const name set name equals use state empty string. And we're gonna say const bio set bio equals use state empty string. Okay, so now we just need to link those state variables up to these new inputs by saying name and set name e.target.value. And for the bio, we're gonna say value equals bio. On change will be set bio e.target.value. Okay, and last but not least, when we call create account, what we're gonna to need to do here is actually pass the email and bio through as arguments as well. So we're gonna say, uh, or full name rather, so name and bio as arguments. And we'll have to remember to change that on the create account function uh, when we actually go into the hook and edit that. Okay, so we've added two more inputs for the user to enter in their name and bio when they create an account. Later on, we'll be seeing how to send a request to our server and basically use that to not only create a new Firebase user, but also insert new data into our database. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is now that we've added the name and bio to our users, and we're actually going to create a new state variable here, which we'll call const user info and set user info. And we're gonna be loading this from the server. So for now, we'll just say equals use state and we'll say null. And then down here, we're gonna add two different things. Uh, we'll have a paragraph tag to display the user's name. So we'll say user info and, just to make sure that that exists, of course. So user info and, and we'll say something like your name is, and display the user's name by saying user info dot name. And we'll do the same thing here for uh, the user's bio by saying your bio is and user info dot bio. Okay, so that'll give us a nice place to actually display those things when we load the data from the server, which we'll see how to do shortly. We're also gonna add two more buttons here, one that will allow a user to delete their info from the server, and another one that will allow the user to edit their info. Now, for deleting the info, that's gonna be pretty straightforward. We're just gonna say button, and this button is going to say delete my account. And above that, we're gonna have a button which will link them to another page called the edit account page, which will actually, um, you know, which will actually allow them to edit the values of their name and bio. We'll create that page in just a minute here. So what we're gonna do for that, we're gonna say link to equals the path for the edit account page will just be edit dash account. And inside here, we're gonna display a button and say edit my account inside of there. And now that we have that, the last thing we're gonna do is actually create that edit account page so let's open up pages. We'll say new file and say edit account page.js. This one's gonna be pretty straightforward and it's actually gonna be pretty similar to the create account page. So we can just copy and paste that for a start if you like. So I'm gonna paste that in here. And what I'm gonna do is delete the email and password inputs. So we'll delete all three of those. We can delete the error as well. And we're gonna change the heading up here to edit account. And we're also gonna remove the email, password, and confirm password states because we deleted their inputs. All right, and since we're not using error anymore, we'll just delete that from there. And in fact, we don't even need this line anymore anyway. So we'll just get rid of the whole thing. All right, and the last thing we're gonna do is get rid of the link and change this button 
so that it will actually save the changes to the user's account. For that, we're gonna need to make a network request to our server, which we'll do shortly. So let's just uh, change this button text to something like save changes. Oops, let's try that again. Save changes, there we go. All right, and that's pretty much it for our edit account page. I'm going to delete these other things and I just need to actually change the name of this to edit account page. And then we just need to go into our app component and add a route for this page. So we're going to import it here. Import edit account page from pages slash edit account page. And down here, we'll create that route. We're gonna say, uh, this is going to be an auth route, right? Only auth users will be able to access it. So we'll say auth route equals path. And the path here will be edit dash account. And we'll close that tag. And inside there, we're just gonna display the edit account page. Okay, so let's run this front end to make sure that it works. Uh, you can leave the back end running in another tab if you like. So I'm gonna just say CD front end, and then I'll say NPM run start, and that should start up our app if we did everything correctly. And oops, it looks like we uh, got two errors here. Let's just make sure we have our imports straight. We're gonna to need to open up our homepage and import use state up at the top here. Import use state from React. Oops, from React, there we go. And we're gonna import the link component by saying import link from React Router DOM. Okay, so we should be good now. Uh, let's just test this now by logging in. We're gonna say sean at gmail.com, abc123, click log in. And we should see the extra buttons that we've added. It looks like one of these is a little bit out of line, but I'll leave it. And we're not seeing the user information displayed because currently we haven't loaded it. So we're hiding those elements, remember. Okay, now if we click on edit my account, that's going to take us to the edit account page, which is looking good. And if we click on delete my account, that's not gonna do anything yet because we haven't hooked it up to anything. So that's the basic front end setup that we need to do in order to interact with our back end. And what we're gonna be taking a look at next is going to be how to actually add Firebase Auth into the mix. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so at this point we have our front end set up to start interacting with our server. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna add all of the network logic and network requests to our front end that we need. Now the main point of interest here is gonna be that whenever we make a request from our front end, we're gonna need to include a little bit of extra data beyond the request body. Now what I mean by that is on our front end, right? Our front end knows that we're logged in as a given user. Okay, so I'm gonna just draw a computer here. And it knows that we're logged in as a certain user with a certain ID, right? We'll just say ABC as the ID here. But our server, right? When our server receives a request from somebody saying, hey, I'm user ABC, it really has no idea whether that's true or not. Right, and one of the things we're gonna want to do here is make sure that users can only access their own data. So in other words, if user ABC tries to request user uh, 123's data by making a request to something like users slash 123, we want the server to be able to recognize that that's not the user who made the request and deny access to that resource. Now, the way that we do this this is where Firebase Auth comes in. The way that we do that is by having the front end include the user's auth token, right? An auth token is a long, 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 long string generally that uh, we can use to actually verify that the user is who they say they are. We're not gonna go too much into the details of how this works right now, but just know that that's its main purpose. So including this auth token in the headers of all the requests that we send to the server is gonna be the main point of interest that we'll see as we actually add that network, uh, that network logic here. And later on, we'll see how to actually make our server 
parse this auth token and make sure that it's valid. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically open up each of the pages where we need to either load data or make some other kind of server request and see how to add that in. So let's start off with our home page here. Since in our home page, we basically just want to load the user info from the server so that we can display it down here in the JSX. So first of all, loading the data from the server uh, is going to be something that we need the use effect hook to do. And what that's going to look like, chances are you've seen something like this before, is we're just going to say use effect. And inside here, we're going to make a network request. Now, you can use the fetch API, which is just the default way of making network requests from the front end, but I usually prefer to use a library called Axios. So what I'm gonna do for that is just say npm install Axios and make sure you're running this in the front end if you wanna follow along with it. And once that's installed, we can actually import and use it. So let's say import Axios from Axios. And down here now, we're gonna make a network request to our server by saying, uh, first of all, we need to define an asynchronous function here. So we'll say const load user info equals async. And then we're going to make our request by saying const response equals await axios dot get, right? This is a get request endpoint. And we're going to get users slash, and we need the user's ID here. So uh, first of all, we're going to want to convert these to back ticks. And then in order to insert the user's ID, all we need to do is say user.id, right, on this user that we're getting from our use user custom hook. So we'll just say user dot, and then the property for that is UID. Okay, so if all goes well here, that will send us back the user's information. So we can just say set user info response dot data, and we should be good. Now we need to actually call this function. So we'll say if user load user info, right? We only want to actually load this information if the user exists. Otherwise this will be users slash undefined. And we also need to add a dependency to our use effect hook, which will be user. All right, so that's the basic loading logic, but we still haven't added in the auth token stuff that I talked about before. Basically, in order to get a user's auth token, there's just a special method that we need to call on this user object here uh, that will basically give us the auth token we're looking for. So what that's gonna look like, it's actually quite straightforward. We just need to say const token equals await user.getID token. And yes, this is an asynchronous thing here. It, it needs to actually generate that ID token for us. And now that we have this token, all we have to do is pass that as the headers of our request. So uh, the way that we specify headers on an axios.get request is we pass an object as the second argument and we give that object a property called headers and we wanna set an auth token header. So we'll say auth token token. All right, and there are other ways to include the auth token in the request, but this is the one that I see used quite often. All right, and that's all we should need to do for our data loading here. So let's actually try out our homepage. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that both the front end and back end are running. So we'll say npm run start for our front end and our back end's already running here. Oh, and one last thing that we're gonna need to do is actually set a proxy on our front end so that it will think that it and the back end are running on the same port. So we'll say package.json. We're gonna specify a proxy property here and this will just be the uh, URL of our locally running server. So we'll say HTTP colon slash slash localhost 8080 and that's it. Okay, and you will need to restart your front end in order for that to take effect, so. Sorry about that. Okay, and what we'll see is that once our homepage loads, we now see that we are displaying the correct information for uh, our user, right? We have your name is Sean Wassell, your bio is I like to program. Perfect, that's exactly what we wanted, and it looks like everything's going well here so far. Okay, and just one thing to note is that we're not actually using this auth token here yet. Uh, we're just putting that there so that when we actually wanna add a little bit more security to our server, we can do so relatively easily. Okay, and the next thing we're gonna do is 
we're going to open up our create account page. And this one's gonna be a little different because when we create an account, right? When a user inputs their email, password, bio, name, etc., in addition to actually creating the account using the Firebase function that we saw earlier, we also wanna send a request to that create server endpoint uh, with the user's information that they entered. So in order to make that change, we're actually gonna to have to open up our use auth uh, custom hook here. So we'll say use auth. And we're gonna to wanna to scroll down to create account. Now create account, so this is where we basically create the user uh, with their email and password. And that will actually return, right? This function will actually return the user that we've created, which will, you know, we'll be able to use their ID for that. So what we're gonna do is say const result equals await create user with email and password. And once we have that result, we're gonna say const token equals result.user.getID token. And once we have that, we're gonna make a post request to the server to create a new user. So we'll say const response equals await axios.post. Okay, the URL we're gonna be sending this to is just slash users, right? It doesn't have the ID in the URL. And for the request body, what we're gonna do is basically include both the user ID, right? That's gonna be the ID on this user we created here. So for that, we can just say ID result.user.uid. And underneath that, we're going to include the user's info, right? Which is just going to be uh, the name and bio. So let's add those as arguments here, as I said, we should remember earlier. And then we're gonna say, user info, and we're gonna pass the name and bio through as arguments there. Okay, and additionally, we're also going to include the auth token header. So we'll just say headers and auth token. And for that, we're going to pass the user's token. Okay, and we're not actually gonna do anything with this response here. Uh, so we can just remove this, I suppose. There we go. And that should be all we need to do for creating an account. So remember that here, right, essentially what we're doing here requires two different parties, right? There's two different third parties involved. There is Firebase Auth, right? I'm just gonna call that FBA. And there's also our own server, right? I'll say ours. And our front end basically is communicating with both. So it's first of all, creating a new user in Firebase Auth. Firebase Auth is sending back the new information for that user, such as the ID. And then our front end is actually sending that information to the server. Now in general, this kind of flow isn't necessarily the best way to do things because it's relying on the client side to basically keep both Firebase Auth and our server in sync. So what we would normally wanna do is have something more like this where our client side simply sends a request to our server to create a new account. And our server actually takes care of communicating with Firebase Auth, right? So I'll just name that there. There should be a separation line there. And this would be our server here. Okay, now that is more complicated to do, which is why we're not doing it here right now. Uh, but just keep in mind that what we're gonna be doing here isn't necessarily the most foolproof way to do things. There's just a few difficulties that can come up if we leave it this way. Okay, so we've seen how to load data from our server uh, with including the ID token, right? The auth token. And we've seen how to post data to our server with that ID token as well. The next thing we're gonna do is we're going to basically convert some of these other functions here. We don't need login and we don't need log out. So what we're gonna do here is open up our edit account page and we're going to add some logic for saving the changes. So this is basically just going to make a put request to our server. So all we're gonna do here is say const save changes, we'll call it equals async. And this is going to use Axios again. So we'll say const response equals Axios Oops, we need to do await axios.put. The URL here is going to involve the user's ID. 
So first of all, we'll need to actually get the user using our custom hook. So we'll say import use user from dot dot slash hooks slash use user. And we'll say const user, oops, that needs to be in curly braces there, equals use user. All right, and all we have to do here now is basically we'll say axios.put slash users slash user dot UID. The request body for this is going to include the user's updates. So we'll say updates and include the name and bio along with that. And we're also going to include the user's auth token as we have with the other ones. So for that, I'm just going to indent this stuff to make it a little more readable. There we go. Uh, for the headers, we're just gonna say headers and we'll say auth token. And then of course we need to get the tokens. So we'll say const token equals user dot get ID token. And that is asynchronous. So we'll need to say await user dot get ID token. Okay, so now we just need to pass this and Essentially, once this response is done, right, once we've gotten the updated user, uh, we're just gonna redirect the user back to the home page. So in order to do that, uh, we're just going to import our use history hook from React Router DOM so that we can navigate programmatically. We've seen this before, so don't worry about it if you haven't, uh, if you haven't used this before. So we're just gonna say const history equals use history and then to navigate the user back to the home page after this, uh, after the changes are saved, we're going to say history.push and send them back to the home page. Okay, so now down here, we're just going to make our save changes button actually uh, call that function. So we'll say on click equals save changes. And one other thing that we have to do is we actually have to load the initial data for this user before we allow them to edit it, right? We need to actually pre-populate these fields, right? These input fields with the user's current information. Now to do that, for now, I'm just going to copy and paste the logic directly from the home page because that's almost the exact same logic that we need. So I'm just gonna copy and paste the user info state and the use effect hook into edit account page. We'll see how to actually encapsulate this a little later on, but you know, for now it's just easiest to do this. And the only change we need to make inside this use effect hook now is we need to make sure we set the name and bio values once we've loaded this data. So uh, actually we don't even need user info. We're just gonna say set name to response.data.name and set bio to response.data.bio. All right, so let's give this page a try here. Oops, we need to actually import Axios and use effect here. Forgot to do that. We're gonna say use effect from React. And we're going to also import Axios by saying import Axios from Axios. Okay, and we have to do the same thing in use auth. We're just gonna say up here at the top, import Axios from Axios. All right, that got rid of all of our errors. So let's go check our edit account page and see if that's successfully loading all of our data. So we're gonna go to edit my account. And sure enough, we see that Sean Wassell and I like to program are both inside of there. Let's test the actual edit functionality here by saying uh, I like to program a lot. And if we click save changes, we should see that that navigates us back to the home page now with the updated data. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna have to implement here is the delete my account button. This one is going to make a request to the delete endpoint that we created earlier. So for that, we just need to open up our home page and add a little bit of logic here that will be hooked up to this delete my account button. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say const delete account. It's gonna be async and it's going to use Axios to make a delete request, so we'll say, uh, well, first of all, we're going to need to get the user's auth token. So we'll say const token equals wait user dot get ID token. There we go. And then we're going to say const response equals await axios dot delete. 
Okay, and the URL here is gonna be slash users slash, and then we're gonna insert the user's ID as we've seen. So user.uid. And we don't need a request body here, but we do need the same headers as before. So we'll just say headers auth token token. Okay, and that is our response. So uh, all we have to do after that really is just log the user out, right? After they've deleted their account, we're gonna wanna log them out. So what we'll do for that is we're just going to get our log out. Well, actually we already have log out from use auth, so that's convenient. We're just gonna say await log out and we should be good. Okay, and we actually don't even need this response. So we'll just say await axios.delete. And now we just need to make our delete button call that delete account function by saying on click equals delete account. And that should be all we need to do. So in order to test this thing, I'm actually not going to test it with this account because I wanna keep using this account for examples later on. So what we're gonna do is log out and test out creating an account, right? Remember that uh, this is something that we haven't tested yet either. So for the email, what I'm gonna do is say Sean, I believe I'm on Sean eight now at, and here instead of test.com, we'll say gmail.com. For the password, just gonna use the same one that I've used before. We'll re-enter it. And for the full name, I'm going to say Sean Wassell, short bio, I like food. And let's click create account and see if the create account flow works. So I'm gonna click on that. And sure enough, we should see that that takes us to the homepage and that our data has been successfully filled in by the server. All right. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna test deleting our account by clicking on delete my account. And sure enough, that's logged us out. Now, if we wanna actually test to see if the user's been deleted from the database, all we have to do is send a request to try and load that user. So let me just uh, open up server.js. We're just gonna send a request to this with that user's ID. Uh, and we can get that user's ID, by the way, by going into Firebase auth. There we go. We might have to refresh it to find your new user. There we go, Sean8, I'm gonna copy the user ID. And I'm gonna go to localhost 8080 slash users slash, and then I'm going to paste that UID. And we should see not found because it was deleted from the database. So that's what we are expecting to see. Anyway, it looks like all of our server endpoints are working correctly. And uh, it looks like all of our, you know, all of the corresponding bindings on the front end are working as well. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. The full stack application that we've been building with Firebase Auth so far has one very critical security vulnerability at this point, and that is that it doesn't actually make sure that the users who are requesting to load or modify or create data are who they say they are, right? Basically, it just kind of takes their word for it when they make that request. And that is not something you wanna do in a full stack application. So what we're gonna take a look at here today is how to use a package called Firebase Admin to basically ensure that users who are making requests are who they say they are. And we're gonna see how to use this to limit access to critical application data. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Okay, so to get started adding security to all of our server's endpoints, we're gonna need to start off by installing something called Firebase Admin. Now, Firebase Admin is basically a package that's a lot like the one we've been using for the front end, right? Just the regular Firebase package, except Firebase Admin, as the name would suggest, has admin level privileges. So in other words, since Firebase Admin is gonna be used on the server, right? and the code that we're gonna run on the server obviously isn't under the control of any of our users like front-end code is. Because of that, we can allow our server to do things that require a lot more privileges. Now, one of these things 
and this is gonna be by far the most important function that you'll learn in this section, one of these things that it allows us to do is actually verify the auth tokens that the front end is sending. So essentially, right, the front end generates the auth token usually by calling, you know, user.getID token as we saw, ID token. And it then sends that token to the server. Now, what we're gonna do in all of our server endpoints is basically take that token and verify it. And that will tell us two things. The first thing that'll tell us is, is this a valid token, right? Is the token valid? If it's not, then chances are someone's trying to tamper with our site, right? Someone's just trying to get at things they shouldn't. So, you know, that's the first thing it'll tell us is whether or not it's a valid token. The second thing it'll tell us is who actually sent the request, right? Because the Firebase token contains data about the user, when we validate it on the server, we'll actually be able to see the information about the user that sent the token. Now that will allow us to do things like make sure that users can only access their own information. So in other words, if user ABC, right, that's this user right here, if user ABC tries to send a request to the server uh, to fetch user, uh, let's see, user 123's information, the server's gonna see because of the auth token that it's user ABC trying to access user 123's information and it's going to not allow that to happen. So that's essentially what's gonna be going on here in our endpoints. And in order to actually get started with this, we're gonna to need to install the Firebase admin package into our server. So let's do that. We're gonna open up our backend. You're gonna to want to open up a terminal in the backend, which I have right here. And we're going to install the Firebase admin package by saying npm install firebase-admin. And we're gonna hit enter and that will install that package for us. Now, while that's installing, in order for the Firebase admin package to work correctly, we need to add some credentials to our server, right? In order for the Firebase admin package to do the dangerous things that it does, or that it has the capability of doing, we need to make sure that it has some secret credentials, right? Secret keys, which will let Firebase auth know that that's actually our server. So in order to get these credentials, what we're gonna need to do is go over to the Firebase console. And essentially what we're gonna do here is up in the top left-hand corner, you're gonna click on this little gear and go to users and permissions. And in order to generate our credentials, we're gonna go to service accounts. And when you see this little thing pop up here, we're gonna click on this button that says generate new private key. Now what that does, what this generate new private key thing does, is it'll download those credentials to our machine. And then we just have to basically copy and paste those into our backend directory. So once that's downloaded, I'm just going to copy and paste that from the downloads folder into the backend. I'm just doing that in another monitor here because it is very sensitive information, so I don't wanna risk recording it here. And once I've done that, let's go back to our backend and we should see this React Firebase auth blah, 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 dot JSON thing show up. I'm going to rename this to credentials just to make it easier to work with here. So credentials.json. And if you wanna open that up and take a look at it, I'm not gonna do that here because again, it's you know secret information. So you'll wanna be careful with this file. And speaking of which, let's actually add this to our git ignore so that we don't end up committing it by accident. We're just gonna say credentials.json. And you should see that. Uh, turn a darker shade of gray there, which means that it won't be committed with the rest of the files. That's very important that you do that. And in fact, GitHub will even uh, send you an email if you accidentally commit one of these, telling you that your credentials have been potentially compromised. All right, so now that we have those credentials, what we need to do is we need to modify our server.js file, and we need to have it set up Firebase admin and pass it those credentials. So what that's gonna look like is we're gonna say import all as admin from Firebase admin. That's the package we installed earlier. And then below that, we're gonna say import credentials from dot dot slash credentials dot JSON, 
right? That's our uh, credentials file that we just added to our project. And then all we need to do to set up Firebase admin with those credentials is say admin dot initialize app. And inside a configuration object here, we're just going to say credential admin dot credential dot cert. And we're going to pass those credentials uh, to it as an argument. Okay, and that's all we really need to do to get that set up. So what we should be able to do now is actually use this admin package to do things like verify users ID tokens. Now, remember that we're already uh, sending those tokens along with the requests we're making. For example, if we open up our home page, let's say, we can see that we're already getting the auth token and sending it along in the request headers. So what we need to do now is we need to modify each of these endpoints so that it will actually get that request header, right? It'll get the auth token out of the request header and use it to actually make sure that the user who's trying to access this, uh, this user's information is that user. Now, the way that we're going to do that, and I'm just going to start off with the uh, get endpoint here. The way that we're going to do that is by saying const auth token equals request.headers. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use the admin package to verify that this is a good auth token, right? Making sure that it hasn't been tampered with, essentially. So to do that, we're going to say await admin.auth.verify ID token. And we just need to pass the auth token to that as an argument. Okay, and basically what this will do, as I said, is make sure that this auth token is valid. If it's not, it will throw an error. So generally what we want to do is put this inside a try catch block. And if it fails, we send back a status code indicating that the auth token wasn't valid. So the status code that we usually use for that is 401. So in that case, we would just say return response dot send status. 401. And that would be all we need to do. So the other thing that I mentioned, right, the first responsibility of this verify ID token is to, as the name would suggest, verify the ID token. But what it actually does for us is it gets the corresponding user for that auth token. And we can get that by saying const, uh, we'll just say auth user to distinguish it from the user that we're getting down here, right, the user's info that we're getting down here. And then once we have this auth user, the next thing that we need to do is make sure that that user is the user whose ID is up here in this URL. So the way we're going to do that is once we've gotten the auth user, we're going to say if auth user dot UID is not equal to the user ID up in the request parameters. Okay, and actually we need to put this stuff up above there. There we go. If that's not the case, then we want to send back a status code telling the user that they're not allowed to access that resource. Now, the status code for this is generally 403, so we'll just say return response.send status 403. And that's all we really need to do there. Everything else should work just as before, right? We still want to send back a 404 if that resource doesn't exist. And we want to send back the user if everything goes. So that's the basic process for verifying an ID token inside an endpoint. So what we're going to do next is we're going to actually run this thing and show that it does its job. So let's run our application here now by saying npm run start or npm run dev rather npm run dev. And oops, it looks like we made a mistake here. Ah, we need to add async since we added await to our admin.auth.verifyID token function. And sure enough, we should see server is listening on port 8080. So first of all, let's make sure that our front end uh, is still able to load data as before, since under normal circumstances, everything should still work just like it did before. So let's log in as sean at uh, gmail.com, abc123, log in. And sure enough, we see that we're able to load data successfully from the server as this user. Now, on the other hand, let's say that we were to try and load a different user, you know, just from the browser URL like this. Well, what we'll see is going to happen 
Okay, let's, uh, let's actually get the same user that we just loaded here. So we're gonna try and load this user's ID from outside our app. If we hit enter here, we'll see that we get this 403 unauthorized code. Okay, I believe it's a 403. You can actually see the exact status code here if you go into uh, network, and you may need to hit refresh here. Ah, here we wanna go to all. Ah, it's a 401 here because we didn't include any kind of auth token in the header, right? Because we're just typing it into a browser. Now, if you wanna test this using something like Postman and actually try including a, uh, you know, a different auth token for a different user, feel free to do that, but I'm just gonna leave it the way it is. So anyway, those are the basics of making sure that users can only access their own data using ID tokens. And again, I just wanna really re-emphasize the importance of what we've learned how to do here. Basically, without the stuff that we just did, most modern websites wouldn't be able to function correctly, right? They wouldn't be remotely secure. So with what we've seen here, we're able to make sure that users are only able to access and modify their own data. And this has some pretty big implications and applications for sites that require levels of security, right? In most sites, generally speaking, you'll want to make sure that users can only access their own data. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so we've seen how to add token verification to our get endpoint. So the next question is how do we add that same level of verification to our other endpoints, such as the endpoint for creating users, for editing users, for deleting users, etc. Well, I'm actually gonna start off with updating users because the endpoint for creating users is gonna be a little bit different than what we've seen. So let's change this put endpoint so that it actually verifies that the user that's trying to edit this information is the user who owns the information, essentially. So the first thing that we're gonna need to do, remember that on the front end, we're already sending along the auth token appropriately, so we don't need to worry about that. But what we do need to do is get that auth token from the request headers. So we can just say const auth token equals request.headers. And then just like we've done before, we need to actually verify that auth token. And to do that, we use the same Firebase admin function as before. And we're going to wrap this in a try catch block here too. We're gonna to say const auth user equals await admin dot auth dot verify ID token. And we're gonna pass that auth token as an argument to this. And remember that that will return the user that that auth token belongs to. And just while I'm thinking about it, let's add async to this function here. Okay, so now that we have the auth user from the token, the next thing we're gonna do is make sure that that auth user's ID matches the user ID uh, that we're getting from the request parameters. So what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say if auth user dot UID does not equal user ID, in that case, just like we saw before, we're gonna say response dot send status 403, and we'll want to actually return here to make sure that it doesn't continue executing. I think we did that above. Yes, return response dot send status. And we're also going to catch an error that will happen if uh, something goes wrong while verifying the ID token. So we're gonna say catch E, and for this we'll say return response dot send status 401. Otherwise, if neither of these status statements is executed, basically that means that the token is legit and it really is the user who's trying to edit their own information. So essentially we just wanna leave the rest of this information for now and we should be good. So now that we've done the update endpoint, let's also do the delete endpoint while we're at it, I suppose. That's going to be exactly the same as what we've seen up here. So if you want, we can just copy and paste this try catch block into our endpoint here. And a little later on, I'll show you a, a better way to duplicate this logic without having to copy and paste. Okay, and we also just need to get the auth token from the headers. So 
const auth token equals request.headers. And everything else should be roughly the same here. It's all looking good. Okay, so let's test out both the put and delete endpoints with their new protective logic. Uh, first of all, let's make sure that everything, ah, I forgot an async keyword again. Let's add that to delete. And this one has it, right? Yep, it looks like we're all good there. So let's open this up again, make sure that we don't have any syntax errors. It looks like we're good. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try both updating a user and deleting a user. Now, since I don't wanna delete the user that I'm using for testing here, I'm actually going to log out and create a new user. And we haven't actually added protection to this route yet, so uh, let's just behave ourselves. What we're gonna do is say, Sean, uh, we'll do Sean9 at gmail.com, enter a password, re-enter a password, enter my full name, and enter a bio. Hello, this is a test, that's fine. And let's click on create account now, and we should see something that looks like this. So the next thing we're gonna do, let's try and edit this account by, you know, just uh, making a few changes. We'll say, hello, this is a test. We'll just say, hello, I'm the real user. Click on save changes, and we should see that that updates correctly. And in order to test out trying to edit an account as a different user, what we'll actually have to do is open up Postman. Okay, so I'm gonna bring that over here. And what we're gonna do is try sending a put request to that user's ID. Okay, so we're gonna copy this, replace this ID here with that. And as the body, what we're gonna do is add some updates. So we'll say updates. Those updates are gonna be name. We'll say something like hacked. This isn't actually gonna work, by the way. And um, we're going to specify a bio here that says you got hacked. Okay, so let's try sending this thing to this endpoint. If we click send, what we're gonna see is this unauthorized message. Now, if you want to include that header, if you want to include a different uh, auth token header, what you can do is say auth token, and for the value, right, you could try including the auth token of a different user if you want, right? All you need to do is log in as a different user and take a look at the requests that are being sent in the network tab and just copy and paste that here. But what you'll see uh, is if we click on send here, well, actually we'll get 401 because this isn't a valid ID token. You know what? Let me just get the ID token of a different user here. What I'm gonna do is click log out. We're gonna log in as regularshawn at gmail.com. We're gonna click log in and let's try and get the auth token from our uh, network tab here. So let's try and refresh this, I suppose. So we're looking for the request where we actually load the user's data and we should be able to see the headers if we look for um, auth token. We're gonna wanna copy and paste this giant auth token here. Will it let me do that? Yep, copy value. You might have to right click and do copy value because it has some weird highlighting preferences here. So what I'm gonna do now is paste this into our value here and click send. And we'll see a different status code that we get back now, which is forbidden instead of the other status code. So in other words, this is a valid token that we're sending along here, but it doesn't belong to the user whose information we're trying to edit. Okay, and if you wanna see what it looks like uh, just sending along the correct auth token, what we're gonna do is log out and log back in as sean9 at gmail.com, abc123, log in. And then if we open up the inspector window again and go to network and refresh the page, what we're gonna be looking for is the auth token header in here again. So we'll find that here, we'll copy the value, and we're going to replace this value here with that. And I believe that should be it. Here, let me just make sure that I emptied that completely. We'll paste it again. And if we click send now, we'll see that everything worked, right? and hacked and you got hacked are now the name and bio. So in other words, right, the moral of this story is if someone gets a hold of a user's auth token, then that user is 
pretty much screwed because that person with their auth token can basically do whatever they want with their profile. So if we were to go back here and refresh it now, we'll see, uh-oh, this user has been hacked. So anyway, that's how we add protection to the delete and update endpoints. Uh, and actually, let's just test the delete endpoint here. We're going to click on delete my account. And sure enough, everything should be working for that. If we try and click send again, we'll see not found for that user's information. Okay, well, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've seen how to verify ID tokens in the update and delete endpoints, the next question is, how do we actually convert over our create endpoint to do the same thing? Well, our create endpoint is going to be a little bit different here, right? The process for doing this is gonna be a little bit different. And in order to understand why, let's open up the code on the front end that's actually gonna be making the request here. Okay, that's going to be inside our create account page. Uh, actually, our create account page uses the use auth hook, so that's where this is going to be. Let's open that up. And what we're going to see is that our front end is creating a user with email and password on Firebase auth. It's getting the result, and then it's actually getting the token and the ID here and sending that to the server. Now, one thing I just realized here is that this should be await result.user.getID token. I must have forgotten that earlier. But essentially, because of the way our server can verify ID tokens and get the corresponding user for them from Firebase, we actually don't need to specify the result.user.id thing here, right? We can get that inside the server endpoint itself without the client side trying to send that along. So we're going to remove that here because we don't need it. And really, all we need to do, we're still going to need this token here because we want to send that with the headers. But basically what we can do now is if we open up our create endpoint, we're not going to be getting the ID from the request body anymore, as I said. What we're going to be doing is getting the auth token from the headers. Okay, this part is like what we've seen before. Const auth token equals request.headers. And then we're going to use the verify ID token function to get the corresponding user. Again, this is pretty much what we've seen before up until this point. We're going to say try. We'll say const auth user equals admin dot auth dot verify ID token auth token. Oops, and that should be a wait here. We'll say await admin dot auth dot verify ID token. We're going to have to change this to async. And once we have this auth user, that's when we're going to try and create this new user. So essentially, we're going to move this line here where we actually create the user into the try catch block. And instead of allowing the client side to just specify any ID they want, we're gonna specifically use the ID of the auth user that we got from Firebase. Okay, so this will ensure that the user's ID in our fake little database up here, that'll make sure that that lines up perfectly with the actual ID that we're using in Firebase, right? So that'll make sure that a user or a hacker can't fudge that ID property. Okay, and inside here, we're going to put the response.send status now, and we're going to say catch error. In the case that there's an error verifying the ID token, all we're going to do is say response.send status 401. And that will basically tell the client side, hey, you've got to include an ID token if you want to be able to do that. So this should work just like before. Let's take a look at our app and see if everything is good. We're going to go to our create account page. And for the email, I'm going to enter in Sean 10 at gmail.com. For the password, I'm going to say ABC123. Same thing here. Full name. Oops. I wanted to say W there. And for short bio, I'll just say hello. And we'll say create account. And what you'll see here is a very strange error that it actually took me a little while to figure out. So I thought I'd share it with you. Basically, we see that we're not getting the name and bio. However, if we refresh this page now, we'll see that the name and bio decide to turn up. 
right? The reason that our name and bio don't show up right after we click create account is because we've created a sort of race condition of sorts in our code. Let me show you this by going to our use auth hook. So what's happening here is when we call this create user with email and password function, this actually logs the user in immediately. And remember that when the user logs in, we also immediately redirect the user uh, away from the create account page. So what's happening is this function is being called, the user is going to the home page, and the home page starts trying to load data from the server here before this line of code has had a chance to be called. Right, so in other words, at the point in time when our homepage is trying to load this user's data from the server, that data hasn't actually been created yet because this post function, right, axios.post, this hasn't been called yet, or if it has been called, it's still in the process of completing. So the server basically returns nothing to the homepage saying, yeah, I don't know, that's not a user. So what we need to do here is Basically, we need to make it so that our server is the one that ends up creating our user with the email and password instead of our front end. Now, this is generally considered a good practice anyway, right, to have the server be the one that does it. So what I'm going to do is we're going to open up server.js and we're going to take a slightly different approach to what we've seen before. So first of all, in addition to the user info, we're also going to have the client side include the email and password for the user in the request body. So in use auth here, uh, we're gonna basically remove this create user with email and password function here. We're gonna remove token, right? So we won't be sending an auth token along with our headers yet. And we're going to be including the email and password in the post request body. So we'll say email and password and we don't need auth here either. So you might be wondering now, how does the user's account actually get created? Well, basically in the server, we now have to use a Firebase admin function called create user to create a user with that specified email, password, etc. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove this auth user thing since we don't need that anymore, right? We're not verifying tokens or anything. And instead, what we're gonna do is say const new user equals, and here we'll actually say auth user, I guess for that, equals await admin.auth.createUser. Okay, and basically what we do is we pass an object to this create user function now that will take the email. Okay, so we're passing in the email. It'll take their password, so we'll pass that in as well. And that's pretty much all we need for now. So that's going to generate that new user for us and return it here. So we should still be able to use this UID that Firebase auth adds to it. Okay, and that's about it. Uh, we also don't need this auth token up here, so we can delete that. And let's give this a try now. What we're gonna do is go back to our use auth hook. And one last thing that we're gonna have to do is after the user is created in Firebase auth, right? After this request completes, we're gonna have to log the user in because when we called create user with uh, email and password on the client side, remember that that automatically logged the user in, but calling it on the server side, right? This create user thing doesn't actually do that. So all we're gonna have to do is just use the login function and call that with the email and password that the user provided. So we'll say email password. I believe that's all we needed for that one. Yep, just email password. And we'll also wanna say await login for that. And that should be all we need to do. So let's give this thing a try. What we're gonna do is we're going to log out of sean10 at gmail.com. We're going to try creating an account now with sean11 at gmail.com. Same password as usual. Full name. Oops, let's try that again. There we go. And hello for the bio. We're gonna click create account now. And sure enough, after a second or two, we should be redirected to our homepage where we see that our name and bio are now correctly displayed. Now, one other thing is that with deleting accounts, right, now that we've used the create account function with Firebase auth, with deleting accounts, 
you may have noticed that even though we're deleting the user's data from our database, we're not actually deleting the account from Firebase. Now, if you wanna add that functionality into here as well, what you can do is use Firebase admins delete user function. Okay, so what we're gonna do with that is underneath where we delete the user from our database, we're gonna say await admin.auth.delete user user ID. And that will take care of deleting that specified user from Firebase auth. So let's give that one a try. What we're gonna do is delete our Sean11 at gmail.com by clicking delete account. Ah, and we're actually going to have to recreate this account because our server restarted. And since we're not using MongoDB, we actually, uh, when we restart our server, that gets rid of the data that we created. So let's try this again. We're gonna say log out. We're gonna create another account. We're up to Sean12 now, so we'll say Sean12 at gmail.com, regular password, full name, and short bio, blah, blah, blah. So let's create our account now. Make sure you don't restart your server now and click delete my account. And that should basically delete all that information and log you out. And furthermore, if you go back to your Firebase console now, you should not see Sean 12, right? We created it and then we just deleted it. Great, so now our create account functionality and our delete account functionality are working just like we want them to. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so at this point, we've successfully protected all of our server's routes using Firebase Admin, and we've made sure that users can only access and modify information that they own. Now, there's still one problem with our server, and it's something that you probably picked up on as we were typing this out, and that is that our code is extremely repetitive. So if you take a look at what we're doing here, right, where we're getting the auth token, we're basically verifying the auth token inside this try catch block and we're sending back certain status codes depending on the result of that. And then, you know, if we scroll down to our update and delete endpoints, you can see that the code here is exactly the same thing. Now you might be wondering, is there a way that we can avoid this repetition by, you know, encapsulating this logic somehow? And the answer to that, I'm happy to say is yes. So, Essentially what we're gonna do here is add something called express middleware. Middleware are basically functions that get called for several different endpoints, right? So in other words, uh, right now we have our server here and we have our endpoints here, we'll just say. And incoming requests get handled by our server and they get passed directly to each of the endpoints depending on the URL. All right, so what middleware basically allows us to do is define extra nodes in between the basic server and our endpoints that allow us to do things like data processing. So what that ends up looking like instead is we have our server here and we can have middleware here in between our server and our endpoints. And then we have our endpoints out here and we're able to define which endpoints certain middleware applies to, right? So we might have just one for this one, and this might go straight to this endpoint. So we're able to kind of create these chains of processing, if you will, with express middleware. So let me show you what this is gonna look like. Essentially, whenever we wanna add middleware to an express server, all we have to do is just use the app.use function that's provided to us by our express server. And just to give you an example here, I'm gonna say app.use. And basically what we do is we pass a single callback to this function, which takes the request and response uh, arguments the same as any other express endpoint. And additionally, it takes an argument called next, which is basically a function that this callback can call to tell Express that it's ready to go on to whatever the next middleware is, or it's ready to pass off control to the route handler. So you'll see what I mean in just a second here, but essentially what we can do 
if we were to say console.log and say something like received a request inside here and then call next, what would happen is basically any time our server received a request, we would see this received a request thing logged out to the console, right? And then the rest of our server would behave exactly like it has before. Just to show you what this might look like, right? We're just gonna open up our server terminal. We're gonna try logging in here just so we can load some data. I'm just gonna log in as sean at gmail.com. Click log in. And what we'll see is that as we load that data, we see that it says received a request. If we refresh this again, we'll see that logged out to the console again. If we do something like edit our account data and click save changes, we'll see that we got two requests, right? One, or actually three now, one from when we actually went to the edit account page and loaded that data, one for when we clicked save changes and made that request to the server, and one from when we went back to the home page and reloaded that data. Okay, so that's the basics of how middleware works, and I mention it in a course about Firebase Auth because middleware is the key to reducing unnecessary repetition when it comes to authentication. So essentially, all of this repeated code that we've been using in our endpoints, all this try, catch, blah, 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 we can actually create an endpoint that will take care of that for us. So essentially what we're gonna do is we're just gonna delete this code that we have here now, and we're gonna put the shared code, right, all the code that's shared by our server endpoints into this express middleware function that we're creating. Now that's going to be auth token. We're gonna to use that one in all of our endpoints. We're gonna use the try catch block in all of our endpoints, so I'll paste that here. Oops, there we go. And once we have that inside our middleware, all we have to do is call next. And that will basically perform all of these checks for us. And, you know, it'll take care of sending back an error status code if something's wrong. And once it's done that, it will turn over control to whatever endpoint the user is actually making a request to. Okay, and now that we've done all that, all we need to do is go through all of our endpoints and remove that try catch logic. So I'm just gonna remove this same thing here. Oh, and actually the create user endpoint is going to be a little different. So we'll wanna leave that try catch block in there. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, for our update function, we're gonna want to delete this as well since that's exactly the same. And for our delete endpoint, we're gonna do that as well. So we'll delete that like that. Okay, and we can also get rid of this auth token thing in both of these. And now let's go back up to our create endpoint. Basically, this one doesn't need the middleware, and in fact, the middleware will block it from happening. So in cases like these, where we only want middleware to apply to a subset of our endpoints, there's a few things we can do. One thing would be to just take this route and put it above where we defined the middleware, right? That would be fine. The other thing is that we can actually define the exact routes that we want our middleware to apply to. So what we can do for that, we can say app.use, and since all of the routes that we want this middleware to apply to have basically the same uh, URL, which is slash users slash uh, user ID, all we need to do is add that there, and that means that when this create endpoint is called, basically the middleware won't be applied to it. Ah, and I was just checking my terminal here. It looks like we forgot an async somewhere. What we're gonna do is, uh, yes, we just need to add it to our middleware function. And it looks like I just need to restart my server in general. That can happen sometimes with no daemon. And one more thing that we have to do here is uh, up in our app.use middleware, we need to actually get this user ID uh, because right now it would be undefined. So all we're gonna do is say const, user ID equals request.params. So let's go back here now and test out our app by refreshing it. And we should see that we have the same Sean Wassell and I like to program. If we try editing it, those changes should be reflected. And I'm not gonna try deleting it now, but feel free to try deleting and creating an account on your own. Now, one more thing that we can use middleware for on our server currently is this 404 status code. Basically, just like we were doing up at the top, 
we're doing pretty much the same thing for most of our server endpoints, right? For our get endpoint, for our put endpoint, we're doing that. For our delete endpoint, we're doing that. Basically, all we want to do is send back a 404 status code if there's not currently a user with that ID in our database. So what we can do for that, we can either add that logic to our existing Express middleware, or we can create a new middleware. I'm just going to create a new one here. For that, we're going to use the same URL as we did up here. We're going to say slash users slash user ID. We're going to say async request response and next. And inside here, we're just going to try and get the user with that ID from our database. So we'll say const user ID equals request.params. We're going to see if there's a user with that ID by saying const user equals users user ID. And then we're just going to say if the user doesn't exist, we want to say return response.send status 404. All right, so that'll just protect all of our endpoints in the case of 404s, and that will allow us to remove this uh, 404 send status thing from all of our endpoints. So we no longer need to check for a user since we know it exists. And in fact, what you can do in order to avoid duplicating this logic here is you can just say else, and you can say request.user equals user, right? Basically, uh, Express allows us to set properties on this request object that can then be accessed down in our endpoints. So we're going to want to call next after that as well. And what we can do now is we don't even have to get the user ID or the user. We can just say response.json request.user. We'll skip our create endpoint here because that one doesn't play by the same rules. Down here in our app.put, what we're going to do, we're still going to get the request body, but we don't need the user ID and we don't need the user. And we also don't need to check if the user exists because we know they already do. Going to adjust the indentation here. Oh, and we actually are going to keep the user ID thing up at the top. So let's, uh, we don't need this user thing here though. We don't need this if statement. We don't need this else statement. And then we just need to change this spread operator to request.user. And everything else should be the same. So last but not least, let's do our delete endpoint. We're going to remove this if statement here and the else statement. Just going to adjust the indentation there. And we don't need this user here either. We're just going to say response.json request.user. And that should be all we need to do. So let's just make sure we didn't mess up any of the syntax. It looks like our server is running correctly. And if you want to go through and check each of those endpoints, feel free to do so. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. At the point in time when most developers realize they want to add user auth to an application, they've already built out a lot of the application's features. Now, in situations like this, it's important that developers have a good strategy for how to add user auth to an existing React app. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at here today. You see, the friend tracker application that we've been building throughout multiple videos has basically everything except user authentication at this point. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how to add some basic user auth to an application. And this will involve doing things like creating a login page and making sure that users can only access a certain subset of pages. And the process for this is going to be a little bit different than what we've seen when building an app from scratch using user auth. So with that said, let's jump right in and see what everything is going to look like.
Okay, so the first step here in converting over our full stack friend tracker application to use Firebase Auth is to add some of the key components to our application that are required in pretty much every user authenticated application. So the main components that I'm talking about here are going to be our login page, which we're going to need to create here. Okay, that'll just take the user's email and password and allow them to log in. And we're also going to create a create account page. Now the create account page for this is going to be a little bit more complex than what we've seen earlier. Because basically, in addition to getting the user's email, password, and confirm password, we're also going to need to collect things like their name, their age, their bio, their interests, etc. And basically, we're going to need to add that to the request that we end up sending to the server when the user wants to create their account. So let's get started building those two pages. And we could start off by copying and pasting these from the example application that we did previously. But since there are going to be a few key differences between them, mostly differences that have to do with things like styling, we're just going to write them from scratch. And this will also give us a little bit more experience working with this sort of component. So to get started here, let's create two more pages inside our pages folder. We're going to say new file. And we're going to say login page. And we're going to create a create account page as well. And just as a side note here, if you're following along with your IDE, you're probably going to want to check out a new branch in your directory down here, right? Just to make sure that any changes that you make uh, when you're adding Firebase auth, to make sure that you can undo those if you want to see how to add some kind of other auth provider later on. Okay, so I'd recommend checking out a new branch in Git to make sure that those changes are isolated. Okay, so let's start off with our login page here. This one's going to be pretty straightforward. What we're going to do is we're going to start off here by importing uh, the use state hook from React. Okay, we'll be using that to keep track of the values inside the inputs on this page. We're also going to import the link component from React Router DOM. Okay, we'll be using that to basically link our login page to our create account page. And we'll be doing the same thing in reverse on the create account page. And those are the two main things for now. Chances are we'll be importing a few other things a little later on. So let's create our component now. We're gonna say export const login page equals, and it's not gonna take any props. What it's gonna do is we're just gonna create two new state variables for the email and password. So const email set email equals use state and const password set password equals use state. And of course the starting value for both of those is an empty string. So the next thing that we're going to do here is define the JSX for our component. So we'll say return and we're going to put all of this inside a react fragment. The top of this page will say something like login. Okay, and you can either do that as one word like that or two words like that. And underneath this, we're going to have our email and password inputs. So let's create those. We're going to say input. The type of this first one is going to be email. The placeholder for this, uh, we'll just put in a fake email or something like that. We'll say John Doe at gmail.com just to show the user what that's supposed to look like. And then we'll say class name equals full width and space below. This will basically make sure that this input is 100% of its container wide and that it also leaves a little bit of space below so that uh, it's not right on top of the element that comes below it. Okay, and we're going to have to add classes for those to our index.css file. So we'll go into here. We're just going to add full width. So we'll say dot full width. We're going to say width 100%. And then we're going to create another class called space below, which will have a margin bottom of, uh, we'll just do something like eight picks. And one last thing here is that for our inputs and text areas, we're going to want to uh, basically set the box sizing of these. 
to border box so that they'll work correctly with the full width class here. So don't worry too much about that if you haven't had experience with this yet. We're just gonna say box sizing border box and that'll just make it the correct width. Okay, so going back to our login page now that we've added those styles, uh, let's add another input below this one, which will be the password input. So we'll say input type equals password, placeholder equals, and we'll just do something like enter your password. Okay, and below that, we'll give it the same class names. We'll say full width and space below, and that should make it look nice. Okay, so we'll just close that tag. And then underneath it, we're going to have a button that says log in. So we'll say button. For now, we're just going to give it the text log in. And the button is going to have the same classes as we saw above with our input. We're going to say class name equals full width and space below. And finally, the last thing that we're going to put on this page is a link to the create account page in case the user doesn't have an account already. And that's going to look like this. We're going to say link to create account. And inside here, we'll say something like create an account here. Okay, so that's our login page. Let's just bind these two inputs now to our state variables. As you're probably already familiar with how to do this, so we're just gonna say value equals email, on change equals e, set email, e.target.value. And we're gonna do the same thing for our password input here, except with the password state variable. So we'll just say value equals password and set password e.target.value and that should be it for our login page so let's take a look at what this page actually looks like in the context of our application and before we do that what we're going to do is we're actually going to uh, copy and paste some of the code from the secret routes that we created earlier and by secret routes i mean the components that we created to keep authenticated users from accessing the login and create account pages and the component that we created for making sure only authenticated users could access, uh, you know, restricted pages. So those were the auth route and unauthed route components. So what I'm going to do is inside the source folder here, I'm actually going to create a new folder, which I'll call auth. This will basically just contain the auth related uh, components and logic in our application. And inside here, we're going to create two new files. One is going to be authrout.js, and the other is going to be unauthrout.js. And what I'm going to do is just copy and paste the code over from uh, when we implemented these routes earlier, right? When we were first taking a look at uh, Firebase Auth and how to make uh, restricted routes. So that code's going to look like this for authrout. I'm just going to copy and paste it. So you should do the same thing here, either copying and pasting the code from the GitHub repo, or you know if you followed along and wrote this code previously, uh, you can get it from there as well. So the unauthed route, we're gonna do the same thing. We're just gonna say copy paste and put it in this unauthed route here. Okay, so we've created those two routes, so let's actually display our login page inside our app component now. What we're gonna do is basically import both of those route components up at the top here by saying import auth route from auth slash auth route. And same thing for unauth route, we're gonna say unauth route from auth slash unauth route. Okay, and basically we're gonna want to display the login page inside an unauth route because we only want unauthenticated users to be able to access it. So let's go down here, and I suppose we'll just put it down at the bottom for now. We'll say unauthed route. And inside here, we're just gonna specify the path, which will be slash login. And then what we'll do is put our login page inside of here, which we'll need to import also. My IDE just did that for me automatically. And that should be all we need to do in our app component. Uh, but while we're at it, why don't we convert the rest of these route components to the appropriate routes? Now, all of these, in fact, are going to be uh, auth routes. So what you can do if you want to is just do a find and replace and you'll want to find route with this little triangle bracket before it to make sure that you're only getting the components that are called just plain route. And we're going to replace those with auth route. OK, 
Okay, so one, two, three, four, five. That should be all we need there. And we're gonna have to do the same thing with the closing tags. So we'll say slash route, slash auth route, and we'll do the same thing there. Okay, so before this will actually work, you may have noticed that if you open up the auth route and unauth route again, they're relying on this use user custom hook that we created earlier when we were first talking about Firebase auth. Now, when we built this hook, I mentioned that one of the big benefits of it is that it allows all of our components to share, uh, you know, the Firebase user and to subscribe to changes in the user's logged in state. But there are other ways to do that. So in order to avoid having to recreate this component from scratch or copy and paste it, what we're actually going to do is create a context that will handle the Firebase user for us. Now, we'll get to that a little later, but for now, what we're going to do, since we haven't yet added Firebase to this front-end application, is we're just going to say const is loading equals false and const user equals, uh, we'll say null. Okay, so that'll just make sure that this route actually displays its contents like normal. Now, for the auth route, what we're going to do is we're just going to do the same thing so that it will automatically redirect back to the login page. Uh, so instead of having this custom hook here, we're going to say const is loading equals false and const user equals null. So again, it will automatically redirect back to the login page. So the only thing that we'll be able to look at currently is the login page. Okay, so let's remove also our imports for use user because that hook doesn't exist. Let's run our application and see what our login page looks like. We're going to say npm run start and hit enter. And that'll open up our application here. And oops, it looks like we have an error here from Axios. So let's go back to our favorites provider. Oops, favorites provider component is what I want. Ah, you know what? I think that the problem is that I just need to run npm install because I was working on another branch that didn't have Axios on it. And when I checked out this branch, basically you have to refresh node modules since node modules aren't committed to GitHub by default. Don't worry if that didn't make sense to you, but uh, that should have fixed that error for me. So we'll say npm run start. And let's see if it works now. Okay, and sure enough, we see this login page here. Everything is looking good so far. Uh, this thing takes us to the create account page, which doesn't yet exist. And yeah, everything is looking good so far. So anyway, what we've done here is created the basic login page with styling that makes it look fairly good in this app, I think. And we've also seen how to basically bring those two route components from before, the auth route and unauth route, into our front-end application. So, so far, right, if we try and distill down some basic concepts from what we've done so far, when we're converting over an application to have user authentication, the first things that we're going to have to do are one, create a, a login and create account page. Okay, so we'll just say create account pages. And two, we'll need to create restricted routes. Okay, these are two things that pretty much every user authenticated application has to have. So, you know, it makes sense to add those right up front. Okay, so I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've created our login page and we've converted over our app component to use the auth and unauth route components that we created earlier, the next thing we're going to do is see how to add Firebase auth to our application by creating a special provider component, right? Basically, what we're going to do is just like we created a favorites provider and a friends provider earlier in our friend tracker application, right? And remember that these providers basically make the favorites state. Right, just an array of IDs of the user's favorites. And it makes the friends in the application, right, which are just a bunch of JSON objects. Just like these two provider components make those things available to everything inside of them, we're going to create a provider component for the Firebase auth user state.
So essentially, just like how earlier we created a use user hook that basically allowed components to uh, you know, easily access the current user state from Firebase auth, instead of doing that, we're going to basically create a user provider Okay, and then inside here, we're gonna have our components actually access that using context. So they'll be using the use context hook inside of there with a special user state context that we'll define. So that's our basic plan of attack. Let's see how to do that and actually make all of these routes work correctly without having to, you know, basically stub out the logic as we've done. All right, the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to create a new context inside our contexts folder, right? Remember that this is where we created the favorites context and friends context, both of which were pretty simple to do. So we're gonna say new file and we're going to call this one user context.js. Okay, now what this context is gonna do, it's gonna be almost identical to these other contexts. So I'm just going to copy and paste, whoops, just going to copy and paste the friends context into here and rename it. So we'll say export const user context equals create context null. Oops, that should be user. Okay, and then we're gonna create a provider for that context that will basically encapsulate all of the logic uh, that's involved with logging in, with listening for changes and so on and so forth. So uh, inside the components folder now, we're gonna create a new component for our user context and we'll call that user provider.js. All right, so what this is gonna look like is we're gonna start off by saying import use state from React. Okay, we're gonna be using that use state hook to basically keep track of our user and whether or not the user is loading. And we're also going to import our user context, which we defined from dot dot slash contexts slash user context. All right, and our component is gonna look like this. It's gonna be, uh, we're gonna say export const user provider equals, and inside here we'll say children, right? This is going to be all of the components inside of our user providers tags, just like we did with our other providers. And then we're gonna say const is loading and set is loading equals use state true and const user and set user equals use state, and that's going to be null initially. Okay, and for the JSX for this component, it's gonna be pretty simple at first. Uh, what we're gonna do is just say return. We're gonna say user context dot provider. The value for this provider is just going to pass through is loading and user, uh, pretty similar to what we did with the custom hooks earlier. And inside here, we're just going to display all of this uh, component's children. All right, now granted, this doesn't yet have any logic for loading uh, the Firebase user or for logging in or anything, but that'll come later. What we're gonna do first is we're gonna open up our app component. Okay, I'll just open up app.js. We're gonna import our user provider. Um, and just while we're at it, let's delete this route import that we don't need anymore. Okay, so we'll go down here. We're gonna say import user provider from components user provider. And then we're basically just going to add this user provider as a further wrapper around our favorites and friends providers. And we do wanna have it on the outside because as you'll see later on, our friends provider and our favorites provider are gonna need access to the user, right? This will allow them to do things like load favorites using a user's ID token, which is something that we're gonna need to add to our server's endpoints later on is user validation, right? Making sure that uh, the user who's requesting information, right? Or the user who's trying to you know, add new friends is actually the user that that data belongs to. Okay, so for that reason, we're going to basically put the user provider on the outside. And in fact, right, our nav bar may well have need of the user provider as well, because we might wanna do something like display the email of the currently logged in user, or you know, change the buttons on the nav bar depending on whether the user is logged in or not. So we're actually going to wrap this whole entire application inside our user provider. 
Okay, so I'm just going to have those two components there. We're gonna take everything and copy and paste it inside those provider tags, and I'm just going to adjust the indentation there. And that should be all we need to do for now. So the next thing that we're gonna do, now that we have this user provider component created, is we're gonna add Firebase Auth to our application. Now we walked through this earlier, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail on how it works, but we are gonna need to go into the Firebase console and create a new application and create a new project representing our React project here. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is open up the Firebase console and you're gonna to want to click on this add project button here. And let's call this one friend tracker. And, and you may have noticed that I had another project called friend tracker key already. Uh, that's just the one that I was using for development while I was creating these videos. So um, let's create a new project called friend tracker. You'll see the unique ID of our new project come up here. That's the ID that Firebase uses to uniquely identify our project, and it's something that we can't change later. So make sure that that's something that you like uh, before creating your project. And we're gonna click continue. We're gonna turn off Google Analytics because we don't need those yet. And this thing should spin saying, creating your project, please wait. Now, while that's going, let's actually install the Firebase package into our front end. And what we're gonna do for that is we just need to say npm install Firebase and hit enter. And that should install the Firebase front end package for us. Okay, so let's go back here and we should see that our project is ready in the Firebase console. So let's click on continue. And the next thing we're gonna do is add an app, right? Remember that basically once we've created a project, we need to also add an app, which just represents an individual platform that our project can be accessed on. So we're gonna click on this web icon here. We're gonna add an app, which we'll call React Frontend. We're gonna leave this checkbox unchecked and click on register app. And once that's done, we're gonna see all of this code here. We just need to copy and paste that into the React entry point for our front end. So let's find index.js. And actually, instead of putting this code inside here, what I sometimes like to do is basically just create a utility function that will encapsulate all of that for us, right? That, that kind of helps keep Firebase logic outside the main portions of our code. So what I'm gonna do here is inside auth, I'm gonna say new file, and we're gonna create a new file called setup firebase.js. And this is what's going to contain all of that logic that we just copied. Oops, I need to go copy it again because I accidentally pressed Control C. Okay, so there we go. I'm gonna delete these comments because they're just kind of messy looking. And what we're gonna do is create a new function here, which we'll be exporting, which we'll call uh, setup Firebase. So let's just say const setup Firebase equals we're gonna put this thing inside of there and we don't actually need const app. So we can just say initialize app and we'll just export this setup Firebase thing as the default export by saying export default setup Firebase. And then all we have to do inside our index.js file now is say import setup Firebase from uh, auth slash setup Firebase. And then right before we call react-dom.render, we just need to say set up Firebase, and that will take care of basically linking our front end and uh, the Firebase auth of our Firebase project. So let's head back to our Firebase console. We're gonna click on continue to console because we don't need that code anymore. And let's go into authentication here and just create a new user that we can use for testing. So let's click on this get started button. This is all stuff that we did previously, and we're gonna add an email and password authentication by clicking enable, and we'll click save, and then what we're gonna do is go into users, click on add user, and for email, we're gonna put sean at gmail.com, right? You can use whatever email you want, and for the password, we're just gonna do something simple like that and click on add user. Okay, and this is the user that we're gonna use for testing.
So you might want to leave this page open in your browser just because we'll need to do things like copy and paste this user ID here a little later on. So what we're going to do next is now that we've set up Firebase inside our application, we're going to allow our user provider to listen for changes to our authenticated state. So to do that, you may remember this from earlier. What we're going to do is use the on auth state changed function that Firebase auth provides for us. All right, so what that's gonna look like, we're first of all going to need the use effect hook here. And then we're gonna create a subscription uh, for the user's logged in state by saying use effect. And inside here is where we're going to use that on auth state changed function that Firebase provides for us. So let's import that from Firebase auth by saying import on auth state changed. from Firebase slash auth. And we're also gonna need to import a function called get auth, which is just used to get a reference to the auth object on Firebase. So uh, what we need to do next is inside use effect, we're just gonna say const auth equals get auth. And then we're gonna say return on auth state changed. We're gonna pass auth as the first argument and the second argument is going to be a callback function that basically takes the user or null as an argument uh, to signify whether the user just logged in or whether they just logged out. So we're gonna say user and inside this callback, we're going to basically set is loading to false and we're gonna set the user object to whatever we got back from on auth state changed. So let's say set user, user, and set is loading false. And that's pretty much all we need to do inside our use effect hook. One other thing we are gonna want to do is pass an empty array as the second argument to use effect because we only want this subscription to be created once, right? And we want it to be canceled when this user provider is unmounted, which honestly will probably only happen when the user closes our application, but you know, it's just a good idea to have that there anyway. Okay, so now that we have this user provider thing created, we can actually modify our auth route and unauthed routes to use this. So let's open those up. We're gonna say, uh, let's see, where are they here? Auth route and unauthed route. And we're gonna use the use context hook inside both of these to basically give our components access to the values that are being provided up in our user context dot provider. So let's import the use context hook. We're gonna say import use context from React. And we're also gonna to want to import our user context by saying import user context from contexts user context. And what we're gonna do is instead of saying is loading in user just hard coded there, we're going to say const is loading and user equals use context user context. Now notice here that the end result, right? The ending syntax that we're writing here is pretty similar to what we did before, right? Where we said blah, blah, blah equals use user. Okay, and this kind of comes down to the beauty of React hooks because essentially what we could do if we wanted to is create another use user hook that simply encapsulates this logic that we see here, right? It would just use that use context hook behind the scenes and the end result would be the same. So the point here is that even though things are a little bit different behind the scenes because we're using uh, user context instead of just creating a custom hook, the way that we end up accessing that is almost exactly the same thing and we could make it the exact same thing if we wanted to. Okay, so let's do the same thing now with our unauthed route. We're going to open that up. We're gonna import the use context hook by saying import use context from React. And we're gonna import the user context as well. And then we're just going to do the same thing by saying const is loading and user equals use context, user context. All right, and that's really all we should have to do. Let's open up our application here. Oops, there it is. Oh, I guess first of all, we're gonna to need to allow ourselves to log in. So let's do that real quick. That's gonna be pretty simple. We're just gonna open up 
our login page. Here it is, login page. And we're gonna add a basic login functionality. Uh, and to do that, we're just going to put the login function directly inside our page. So we're just gonna say import get auth and sign in with email and password. And we're importing those from Firebase auth. Okay, so now all we need to do is add a login function here. We're just gonna say const login equals, and inside here, we're gonna say const auth equals get auth. And we'll say await, sign in with email and password. And we're gonna pass the email and password values that the user has entered into there. And now we just need to make our login button call the login function by saying on click equals log in. And that should be all we need to do for now. So let's try logging in with this account that we created on our login page. What I'm gonna do is just enter in sean at gmail.com and the password here, abc123. We're gonna click login and nothing happened. Oh, you know what it is? We need to actually run our front end, right? We killed it so that we could install the Firebase package. So let's say npm run start. Those are the kind of bugs that I like, by the way. And let's see, that'll open up our application. And oops, it looks like we're getting an error now. We just need to add an async keyword to our login function, which is something that, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, I always forget. Oh, and we also need to pass auth to this sign in with email and password. Okay, so let's try this again. We're gonna refresh the page and we're gonna try and log in with sean at gmail.com, abc123, click log in. And it does send us to the home page, but our home page now is for some reason having trouble loading its data. And that reason is very similar to the previous error we had. It's just that our backend isn't running. So let's get our backend up and running as well. I'm gonna open up a new terminal inside the uh, friend tracker server folder, right? Which contains our backend. And inside here, we're just gonna say npm run dev, which is the command that we set up to basically run our server. And we're just gonna try refreshing this page now. And we should see uh, all of our people are now displayed correctly. Although actually one thing that I'm noticing is that these images aren't being displayed. And the reason for that, it's something very small that I don't think I caught uh, in some earlier video. Uh, we just need to open up our server.js file. And down here where it says populated friends, right in this endpoint for loading all of our friends, we just need to remove this process.env.public URL thing from the front because we changed the profile picture URL on all of our friends to already include the public URL. So let's go back to here now. We should be able to refresh our page and see all of our people displayed correctly. So cool, we've set up our application with a login page now and we've also uh, basically allowed our application via a user context provider to know when the user is logged in and when the user is logged out and basically respond to changes in that logged in state. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we're able to log into our application and basically use it the same way that we were before, let's give ourselves a way to log out of our application so that we can continue working on the login and create account pages. Now, the way that we're gonna do this is basically by editing the nav bar up at the top here so that in addition to having this My Profile button, it also has a button that will allow us to log out. All right, and we're also gonna do that thing where we basically change the buttons that are displayed up at the top here, depending on whether or not the user is currently logged in, All right? And we can do this, remember, because when we added our user provider to our application, if we open up our app.js component here, Remember that we wrapped our entire application inside of this. So essentially all of the components inside this user provider can access the data that it contains. So here's what this is gonna look like. We're gonna open up our navbar component and I'm just gonna close a lot of these components because we don't need them anymore. We're gonna open up our navbar component and up at the top here, the first thing we're gonna do is import the use context 
uh, hook from React and the user context from its own file. So import user context from, this is going to be dot dot slash contexts slash user context. And we're gonna start off by getting whether or not the user is logged in from this context by saying const is loading and user equals use context, user context. And then we're gonna use these two things to basically determine what we end up displaying inside our nav bar. So the friend tracker heading, that's gonna stay the same and we're gonna want that to be displayed no matter what, right? That's the logo of our site. So we'll want to display that whenever we can. Now, the next thing that we're gonna do is basically we're gonna wrap this my profile button inside some logic. So let's wrap that inside curly braces here. And we're gonna start off by looking at whether or not uh, the current user is actually loading, right? Right, if we don't know whether the user is logged in or not because our app is still communicating with Firebase, we're gonna just want to display a loading message here or nothing at all by saying is loading. Okay, and if it's loading, what we're gonna do is we're going to display just a basic loading message here. Again, you can display nothing if you want, just by putting null there instead. Right, if it's loading, it's gonna display that. Otherwise, it will check if the user is logged in or not by saying exclamation point, exclamation point, user. Okay, if the user exists, we wanna display this my profile button and we wanna display a logout button. So let's add another button here. Uh, with the same class name as our other button. We'll say class name equals styles.profile button. And we might actually wanna change the name of that style since it's no longer just the profile button. And for this, we're gonna say log out. Okay, we're gonna need to wrap these as well inside React Fragments here, just like that. Okay, so that's what happens if a user is logged in. If the user is not logged in, we're gonna basically display uh, a button for going to the login page and a button for going to the create account page. So we're gonna say here, you know what? We can actually just copy and paste this button here. We're gonna do it twice. We're gonna wrap that in a React fragment. And the next thing we're gonna do is basically just make this go to the login page. So we'll say login. We'll send that to the login route. And we'll do the same thing for the create account route. We'll say create dash account, which we still haven't created yet, by the way. And we're gonna make this button say create account. All right, and let's change the name of this style here from profile button to something more like uh, action button. So we're gonna open up navbar.module.css. We're gonna change profile button to uh, action button and we'll change that in all of these as well. So we'll say styles.action button, styles.action button, and styles.action button, styles.action button. You probably could have just done a uh, find and replace here for this, but whatever, it's done now. Okay, so that should be all of the logic that we need to determine which buttons are displayed in the nav bar, depending on whether or not the user is logged in. So the next thing we're gonna do is allow the user to actually log out by clicking on this button. Now, in order to do this, we're just going to import Firebase's signout function by saying import, uh, it's get auth and sign out from Firebase auth. And essentially we're just going to have a function here which will be called sign out or log out. Right, since that seems to be the terminology that the rest of our app is using, we'll call it logout. And that's going to be equals async. And we're gonna say const auth equals get auth. And then we're gonna say await sign out and pass auth as an argument there. Okay, so now we just need to make this button here, uh, this logout button rather, we need to make that call that logout function by saying on click equals log out. And that should be all we need to do. So let's test this thing by heading over to our app. There it is. Oops, and it looks like the styling here is a little funky. We'll come back and fix that in a minute. But let's try clicking on logout. 
and we should see that the buttons change accordingly, which is pretty cool. All right, so let's just go correct those styles for our buttons. All we're gonna do for that is just remove display flex from the nav bar. And for our action button, we're gonna add margin right equals eight picks. And that should make it so that our buttons are right next to each other. So let's just add a little bit of margin to our buttons at the top. So we'll just say margin top. We'll set that to, let's try eight picks and see how that looks. Mm, let's do a little bit more. We'll do 16 picks. There we go, that looks good. So that is our nav bar. And as I mentioned, it changes when we actually log in. So if we try logging in here now, we'll see that these buttons up here are gonna change. And we should see, boom, it changes like that. Now, one last thing that we can do as well is display the email of the currently logged in user to show them who they're currently logged in as. And the way that we would do that, it's actually quite simple, seeing as though we already have this user object. We just need to say, uh, right here next to our My Profile button. We're gonna say paragraph logged in as, and we're gonna display the user's email by saying user.email. Okay, so if we go back here now, we should see, oops, it messed up the styling here, but we should see that it does say logged in as sean at gmail.com. Uh, so let's actually just fix those things now. We're just gonna add some styles to this. We're just gonna say style equals float right. And actually let's just put that down here so that it, uh, it will display in the correct order since we're using float right. And sure enough, we see that it says logged in as sean at gmail.com. Now let's just add one or two more styles to this. We're just gonna say margin. In fact, let's actually just use the action button style. We're gonna say, class name equals styles.actionButton. And you might wanna change the name of that style again to make it more, uh, you know, more relevant to the fact that we're now displaying something that isn't actually an action button. But I'm just gonna leave that for now because it should look fairly good. Okay, so that's how to incorporate Firebase Auth into an existing navigation bar. And you know, this one's been a little bit different from before because it now has this My Profile button that we're displaying that'll take us to the user profile. But ultimately it's pretty similar to what we've seen before with of course the notable difference that we're now getting our user state from context instead of just from a custom hook. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've got our login page and our nav bar working with the rest of our app, there's one more thing that I wanna show you. You see, earlier I mentioned that it would be possible to, instead of using this use context and user context thing in each of the components that needs to access the user state, we could actually encapsulate this in its own custom hook to make it so that uh, we could just say equals use user, just like we did before. So what I'm gonna do here is show you how that might work just to help you get a better idea of how things like custom hooks and context fit together when it comes to doing things like user authentication. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna create a new hook and to do that, we'll just say new folder hooks and inside here, we're gonna say new file and we'll call this one the use user hook just like we did before. And what this is gonna do is it's basically just gonna combine the use context hook that we've seen before with the user context and basically make that accessible to components without having to know that it's actually context being used behind the scenes. So here's what it'll look like. We're gonna say import use context from react and import user context from contexts slash user context. Okay, and now that we have that, we're going to define our use user custom hook by saying export const use user equals, and this is just going to be a basic function like React custom hooks always are. And all we're gonna do inside here is just say const is loading and user equals use context, uh, user context. 
Okay, and we're just going to return is loading and user from this custom hook. So this is a super simple custom hook, but what it does is it allows the rest of our components to basically access the values inside our user context without knowing where that's coming from. So essentially, what we can do now is we can replace this use context thing. Right, we're just gonna delete that. And instead we're going to import our use user custom hook that we just created from hooks slash use user. And then we're gonna go down here and we're just gonna change this use context thing to use user. Okay, so you can see the power of this and that is that if we wanted to now, we could actually change uh, this custom hook to be anything that we wanted inside of it, right? If we wanted to get rid of context and replace it with something like recoil or redux, we could actually just replace the logic here and that wouldn't affect the way that our navbar component uses this. Okay, so you can see that this has allowed us to kind of abstract away the actual mechanics that we're using inside a React app and allow us to just focus on the fact that we're saying we want the user, right? So let's just go through our other components and make these changes now. What we're gonna do uh, here, I'll just search for use context, user context. Okay, and that will bring us to auth route and unauth route. Those are really the only other ones that are using this. So we'll just change this now to use user, which we're gonna have to import here. So we'll say import use user from dot dot slash hooks slash use user. And then we're gonna do the same thing in our unauth route. We're just going to say uh, here, we'll delete this, we'll delete this, we'll delete this, and we're gonna say uh, const is loading and user equals use user. Okay, and that's automatically imported for us. And we should see now that our application works exactly the same as it did before, right? We're able to log out, we're able to log back in, and our app responds appropriately to those changes. And again, I just wanna reiterate that the power in doing this now is that we can use something other than context now, right? We could change this to recoil if we wanted to, or redux. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. We've seen so far how to add basic Firebase auth logic to an existing React app, but one of the problems that we haven't addressed so far is how to make sure that users can only access their own data in our database. Okay, so this is not as big of a problem when you actually start off building an application from scratch with authentication, right? When we first looked at Firebase auth, the app that we built we didn't really have to worry about this too much because it was naturally built in to the data that we were storing. However, when we add user authentication to an application after the fact, we have to come up with a remediation plan of sorts to make sure that users can only access their own data. So that's what we're gonna be seeing how to do here. And in addition to that, we're gonna be seeing how to do this in a very efficient way without writing unnecessary repetitive code. So. Without further ado, let's jump right in and see how all of this works. Okay, so to get started here, let's talk about the concept of ownership in our friend tracker app. The way that our app is currently set up, right? We basically have one user and that user just has direct access to all of the data in the database, right? They have direct access to the entire friends collection. They have direct access to all of the favorites and they have direct access to the user collection, which currently only has one user in it, right? Which is this user right here. Now the concept of ownership comes in when basically we wanna allow our application to have more than one user, right? So. If we add another user over here, in fact, let's make them a different color here. There we go. If we add another user over here, we don't want both of these users to have unlimited access to all of our collections down here, right? 
right? We don't want this user now to be able to access the friends created by this user here. We don't want them to be able to access that user's favorites or friends either, right? The entire purpose of this app is that each person, right, each user essentially has their own friends that they've created, right, and their own favorites, right? We'll just put them in there, right? And then our other user here would have their own collection of friends and favorites, etc., which I'll just draw like that again. Now, the way that we express ownership in the back end is usually by adding some kind of extra property to all of the data that we create that designates who that belongs to, right? Which user that data belongs to. Now, what we're essentially gonna do in our database here, right, is instead of each of our friends just having name, age, blah, 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 and, you know, each user being able to just directly access all of the friends, we're gonna add an extra property to all of our friends, all of our favorites, and our users as well, that will basically be something like, created by, and this property is going to contain the ID of the user who created it, right? So it'll look like something like that, if, you know, assuming that that's an ID. Okay, and what this will allow us to do is it'll allow us to change the database queries slightly that we're making inside our server routes. So instead of just saying, you know, something like uh, DB dot collection friends, and then saying, you know, basically find all, we'll just say find blah, blah, blah. We're gonna actually filter these friends by this created by property, okay? So that's really how this concept of ownership is expressed in databases. And there's a lot of other ways to do this, right? There are, I mean, for example, you could just have one collection, which is users, right? And each of these users could just have a property called friends, which is just an array containing that data directly, right? So it would contain the name, age, bio, etc., of all their friends. And then when a given user logs on, all you do is say db.collectionUsers.find, and then you find that user by their ID, and that already contains the user's friends. It would also contain their favorites as well and any other information that belongs to that user. Now, this way that I just described would work. However, as our application gets bigger, it's really a good idea to start splitting our resources into separate collections as we've already been doing in our application. So that's why we're approaching it in the way that we're going to, right? By keeping our friends, favorites, users separate and just adding a created by property to them is that that is really just more of a scalable solution ultimately. So now that we've talked about this basic concept of ownership in full stack applications with multiple users, what we're gonna do is we're going to first modify our Mongo database. So what I'm gonna do is open up a new terminal Okay, and I'll just open it up in the backend directory. It doesn't really matter where we do it because we're just gonna open up a Mongo shell here by typing Mongo. Okay, and the first thing that we're gonna need to do here is make a few changes to the data in our database. So if you open up your Firebase console uh, for your project here, what you're gonna see is that the user we created has this user ID. So essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this ID and we're gonna add it to all of the friends that we have in our application so far as the created by property, right? So essentially what that'll tell our application once we've added this logic is that the current user, right? Or, you know, all of the friends that we've created so far have been created by this user and therefore only this user should be able to access and modify or, you know, delete them. So what we're gonna do is we're going to copy that we're just going to click on this copy UID thing here. And we're gonna go back to MongoDB. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna say use friend tracker DB. This was the database we created before, remember? And just to make sure you're in the right one, you're gonna to wanna to say show collections, and you should see favorites, friends, and users. Okay, so 
I mentioned that we're going to add this created by property to all of our friends. And the way that we're gonna do that is by saying db.friends.updateMany. And we're gonna pass in an empty object for the filter because we want this to apply to all. And then we're gonna say set, and we're gonna say created by, and here's where we paste that ID that we just copied. And we're gonna close the curly braces and the parentheses, and that should be all we have to do. So let's hit enter. And we should see that three of our friends were matched and three were modified, which basically means that this, uh, this query that we put here, this update, has been applied to all of the friends in our database. Okay, now we don't need to worry about our favorites at this point unless you have any favorites in your database. Okay, so in other words, if you take a look at your application and there's anyone in your favorites, then you're gonna need to run this same kind of query for your favorites as well. But in my case, right, if we say db.favorites.find, we're gonna see that there's nothing there, so we'll just have to make some changes to the logic in our, uh, in our server in order to make sure that whenever a user adds someone to their favorites, uh, this created by property is added to that as well. But anyway, just to make sure that all of your friends are looking good, let's say db.friends.find, and you can add .pretty on the end too to make it a little more readable. And what you should see is that all of your friends are in there and they all now have this created by property added to them, which is the ID of the user, right? Currently our only user in our application. So the next thing that we're gonna need to do here is just like we added this ID to all of our friends, we're gonna need to add it to our user as well. Except instead of adding it as a created by property, we're gonna add it as simply an ID to identify the user. Now this is gonna be different, right? If we say db.users.find, this is gonna be different from the Mongo ID, which is just an automatically generated uh, random ID that Mongo applies to all of the documents that we insert. But Basically what we're gonna do is stop using this Mongo ID altogether and just add a completely different ID field that we'll use instead. So what we're gonna do is just say db.users.update and there's only one user in our database now so we can just say update with an empty filter object. And what we're gonna do is say set and we're gonna set a property called ID without the underscore and for that, we're going to paste the user's ID that we copied from Firebase. Okay, so let's hit enter, and we should see and modified one. And if you say db.users.find, and you can say .pretty again as well if you want, you should see that this user now has an extra ID property, which is what we're gonna use to basically link up Firebase auth with the data in our database and also establish who owns what in our application. Okay, so those are pretty much all of the changes that we're gonna to need to make to our database. So the next thing that we're gonna do, right, you're gonna to want to exit out of the Mongo shell there because we don't need that anymore for the time being. You're gonna to wanna to open up your server file. Okay, so let's go to friend tracker server source and let's open up server here. And essentially what we're gonna to need to do in here now is modify all of our database queries in order to take the changes that we've established into account. So essentially, right, just uh, using the friends as an example here, instead of saying find all, which is essentially what this query means, we're gonna say find all of the friends in the friends collection only if they're created by property is equal to whatever the ID is of our current user. Okay, and we're basically gonna do that same thing for all of the endpoints in our application so far. So that'll look something like this. And for now, we're just going to hard code that ID. I'll show you how we can have our front end send along auth tokens that we'll be able to verify on the back end, but we'll get there in a little while. So what we're gonna do is just say created by, and we're gonna paste that ID in here again. And basically what that will do is get all of the friends whose created by property is equal to that. Now note that this will still be all of the friends in our application so far, because at this point, we don't have any other users that have created friends in our application. So now that we have that, we're gonna go down to our next endpoint, which is gonna be the favorites endpoint. 
And we're gonna want to do the same thing that we did up in our friends endpoint with our favorites. So essentially what we're gonna do with loading favorites, right? Each of our favorites, just like each of our friends is going to have its own created by property that'll just help us know which user created each of these favorites so that we don't have to actually load each of the friends associated with these favorites in order to know, you know, if the user actually has access to that record or not. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add the same thing here. We're gonna say created by and paste that user ID where we load all of our favorites and the rest of the stuff should be good. Okay, next up, when we load an individual friend, we're gonna need to check and make sure that that user owns that data, okay? So this is gonna be a little different than what we saw up above. What we're gonna need to do essentially is after we load our friend up here and after we've made sure that that friend actually exists in the database with that ID, we're gonna need to check and make sure that the user, right, the, uh, the friends created by property is equal to the ID of the user who's trying to load this data. So for now, again, we're just going to hard code the user's ID. I'll show you later on how to make this uh, actually line up with the currently logged in user on the front end. And we're just gonna say if that is not equal to our friends created by property, then what we're gonna want to do is return a 403 status code signifying that whoever's trying to load that data does not have access to it. Okay, so we'll just say response.sendStatus403 and that should be all we need to do there. So next thing, we're gonna go down to our load user data endpoint and essentially all we have to do here is make sure that the user who's trying to load, you know, this user profile is actually that user. So all we really need to do here is check to make sure that the user's ID, which again, we're going to hard code, is uh, if that's not equal to the user ID that they're trying to load, we're just gonna say return response.sendStatus403 and that's all we need to do in that case. Oh, and just one more thing here. We do need to add a return statement here just to make sure that uh, our server doesn't try and execute this other response.json thing. All right, so we're moving right along. Let's go to our next one, creating friends. Okay, this is where we actually have to set that created by property to begin with. So essentially, in addition to the new friend info that's being sent to us by the front end, we're also gonna want to include a created by property with the current user's ID. So all we have to do for that is we're just gonna say, uh, use the spread operator on the request body to get all of the new friend info. And under that, we're going to add a created by property with this thing as the value. And that's all we need there. Okay, that should automatically insert this created by property into our database when a given user creates uh, you know, a new friend in our application. Okay, and the next thing we're gonna do is the favorites here. For the favorites, we're gonna do essentially the same thing that we did up here in friends. All we need to do here is in addition to this, uh, the ID of the friend that the user is currently marking as a favorite, we also need to add the created by property there. Oops, that should be created by. Okay, we're gonna paste that. And let me just make sure I have created by in all of these and not create by. Ah, yes, okay, I mistyped that one. I saw that in the uh, autocomplete and I was like, hmm, I think I made a typo somewhere. So I'm glad I caught that because that could be a pretty dastardly bug there. So let's go down to, um, let's see, where were we? We were in our favorites and our favorites are now adding the same created by property as before. So let's do our two delete endpoints. These ones are gonna be pretty straightforward. We just need to make sure that um, the user actually is the one who created that friend record in our database. So what we're gonna do, we're actually gonna need to load this friend by ID before we actually allow the user to delete it, right? Because we need to make sure that the created by property on that friend in our database is equal to the ID of the user who's trying to delete it. So what this is gonna look like, we're gonna say const friend equals db.collection friends, and we're gonna use the find one 
query, and we're basically just going to find the friend by their ID. We're gonna say ID, object ID, friend ID. Okay, and that should successfully load that data. So all we need to do now is make sure that that friends created by property is equal to the ID of the current user. So we're just gonna say if, and we're gonna use that thing again, is not equal to friend.createdBy. by, we're gonna send back a 403 status code by saying return response.send status 403. Pretty straightforward. We're gonna do the same thing now with our favorites. So essentially I'm just going to copy and paste this and we'll see how to uh, simplify this logic a little later on because it is getting a little repetitive. Okay, so let's just paste that there. We're gonna say const favorite, and we're gonna say db.collection favorites.find one. And instead of ID, we're gonna use the favorite, or no, rather friends ID property, and that's just going to be friend ID. Oh, you know what? That's the same thing. So we can just say friend ID like that, okay? And just like we did before, we're gonna say if that does not equal favorite dot created by, then we're gonna send back that same status code as before. All right, so those are our delete endpoints. And now, last but not least, we come to our update endpoints. Hopefully you're getting the idea of how all of this works by now. Uh, but let's do our update endpoints. The first one is the endpoint for updating a user's profile information. Now what this one is gonna look like uh, essentially, it's, it's actually quite easy. We just need to make sure that this user ID in the query parameter, or in the URL parameter rather, is equal to the user's ID. So the way we do that is by saying, if, then we're gonna paste that, oops, looks like I uh, copied and pasted too much. You know what, let me just go back and get the uh, original ID from our Firebase console. I'm gonna say copy UID and we'll just say if, and then paste that string there, is not equal to user ID. Then what we're gonna do is say return response uh, send status 403. Okay, that should protect that route just fine. And next let's go to our friends slash friend ID. And for this one, we're gonna want to load our friend before allowing access so we can actually just go up to where we were originally loading our friends and copy and paste this exact logic. I believe that that will all uh, work exactly the way we want it to. So I'm just going to paste that in there. And sure enough, uh, it looks like that's all we need. So basically, again, we're getting our friend. We're making sure that the friends created by property is equal to the user's ID before we allow anybody to make changes to it. And that is all of our routes. So what you can do now is test out the application with the single user that we've created so far and everything should work just like it did before. So what we're gonna do is say npm run start. Okay, we're gonna start up the front end. We're gonna start up the back end if you don't already have it running. Oops, there we go. And everything should work the same way as before, except now we've added this concept of ownership to all of the data in our application by using the ID of the currently logged in user. So let's go back to here, and it looks like we're running into some kind of error, so let's try this again. We're just gonna open up the network, let's refresh our application and see what's going wrong here. Oh, you know what, it looks like everything worked, so I guess it was just a fluke. Okay, so we see that we have all of our original friends, and if we click on add to favorites on one of them, that should work. Remove from favorites should work. Oops, it looks like that's not working. Let's see what the uh, error is there. Let's try and remove someone from favorites. And we see that we're getting a 403 on that, which is a little puzzling. So let's go take a look at this. Okay, we're going to go up to our remove favorites endpoint, which is in app.delete favorites slash friend ID. Ah, and we need to add a weight to this. Maybe that's why uh, it wasn't working. And actually we need to do the same thing to all of these. Okay, I believe we did that up there. Yes, we have it, we have it, we have it. Okay, it looks like I didn't, oh, here we go. I missed it in this place too. Just make sure that you've added a weight before db.collection blah, blah, blah. 
Okay, and just to make sure, just doing a visual scan here, it looks like we have it all. So let's try this again. We're going to refresh the page. We should be able to remove Carl from our favorites now. Looks like that's working. Let's try editing our friends now. So we're gonna do edit info and we'll try just changing this to something like that. Click save changes. Sure enough, it looks like that's working correctly. Let's try adding a new friend now and we'll see if that friend actually shows up in our friends list. So we're just gonna add a very simple friend here, John Doe, age, we'll say 32. Profile picture URL, we'll leave blank. Bio, we'll just type in something real quick. Birthday, Jan 1st. Interests, food, movies, travel. Click on create. And sure enough, we see that John Doe shows up. And we should be able to delete this user as well if we go down here and click on delete friend. So it looks like that's not working. So let's check and see what the error is there. If we open up our network tab again, click on delete friend. It looks like that's causing some kind of error on the server, which is causing the server to hang up. So let's go back here. All right, so let's go back and take a look at this request here. Oh, you know what? This request is going to the favorites endpoint because basically what's happening here is our front end, when we delete a friend, is trying to remove them from the favorites. And this is to make sure that we don't end up with a dangling favorite, so to speak, without a friend object in the database that corresponds to it. Okay, so essentially what we need to do here, I suppose, is we need to go into delete favorites friend ID, and we need to basically check and see if that favorite exists before performing this logic, right? If the favorite doesn't exist, then that's fine. We don't need to worry about it. If it does exist, we want to delete it. So let's say if favorite, Okay, and we're gonna put all of this logic in here except for the response.send status because we want that to happen regardless of whether or not the favorite exists. And that should be all we need to do there to make this work. So let's try this again. What we're gonna do is just refresh this to make sure it's all working. We're gonna click on John Doe again. And what we'll do is say delete friend and that should successfully delete the friend as we wanted. Okay, now one last thing that I wanted to show you here is what would happen if we change the created by property of one of our existing friends here to make it something other than the currently logged in user. Well, essentially what would happen there is one of these friends, we would just stop seeing it because this logged in user would no longer have access to it. So what we're gonna do just to simulate this is first of all, let's make sure that none of our users are in our favorites since that will complicate things. And we're gonna open up a Mongo shell again by saying Mongo, whoops, I'm in caps lock there. And we're gonna say use friend tracker DB for our database. And we're gonna say db.friends.find. And we'll say dot pretty to make it more readable. Okay, and what we'll see here, let's just, uh, let's take Carl. We're gonna pick on him and we're gonna take his object ID. And we're basically going to change the created by to something else. So. Uh, what we're going to do is just say db.friends.update, okay? And we're only going to update one here, so we'll just say update one. And we're going to paste that ID property like that. And the update that we're going to do is to set Carl's created by property, okay? Created by two, we'll just set it to something like one, two, three, right? This is to simulate the ID of another user in our application. All right, so let's hit enter now. And Carl no longer belongs to us. So what we're gonna do is refresh our app. And uh-oh, let's see uh, what happened here. It looks like we got an error. Oh, we, our server's not running anymore, that's why. Let's try that again. We're gonna say npm run dev. Okay, and let's go back here and try refreshing again. And sure enough, we'll only see the two friends that still have the created by ID equal to the currently logged in user. So let's just change Carl back real quick. Uh, what we're gonna do, let's just uh, take this created by property from before. We're gonna use that same query, except we're gonna change created by here to the old one. And now if we go back here and hit refresh, we should see that Carl is back in our friends. Okay, so just to review here, what we've seen is how to add the concept of ownership to the data in our application so that we can make sure that data 
belongs to specific users and that other users can't access that. So I hope that this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so we've added the concept of ownership to our server. So the next thing that we're gonna do is make it so that we can actually use different users than just the one designated by this ID that we copied and pasted here. Okay, so in order to do this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna need to go into our front end and essentially what needs to happen is every single request coming out of our front end, okay, if I can draw it like this, every single request coming out of our front end has to have the auth token of the currently logged in user sent along with it, right? This will allow our server to actually know who it is that's making the request. Okay, so in other words, when our front end wants to do something like, uh, you know, create a friend, it's gonna send along the friend data, like that, boop, 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 with whatever the auth token is. Okay, ABC123, blah, blah, blah. And in that way, the server will be able to use this thing, right? And we'll have to add Firebase admin to our server in order to do that. But our server is going to take that thing. It'll use that to find out what user is making the request for sure. And basically, it will automatically decide if the front end is allowed to do what it's trying to do. All right. Now, there are two ways to go about this, the naive way and the smart way. Now, the naive way would be simply to do a global search for wherever we say Axios dot blank and basically just go through here, generate a user auth token and add it to each and every one of these requests. And that would take us probably about 20, 25 minutes to do, depending on how fast your typing skills are, right? It would be 100% just typing out everything inside of here over and over and over again. What I'm gonna recommend you do instead, however, is we're gonna basically create a wrapper around Axios that will automatically add the user's auth token to all of the requests that it sends. Now, essentially this wrapper is just going to be something that we end up using instead of Axios. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create our own internal package with the wonderful name of Authios, right? Sort of a mashup of auth and Axios and Basically, this is going to behave just like Axios. It's gonna use Axios behind the scenes, except each of the requests now is going to actually include those credentials along with it, right? It'll include the auth token along with each and every request. So in order to do this, I'm just gonna create a new folder here, which I'll call network, right? For network request related stuff. And inside here, I'm gonna create a new file called authios.js. And here's what this thing is gonna look like. Again, it's just gonna be a wrapper around Axios's most common methods like get, post, put, delete, etc. So we're gonna say import Axios from Axios. We're going to import the get auth function from our Firebase auth package. And then what we're gonna do is define a separate function here that we'll call get token. And what this is gonna do is it's going to basically return the auth token for the currently logged in user. So we're just gonna say async, and this is going to return await get auth dot current user dot get ID token. And voila, we can now just use this simple function to get the ID token of the currently logged in user. Okay, so we don't have to import get auth and do this logic each and every time we want to make a request, which is a, a pain. So next up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say export default, and then inside this object that we're exporting, we're gonna add the main methods that we've been using on Axios, such as get, uh, post, put, and delete. And each of these is basically just going to call the corresponding Axios method. And in addition, it's going to pass some headers that will include this auth token here. So I'll show you what I mean here. With get, we're gonna say async, and it's just going to take the URL that we wanna send the request to as an argument here. All right, inside here now, we're gonna say return await axios.get and 
We're going to basically pass that URL through to Axios. And now here comes the part that we're gonna save ourselves a lot of typing on. Inside this get method, we're just gonna say headers, auth token, await get token. Oops, and we need to put this inside an object here. There we go. Okay, so let's do the same thing now with our post, put, and delete methods. We're gonna say post, async, and this is going to take the URL and the request body as arguments, and it's gonna say return, await axios.post, and it's gonna take the URL and the body as arguments, and again, we're gonna see this headers thing with the auth token property. Okay, we're gonna say await get token, Okay, and same thing again for our put request. In fact, we can just copy pretty much our logic with post and change that a little bit. So I'm gonna delete put, and I'm gonna change this to put now. Oops, and let's add a comma there to make JavaScript happy. And then we're just gonna change this to axios.put, and the URL and the body are gonna be the same, and the headers are gonna be the same as well. And last but not least, we're going to say delete this is going to be async. It's just gonna take a URL as an argument and it's gonna say return await axios.delete URL and the same thing as we've done elsewhere. We're just gonna copy and paste this headers thing into here and that's all we need to do. So here's the magical part of it all. What we can do is we're basically gonna do a global find and replace and we're gonna replace all instances of axios dot with authios dot and we're going to replace all instances of import axios from axios with import authios from authios blah 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 so here's what this is going to look like and first of all we're going to want to ignore this authios file so what i'm going to do is say search and we're going to look for axios dot we're gonna change that to Authios dot. We're gonna open up this little extra menu here, these three dots, click on those, and we're going to exclude um, our Authios.js file. Okay, so you should have seen this go from five files to four files, and you shouldn't see Authios anywhere in the search results. So now all we're gonna do is just click on replace all, and this is going to replace everything with Authios dot. So what we can see now is if we open up, let's say our uh, provider components, let's take a look in here, components, favorites provider, we can see that all the calls to axios.post have been replaced with authios.post. Whoops, I just messed that up there. Okay, and the next thing we need to do is replace this import axios from axios with the correct authios import. Now, fortunately for us, all of the components that are using axios are in the same position in the tree, right, on the same level of the tree, so the imports are all gonna be identical. So all we need to do is just say import Axios from Axios, and we're gonna replace that now with import Authios from, and the path is gonna be dot dot slash network slash Authios. And that should be all we need to do. So again, we're gonna want to exclude our Authios.js file because we still want to import Axios inside of there. So we're just going to change that, click on replace, and everything should be working now. So let's just open up our front end here to make sure we don't have any syntax errors. It looks like we did everything uh, well, just like before. And let's just give it a little bit of a click through test. We're just gonna refresh this, make sure everything is working. Whoops, and uh, I think that I know why this is happening here. I think what we need to do is just open up our users provider and add a little bit of extra logic in there to make sure that uh, all of this is only getting displayed at the correct time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up our user provider. We're going to change the is loading and user states a little bit. So what we're gonna do is say const auth equals get auth. All right, and for the initial state of is loading, we're gonna say not auth.currentUser and use state is going to be auth.currentUser as well. And then down here, we can just delete this const auth thing. And we're gonna need to pass that now to this 
dependency array in use effect. And other than that, the only other thing we have to do now is make sure that our favorites provider and friends provider only try and load their data once uh, the user is done loading. Okay, so let's go into our favorites provider and friends provider. And what we're gonna do here is add in a little bit of logic to check and make sure that our user isn't loading. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna need to use the new use user hook that we added a little while ago. We're gonna say const is loading, and we're gonna rename that to is loading user. And we're also gonna get the user as well, equals use user. Okay, we're gonna have to import that hook by saying import use user from dot dot slash hooks slash use user. And basically down here, when we load our friends, we're gonna want to say if not is loading user and user exists, then we're going to load our friends. Okay, and we're gonna do exactly the same thing for our favorites provider. So I'm just gonna copy and paste some of these things over into here. Okay, so we have our is loading and user. We're gonna take our user hook import up here and add that in here. And we're going to basically just add this protector around our loading logic. So we're only gonna load our favorites if uh, the user is logged in. Okay, that'll make things a lot easier for us. Now this is a bit different than what we would have to do if say we were using a custom hook because a custom hook only gets called when the component that's using it gets rendered. Okay, so in other words, earlier when we saw how to create a use user custom hook without context, right, just by loading the data inside that hook, basically that hook only got called when the correct components used it. Whereas with context, seeing as though our context is on the outer layer of our application, immediately our user provider, favorites provider, friends provider, etc., are all going to try and load their data, which currently is just causing a bit of a conflict. So anyway, those changes that we just made should fix everything. So let's go back here, try refreshing again. And uh oh, it looks like there's another error. <laughs> let's see what that is. Okay, we're going to try and refresh this. Oh, and it looks like we're just not making any requests. And the reason for that, maybe you've already picked up on this, is that we need to actually watch for changes in is loading user and user inside our use effect dependencies. So let's just add those there. Okay, so after a long bout of troubleshooting here, let's see if this is working again. We're gonna try and refresh, and it looks like everything is finally working for us. So what we've done here is we've added an auth token to each and every request that's coming out of our front end. And the next step, of course, is going to be to actually have our back end intercept those, parse them, and make sure that the data that the user is trying to access actually belongs to them. So I hope that this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that our front end is sending along the user's auth token with each and every request, the next thing that we're gonna have to do here is we're gonna have to add Firebase admin to our server so that it can start actually verifying to make sure that the auth token that our users send along is legit. So the first thing that we're gonna do here is we're gonna open up our server directory and we're going to install the Firebase admin package into there. So. We're gonna open up friend tracker server and we're gonna say npm install firebase admin. Okay, and while that's installing, we're gonna to have to go over to firebase and get the credentials file that will basically allow our server to have admin level privileges on our project. So to do that, you might remember, we're gonna go into our friend tracker project in the firebase console. We're gonna click on this little gear thing up in the top left hand corner. We're gonna to go to uh, users and permissions, and we're going to click on service accounts. And this is where we can download that credentials file. So I'm just gonna say generate new private key, click this generate key button, and that will download the credentials JSON for us. So I'm gonna copy and paste this over into my project. And I'm going to rename it now to credentials.json. 
And once you've done that, you're gonna want to make sure that you add this to the gitignore file. So I'm just gonna go into here and say credentials.json to prevent ourselves from accidentally committing this to GitHub and basically compromising our project's credentials. Okay, so now that we have those credentials, the next step is gonna be to open up our server.js file. And inside here, we're going to basically uh, set up Firebase Admin with those credentials that we just downloaded. So in order to do that, we're just gonna say import all as admin from Firebase Admin. And we're also gonna import our credentials by saying import credentials from dot dot slash credentials dot JSON. And then we're going to initialize our Firebase admin with those credentials by saying admin dot initialize app. And inside here, we're gonna say credential admin dot credential dot cert credentials. And that should be all we need to do to get Firebase admin up and running on our server. So now that we have that set up, what we're gonna need to do next is basically in each and every one of our server endpoints, we're gonna need to make sure that the user is who they say they are. Okay, so the way that we can do that, we're just gonna use this uh, friends endpoint as an example here. Since every request is sending along the auth token property along with its headers, we're gonna start off each of our endpoints here by getting that auth token and we'll say equals request.headers. And then we need to use the admin package to verify that that auth token is legit, as I said. So the way that we do that, in case you don't remember, is by saying const user equals await admin.auth.verifyID token. And we're gonna pass that auth token as an argument to the verifyID token function. All right, so at this point we have the user. So essentially the only other thing that we're gonna have to do in all of our endpoints is replace this hard-coded string, right? Which is, you know, the ID of the user that we manually created in Firebase. We're gonna have to replace that with the ID of the user that we got from calling verify ID token. Now, just to be very clear about what this user object is, I'm actually gonna change the name of this to auth user. Okay, and uh, then basically what we'll do is just say auth user dot UID. We're basically going to replace every string where we hard coded the ID with that same kind of logic that we just did here. Okay, so that's how we convert over the endpoint for getting all of a user's friends. And what we could do is we could just copy and paste this logic basically throughout each of our endpoints. And you know, that would work. However, it would be extremely repetitive so what we're gonna do instead is use a technique that I showed you earlier, and that is we're basically going to set up some express middleware that will take care of all of this for us, right? Because in addition to what we just did here, we're also gonna need to check and make sure for each and every request that this auth token is valid in the first place, right? So that's going to involve adding a try catch block, as well as a lot of other logic that would be extremely repetitive if we were to put that in all of our endpoints. We're gonna add the middleware that I mentioned, and the way we're gonna do that is by saying app.use, and the callback function for this middleware is gonna be an async function with request, response, and next as arguments. Okay, and then inside of here, what we're gonna do is basically the logic that we just saw here. We're gonna get the auth token from the headers each time a request comes in. So const auth token equals request.headers. We're gonna verify it by saying const auth user equals await admin.auth.verifyid token. And we're gonna pass that auth token as an argument here. Okay, and then we're just going to add a try catch block around here in order to take care of what happens if the verify ID token function goes wrong. And basically, Inside the catch block now, what we're gonna do is we're just going to send back a 401 error, which basically means that the auth token either didn't exist or it wasn't valid. So we're gonna say response.send status 401 inside of there. And inside the try block, if everything goes well, we're gonna call next. Okay, so one question that comes up now is how do we actually 
get access to this auth user variable inside our endpoints. Well, you may remember from before that essentially what we can do is say request dot auth user equals auth user. And what will happen now is now each of our endpoints that comes after this uh, middleware function that we've defined, right? Essentially all of the functions that the middleware applies to have access to this request dot auth user thing. So what we can do with this is instead of having to go through and say auth user, blah, 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 auth user dot ID, all we have to do is wherever we had the user's ID, we now just have to say request dot auth user dot ID. And basically uh, all of the logic is consolidated now inside this middleware. So what we're gonna do is go through each of these. Okay, we have our friends. Let's do the same thing with our favorites. We're gonna replace this ID with request.authuser.uid. Okay, same thing with our get friend by ID. We're gonna say if request.authuser.uid is not equal to friend.created by, then we wanna send back this 403. Okay, and same thing down here request.authuser.uid. We'll do it here too. We're gonna to be setting that ID as the created by property when we create a new friend. So request.authuser.uid. And here as well, request.authuser.uid. And we're getting close to the end here. So this one too, request.authuser.uid request.authuser.uid here as well. And last but not least, inside our update users and update friend, we're going to replace this one last time with request.authuser.uid. Okay, request.authuser.uid. Okay, so hopefully by now you've really gotten it through your head that uh, if we had to basically rewrite this logic inside each and every one of our uh, endpoints, that would be a nightmare, right? It would get very difficult to maintain when we wanted to make a change to how we handle this sort of situation. Okay, so let's try this and see if it's working still with our front end. All right, what we're going to do is go over to our app. We're going to try refreshing it. Oops, let's make sure everything's running. I have a feeling that's the problem here. Yep, sure enough, we need to run our server. Make sure our front end is running as well. Looks like it is. And let's try this again. We're gonna reload. And sure enough, all of our friends show up. Let's try doing some things like editing their info. Looks like that works. Let's try um, adding to favorites, removing from favorites. It looks like those work as well. Okay, yep, they work on this page too. Now, one thing that is not going to work is if we click on my profile, you're gonna see that we're just stuck with this loading message here. Now, the reason that this is happening is because basically inside our front end, we're still making a hard-coded request using the user ID. You probably forgot that we did this. I did too when I was first writing out all of this code for my notes. Uh, so what we're gonna do is basically, we're going to search through our friend tracker uh, front end for all of the places where we say slash users, here we'll just say slash users. Okay, and that should take us to, yes, here we go. So there's only two places it looks like. As you can see, basically what we did from before is we copied and pasted the hard-coded MongoDB ID for our user uh, into the actual request. So at this point, we're going to replace that with the current user's ID. And the way we're gonna do that is basically by using the use user hook that we created earlier. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna say const user, uh, here we'll say is loading, and we'll have to change that to is loading user because we already have an is loading variable in here. And we're gonna get the user as well, and this is going to be equal to use user. And once we have that, we're going to want to replace this here. We're gonna say back ticks and replace user ID inside of here. So users, user.uid. Same thing down here. We're going to replace this now with users, uh, user ID, user.uid that is. 
And really all we have to make sure of here now is that we only call load user info when we actually have this user ID. Otherwise, what you'll probably see is requests going to slash users slash undefined, or you'll, or probably more likely you'll get an error for trying to access UID on a non-existent object. So uh, all we have to do here is say if not is loading user and user exists, then we want to load user info. And as we learned before, we have to also include is loading user and user inside the dependencies for our effect. Okay, and for this update user info, that shouldn't be too big of a problem. If you really wanna make sure, you can always put in some kind of fail safe to make sure that this user exists before calling it. But in general, this thing won't actually be called ever if the user wasn't actually loaded. Okay, so anyway, let's go back to our application now and see if it works. Oops, it looks like we forgot to import use user. So let's open up those files we just had open. Okay, we need use user in here, import use user from dot dot slash hooks slash use user. Okay, we'll try refreshing this now, go to my profile. And it looks like we're still uh, getting something going wrong. So let's check our network tab. We're gonna see network, if we try and refresh this. Oops, let's go back to my profile here. We're gonna see that it looks like some kind of error is happening because this uh, request is pending. So let's go back and take a look at our server. Sure enough, an error showed up here. Uh, let's take a look here. Argument passed in must be a buffer or string of blah, 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 blah. Ah, the reason for this is that we're trying to use uh, inside our user route, that is. Here, let's open up our server and go down to where we load our user info. This user ID, if you remember, was actually the MongoDB ID. And what we wanna use now is the Firebase auth ID. So we're gonna actually change this now to user auth ID in this one. And where else are we using the user ID? Here we go, user auth ID. Okay, and basically we're just going to need to change the way that we use this a little bit. Instead of saying user ID, we're gonna say user auth ID from request.params. And we're gonna to want to find our user by their ID property, which is not a MongoDB object ID. So we're gonna say user auth ID there as well. Okay, and then let's go back down here to where we were updating our user. And for this, what we're gonna do is same thing as before. We're gonna to switch to the ID property without the underscore. We're gonna remove the object ID constructor from around the user ID, and we're gonna rename this to user off ID, both here and up at the top here. Oh, and I think I forgot to do this up at the top too. So we'll just need to say user off ID. And back up here, we're gonna to need to say user off ID. Okay, so let's give this another try. Hopefully this will work this time. Let's refresh and go to my profile. And sure enough, it looks like our profile data is working. Let's try and edit it by clicking edit my profile info. I'm just going to edit this slightly and click save changes. And sure enough, it looks like those updates are persisted. All right, now keep in mind that the key point of everything that we just did here with Firebase auth and verifying the ID token, etc is to make sure that users can only access their own resources. So if we have a user here and you know their resources are in this box and we have another user here and their resources are in this box, we wanna prevent users from reaching over into other users' boxes and getting their information, right? We want to stop that from happening. And the way we do that is by using those auth token things that we've seen. And Firebase abstracts away a lot of that logic for us, right? Implementing authentication tokens is a topic for another time. But anyway, at this point, we have an application that makes sure that users can only access, modify, delete, etc., their own data. And all of that we did with Firebase Auth. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. 
Learning the basics of React concept by concept definitely isn't a bad way to go. And in fact, that's the way that most React courses, including the ones that I've made, have done it. However, there comes a time when instead of just seeing each individual concept in isolation in React, you want to see how all of them fit together into a full stack application. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at here today. So what we're going to be doing, we're going to be starting an entirely new project, which I'll talk about in just a minute here, which will combine basically all of the concepts that we've learned so far about React in rapid fire succession. So that instead of covering, you know, one or two concepts per section, we're going to be covering, you know, 10 or 20 that will all be combined in a single section. You'll see what this looks like later on, but essentially what this is going to do, it's going to mimic the way that I actually write my applications, you know, when I'm writing a personal project or something like that. So this is kind of an opportunity for you to look over my shoulder as I create an entire full stack React application from scratch. So let's talk about the application we're going to be building. We're going to be building a note sharing application similar to something like Google Docs, where users can basically create notes. We're going to allow users to write them in Markdown. We'll talk about that shortly. And we're going to allow the users to share those notes with other users and allow those other users to edit them. You know, we'll allow users to control permissions, who can do what with their notes. It's going to be a very, very interesting application. So this application is going to involve, as I said, the entire MERN stack. So MongoDB, uh, React, Node, etc. And additionally, it's going to involve things like user authentication. It's going to involve web sockets in order to add real time communication with other users. It's just going to be a lot of fun. So we'll talk about the app in more detail very shortly, but that's our basic plan of attack. So let's jump right in. All right, so to get ourselves started here, what I want to do first is actually discuss in a lot of detail what this app is going to look like, right? This will kind of give us a starting point for all of the different functionality that we're going to add, and it'll give me an opportunity to kind of lay out how everything is going to fit together ahead of time. All right, so as I said, we're going to be building a note sharing app, and what this app is going to allow users to do is basically create notes, modify their content, which we're going to allow them to write in Markdown too, by the way. We'll take a look at that in more detail later on. And we're going to allow them to share those notes with other people, right, other users of the application, in a similar way to how you're allowed to share documents in, you know, on a platform like Google Docs, all right? So real quick, what I want to do is just draw out a little bit what this app is going to look like and how it's going to work, and we'll discuss how all of the different technologies are going to fit together. All right, now probably the most obvious pages that our application is going to contain are the login page and the create account page. And these actually aren't pages that we're going to create first for the primary reason that we're not going to actually add user authentication to our application until later on. All right, so we're gonna have our login page, which is of course just going to allow the user to log in with their email and password. And we're gonna have a sign up page or a create account page. We'll decide which one we wanna call it later on. And that of course is going to have the usual fields that we've seen. All right, so these pages are gonna be the sort of entry point for our application for a little while, right? Once we actually add these pages that is. So let's talk about the more app specific pages in our application now. The main page that users are gonna go to once they've logged in or you know, before we've actually created the login and sign up pages, the main page is going to be the note list page. This is just gonna contain a list of all of the notes that a user has created, right? So it'll say something like my notes and it'll have a list of all of those here, right? So it'll have blah, blah, blah blah, 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 blah. And also, and this is something we're not gonna add until a little bit later, but this page is also gonna have a shared with me section that will list all of the notes that other users have shared with this user. Okay, so that'll just have a list of those notes that the user will be able to uh, view. So that's the main page, and we'll call this something like the notes list page when we get there. And the way this is gonna work is whenever the user clicks on one of these notes, that note is going to take them 
to the note detail page. Now this is where the user will be able to edit the note. And essentially what it's gonna look like when the user first goes to this page, it's just gonna have the note title, right? So it'll say my note. And then it will have the note content, which as I said, is going to be rendered markdown. Now, now I'm not gonna go into markdown in too much detail here, but suffice to say that markdown is an easy way for non-technical people to write styled text, right? So, you know, you and I both know that having an H1 element like this will display high in very large text, right? That's a heading one element. And we also know that if you display something inside, let's say a paragraph tag, then that will just display it in normal text. Right, but in general, when non-technical people are managing content, right, let's say that uh, your company has some people that are managing your blog content for your company's website, you're not gonna wanna make them use these HTML elements because in my experience, chances are they'll just do it wrong and you'll end up having to fix it. And also, I mean, most of the time they don't like doing it anyway. So what Markdown is, is just a simplified way of expressing the same things that HTML tags express but an easier, more non-technical, folk-friendly way. So what this would look like here, if you want to express an H1 heading, in Markdown, that would just be this little hash symbol followed by a space, and then you would have the text, right? So Markdown, anyway, is just an incredibly useful way to allow people to uh, edit content and style it differently without them having to learn HTML and that kind of thing. So Anyway, that's what the content of this page is going to be. It's going to be rendered markdown. Now, we'll see how to do that later on. But the other thing on this page is going to be an edit button, which will allow the user to edit the content and the title of this note. Now, what this is going to do, it's going to change these two things here into uh, text inputs, basically. All right, so this will uh, just, we'll use a state variable or something like this. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And basically, that will just contain... Uh, you know, it'll be a text input that contains the current title. The user will be able to edit that. We'll have a big text area kind of thing here with all of the content in unrendered markdown, right? That the user can actually edit like this. And this will have a save button, which will allow the user to save those changes and probably also a cancel button, which will allow them to cancel uh, whatever they were doing. All right, now this is the main stuff that we're gonna be building first, right? Before we get into creating user accounts, before we add the login and sign up page, before we even add the back end, we're gonna build out these pages. Now, just a few extra things we're gonna add to these pages, uh, you know, just so that you'll know why I'm doing these things when I actually add components for them. We're gonna want to allow users to create new notes on this page. And to do that, we'll have a button that will look something like this. And when the user clicks that button, what that's gonna do is it'll show a modal of some sort that will ask them what they want the name of that note to be, right? The title of that note. So it'll look something like this. It might say create new note or something like that at the top. And it'll have a button that will allow them to create a new note with whatever name they've entered into this text input. And once they've done that, the modal will go away and the new note should appear in that list there. Okay, now another thing that we're gonna allow users to do is have a delete button on each of these notes that will let the user delete that note. So what that's gonna do if the user clicks on it, it's going to show a modal asking them if they're sure they wanna delete it. All right, so that'll be something like this. Are you sure? Okay, and it'll give them the options yes and no. And according to which one they pick, it will either delete the note or it will just leave it be. All right, so as I said, this stuff that I just drew out here is going to be the main stuff that we'll be implementing in the first part of this, right? Before we get to adding a backend, before we get to adding a database, before we add user authentication, etc. So that's what we're going to be looking at here today. And just to give you an idea of where we're gonna be going with all of this stuff later on, we're eventually going to allow users to share their notes with each other. So uh, essentially what that's going to end up looking like, and I'll go into more detail on this when we get there later on, but this is going to have some sort of like share button and that will open up a completely different page that will allow the user to share that note with other people by email, right? So, you know, it'll 
look something like this. It'll have a text input where they can enter in a user's email, and it will share that note with whoever else they've entered. Okay, we'll get to all of that when we get there. There's a lot of details involved in that, obviously, that you'll forget about if I mention them now. So for now, let's just focus on building the basic structure of our application and the core functionality of creating notes, editing notes, and deleting notes. All right, so to get started here, we're going to generate a new React application using Create React App. So let's open up our terminal here. I'm gonna change directories into where I keep all of my React projects. And inside there, I'm gonna say npx create react app. And we'll call this application notes app. All right, so we'll create that. That's gonna run for a second or two here. And once that script finishes running, what we're gonna do is open this up in our IDE. I'm gonna open that up in VS Code by typing code dot, oops, I need to actually change directories into that application first and then say code dot. You can always just open yours by saying file open or by using control O or whatever the equivalent on your operating system is. All right, so now that we've opened this up, there's just a few pieces of cleanup that I wanna do first to make sure that our app is ready for us to start adding pages to it. The first thing we're gonna do is go into our application and delete all of the boilerplate code that Create React App gives us inside our app component. So I'm just gonna delete all of this here including the div uh, with the class name of app. And in its place, I'm just gonna put uh, code goes here. We'll be coming back to replace that later on. I just wanted to clean that up first. We're also gonna delete this logo thing here that we were importing, and I'm going to delete the logo file itself from our directory. So we'll delete that. And one more thing, just for consistency's sake, is we're gonna actually change this app component to a named export since that's generally how I like to export all of my components in React. So let's say const app equals, and we'll say export const app like that. Okay, and then we can delete the default export, which means that in our index.js file where we're importing this app component, we need to say import and add the curly braces around it because it's now a named export. And while we're at it, why don't we just remove some of these annoying comments? We'll go into our index.css and delete all of the default styles that they gave us since we'll be replacing those anyway with our own. And that's pretty much all the cleanup that we're gonna do for now. Our app should be ready now for us to start adding things to it. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've got our app pretty much set up, the next thing that we're gonna do is go through and create all of the pages that we're gonna need for the time being. So there's going to be three main pages, as I said. One is going to be the notes list page, and one is going to be the notes detail page, and the other page is going to be the not found page. We're just gonna set that up up front because it's always a good thing to have for testing purposes. So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna create a new folder, and we're gonna call that folder pages. Okay, and just one thing I wanted to point out here is that personally, when my apps are on the smaller side, as this one is right now, I like to divide up my app into pages, components, uh, contexts, etc. right? Do more of a function-based organization. And as the app gets larger, I tend to like to switch that over to feature-based organization, right? Once we start dealing with things like different users, once we add more types of resources to our application, like maybe we add products to our application, that's when I like to switch over to feature-based organization where we would instead have our application divided up into like users, notes, products, articles, that kind of thing, right? But for now, it's easier just to use pages, components, etc. So that's what we're gonna do. All right, now inside this pages folder, what we're gonna do is say new file, and we're gonna start off by creating our notes list page, which will act as a sort of homepage for our application. And oops, there we go. We're gonna call it notes list page. Actually, why don't we just call it notes page? That's easier. So notes page.js, that'll be our notes page. We're gonna create a new file here, which we'll call note detail page is what I wanted to say. And then we'll say new file and we'll create our not found page. 
All right, so these are the three main pages of our application. Let's just go in and add a very basic skeleton component to each, uh, just so that we can set up routing in our application. All right, so what we're gonna do is say export const notes page equals, this page isn't gonna take any props, and it's going to just return a heading for now that will say my notes. Simple enough. Now we're just gonna copy this and paste it into note detail page. We'll change this to note detail page. And we'll change the heading here to uh, this is a note, something like that, right? We'll be replacing that later on. This is mostly just to get the routing set up. And then for our not found page, uh, let's actually just copy and paste some of the stuff from our note detail page. This one we can actually implement almost entirely right now. We're just gonna say something like, how you get here for the heading. All right, something kind of snarky there. And then for the paragraph tag underneath, we'll say something like, it looks like this page doesn't exist. Sorry about that. All right, and of course, we're going to have to wrap these two elements in React fragments since uh, you know you can't return more than one top level element from a React component. All right, and then of course we need to change the name of this component to not found page. And there we have it. We have our three pages all kind of mocked out. So let's create the routes for these pages. Now previously, when we've added routes to an application, we've added it directly to the app.js component. And generally this is a fine thing to do, especially in smaller applications. But what I personally like to do if I suspect that an application might get large and complicated at some point, is I like to actually create a separate component here, which we'll call routes. So what I'm gonna do is say new file. We'll just create it inside the source file here. And we're gonna call this component routes.js. Now basically this is just gonna contain all of the routing logic for our application. So what we're gonna do inside of here is we're gonna say export const routes, obviously. And inside here, we're gonna to need to actually use the React Router DOM package and the components that it provides to display each of our other pages when the user is at specific routes. All right, so first of all, what we're gonna to have to do there is we're gonna to have to install the React Router DOM package. And to do that, we can say npm install React Router DOM and hit enter and that will install that package for us. So what we can do now is import all of the components we're gonna need here. The first one is going to be browser router, which just by convention, we usually rename to router, just makes it easier to work with. We're also gonna import the switch component and we're also gonna import the route component. All right, and we're gonna import all of those from the React router DOM package, as I said. All right, so now that we have those components, we're going to display all of our pages here inside their respective routes. So we're gonna say return. And the first thing, we're gonna to have to wrap all of this inside our browser router component, right? That's the one that sort of provides the current route inside the user's browser to our route components and allows them to kind of display or not display accordingly. And inside here, we're gonna have a switch which makes sure that only one route component is displayed at a time. And inside there is where we're gonna define our routes. So the first route we're gonna do is for our notes page. And as I said, this is gonna be sort of our homepage for our application. So we'll say route. The path for this one will be a slash route. And inside here, we're gonna put our notes page. So let's go up here and import that by saying import notes page from pages slash notes page. And then inside this route, we're gonna just say notes page, and that will take care of displaying the notes page when the path is equal to the slash route, all right? So in other words, when the user goes to localhost 3000. Cool, so next up, we're gonna have our notes detail page. Now, since our notes detail page is going to be displaying different data depending on uh, you know what note the user is actually looking at, we're gonna to need to use URL parameters here. So what that's gonna look like is we're gonna say route, the path is going to be slash notes slash, and then we'll put the note ID as the URL parameter, right? And 
as you'll see later on, inside the note detail page, we're basically going to get the value of that part of the URL and use that to load the appropriate notes information from, you know, wherever it is we're loading that information from. We'll get to that later. So for now, inside this route, we're gonna put the note detail page. So let's import that up here. Import note detail page. And down here inside our route, note detail page. And lastly, we're gonna display the route for our not found page, which as you might recall, is done by just displaying a route component without a path prop. And inside there, we'll put our not found page, which we need to import first. We'll say import not found page from pages not found page. And inside here, we'll say not found page. Okay, and those are our three pages for now. So let's go into our application, right? We'll might have to run it again by saying npm run start. And we should be able to see that all of these pages are displayed at their appropriate routes. Ah, and it's actually only displaying code goes here. That's because we have to actually go back to our code, open up our app component and replace this code goes here thing with the new routes component that we created. So let's say import routes from routes. And right here, we'll display our routes. Oops, I wanted to do that. There we go. We'll display our routes like that, and that should take care of it all. So we see right here, if we're on the home route, we see my notes. If we go to slash notes slash one, two, three, for example, we'll still see my notes. Now, the reason for that is that we need to actually add the exact prop to our homepage route to make sure that it's only displayed when the route exactly matches that. You may remember that from before. And now that we've done that, we should see this is a note, which is our note detail page. And just to test our not found page now, let's just type in something ridiculous that doesn't exist. And we'll see how'd you get here. It looks like this page doesn't exist. Oops, doesn't existing. That's not correct English. Let me go back and correct that. Doesn't exist, sorry about that. Must have been looking at something else while I was typing that anyway. There we go, so that's our not found page and that's all we need to do to set up our pages. Now, one last thing that I wanna set up. I would like to have the notes list page displayed on slash notes, but in order to actually have the user be sent there after going to the home route, we have to set up what's called an automatic redirect for the home route, right? So in other words, when the user goes to localhost 3000, they'll automatically be redirected to localhost 3000 slash notes. This is a strategy that a lot of different sites use to uh, allow themselves to change their home page if need be. So the way that we're gonna do that is we're gonna open up our routes.js file again. And what we're gonna do first of all is change the path of our notes page to slash notes. And we still do need to keep this exact prop here because if we take it off, that means our notes page will uh, basically take over this route here and not allow our note detail page to be displayed since the first segment of both of those paths is the same. Okay, that's something we discussed earlier. Above that, what we're gonna do is create a new home route by saying route path equals slash. And this does have to be exact as well. Okay, and inside this route now, instead of displaying an actual page component, we're going to display another component from React Router DOM, which will be called redirect. Okay, so this redirect component, uh, you may have seen it before, is just a component that if it's displayed, will automatically redirect the user to a different route. Okay, so the way that we set this up for our home route here, we're just gonna say redirect, and we're gonna say to as the prop, and that's basically where we tell it where to redirect the user to, as the name might suggest. So that will automatically take care of redirecting the user to this route whenever the user goes to the home route. And we can see this by opening this back up and going to the slash route. And we'll see that it will automatically redirect us to notes whenever we do that. And that's how to set up all of the pages for this application. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've created all of the pages for our application so far and set up routes for them, the next thing we're gonna do is go into our notes page and actually implement the notes list. So 
let's close the rest of these components for now. And the first thing here is that this notes page is going to have to take some props. Now, eventually we'll replace this with using context or something like that. But for the time being, we'll just say notes page and pass in a prop called notes. Okay, so this will basically be all of the notes that the user has created in this application. All right, and now that we have those notes, we're going to want to display a list here of those notes. And what that's going to look like, we're just going to use the map function like you've seen before. And here, we just need to wrap this all in a React fragment first. And we're going to say notes.map, and for each note, we're going to display a few elements. Now, first of all, let's talk about what the notes in our application are going to look like data-wise. Okay, so our notes are just going to be simple JSON objects. And they're going to have a few properties. The first property, which most resources are going to have in our application, is going to be the notes ID. And this will just be a unique identifier of some kind that uh, allows us to uniquely identify that note. Notes are also going to have a title property, which will be obviously the title, right? So it'll be something like my first note. And notes will also have a content property. And this is going to be basically a markdown string that will contain all of the actual text that the user has added for that note. All right, and that's pretty much all of the data that our notes are going to need for now. Obviously, when we get into sharing later on, we'll have to add some more data to each note accordingly. But for now, this should do nicely. So keeping that in mind, that structure that we just defined, what we're going to do is for each note, in this notes list, we're going to display a div, and this div will have the key of note.id, right? Because that's a unique string that we can use to identify each of these list items we're displaying. That's something we discussed a long time ago when we were first learning how to display lists in React. And inside this div, what we're going to do, we're going to display the notes title as an h3 heading. So for this, we'll say note.title. Now, under that, we're going to display the number of words in the note. All right, now, this is just a fun little feature to get an idea of how long that note is, and we're not going to implement it in the most uh, foolproof way. What we're going to do is just split the content by spaces and figure out how many segments that gives us. All right, so what that's going to look like, we're just going to say paragraph. We're going to say note.content.split. Okay, and we're going to split it by a space, and we're going to say dot .length, and that should give us the number of words, so to speak, in our note. Now, just to keep things clean, what I am going to do for this is actually create a helper function. So we'll say const get word count, and that's going to take a string and simply do the logic that we had here, right? So it'll be return string dot .split by a space and dot length. And also we're going to want to say if the string doesn't exist, we'll just return zero. Okay, so in other words, if there is no content, we want to return zero instead of trying to split the string since that won't work. All right, so now we can just say, instead of having this logic inside of here, which is kind of ugly, we're just going to say get word count note dot content. And after that, we're going to say words with the little S in parentheses thing, signifying that that might just be one word. All right, so we have our note title, we have our note content. One more thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna add a link to that page. And to do that, we're gonna use React Router DOM's link component, which was just imported for me automatically with the wrong quotation marks here. Hang on a second and I'll fix that. There we go. And this is going to be a link to the corresponding note detail page for a given note. So the way that we're going to do that, we're going to say link to, and we're going to add in the curly braces here, use a backtick string and say slash notes slash, and we're going to insert the notes ID into that URL we're linking to, right? So that'll take uh, the user to note slash one, two, three, if that's the note that they're currently viewing, for example. All right. And then inside here, just for show, we're going to have a button that says view. And that'll be the button that the user can click to go to the detail page for that note. All right, so to test this out, what we're going to do is we're going to open up our application. Looks like everything's running fine. 
we're going to go to our notes page, and if we refresh, it looks like we don't have any notes yet, right? So we need to actually define some notes and pass them into our notes page. Now, the way we can do that is inside our routes file, we're going to define some fake notes by saying const fake notes. And what these will look like, it'll be an array of objects. Each of those objects is going to have an ID, as we said. It'll have a title, which will say something like my first note. And the content here is going to be markdown. So we'll say something like, hello, my dear friends. Inside these asterisk things, which as you'll see, will make them italic when we actually set up our app to display markdown appropriately. All right, so that's our fake notes. What we're gonna do is pass them into our notes page from our routes component by saying fake notes equals, or not fake notes, we want notes equals fake notes. There we go. And that should do it. Let's go back to our application now and see if this is working. Sure enough, we see my first note displayed, four words, and if we click view, that'll take us directly to the corresponding note detail page for that note. All right, now one last thing that we can do here. At this point, once I've gotten a page looking good, what I usually like to do is see where I can break out things into a separate component. Because as I mentioned before, this notes list that we're displaying here, we're eventually gonna want there to be two lists like this on our notes page. One for displaying the notes that the user has created. All right, so that'll have all of the notes underneath it. And one for displaying all of the notes that were shared with the user. So it'll be something like shared with me and it'll have the same list underneath it. Now, in order to make sure we don't have to write all of this logic that we wrote here again, we're gonna create a separate component called, I don't know, we'll probably call it notes list that will be able to take care of all of that logic for us. Okay, so what that's gonna look like, let's open up our uh, file browser here and inside the source directory, I'm gonna create a new folder, which I'll call components, all right? This is gonna contain the reusable components for our application that are not pages. And inside here, what we're gonna do is say new file. We're gonna call this component notes And inside here, we're gonna say export const notes list equals, and this is going to take notes as a prop. And basically what we're gonna do is just copy and paste all of this logic that we just had in here into our notes list. So to do that, we'll just have to say return. We'll have to put in react fragments to make sure that the curly braces are interpreted correctly here. And that should be all we need to do. So let's swap out this logic here with our notes list component that we just created. We're gonna say import notes list from components notes list. Oops, there we go. And we'll display our notes list and pass the notes as a prop. So we'll say notes equals notes, and we're just kind of passing through that prop that our own notes page got. And we'll also have to cut out this get word count, put that in notes list. We'll just paste that there. And we'll do the same thing with the link component, which we're no longer using inside our notes page. We're just going to copy that and put it in notes list. Okay, and let's delete that extra space there. And if we go back to our browser now, everything should look exactly the same as before, except now we have this expressed as a reusable component. So in the future, if we wanted to display another list, right? If we open up our uh, notes page again here, if we wanted to say H1 shared with me and display another notes list with different notes, I'm just gonna display the same notes here, but this would be you know, a, a different set of notes, obviously. What we would see is that with just one component, we've displayed the same layout and logic. So that's something that I usually like to follow up with whenever I create a page, as you'll see. So anyway, that's how we create the notes page. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.